Hello, everybody. It is showtime. I'm so excited to be here today. Welcome to the Up Your Energy Summit. My name is Adriana Luna Carlos, and I'm one of the CEOs and founders of She Rises Studios. We're so excited to be here today. This has been uh, something we've been working on for about five to six months in the making. We have 20 plus speakers. There's so much to go over today. I'm excited to share all of it with you. Um, so this summit, if you don't already know some of the background, it's, was, it was created, you know, obviously up your energy, but we're, we want to dive deeper. What does that mean? There's so much that energy brings to the world in life and business, in health and wellness, in finance, and so much more. So um, our overall objective here at She Raises Studios is, as always, to educate, celebrate, and uplift women worldwide and we try to do that in all these different ways and capacities. So today we brought on, like I said, 20 plus speakers. They're gonna be covering everything from health and wellness, women in finance, education, collaboration over competition, um, so many more things. We believe that this is the year for you. This is the year for change and ultimately to up your energy. So do you have big goals this year? I really recommend right now, if you have a chance to go ahead and get a notepad, a piece of paper, something to take some notes with. Uh, lots of cool nuggets that are going to be shared with you here today. Um, we're going to kind of go fast pace. I'll do my best to make sure we have time for comments down below. Um, and we're going to be talking about um, all the different things that you can learn here today. So strategies for uh, in business and, and um, health and wellness, marketing and branding. We have so, so much um, so let me go ahead and I know that we have a very special guest here today. She's excited to be talking to us all about her journey and specific questions. So I am so excited to announce Joy Bauer. So if you don't know Joy, she is one of the nation's leading health and uh, leading health authorities. She is a nutrition and healthy lifestyle uh, expert for the Today Show and the host of NBC's Healthy Lifestyle Expert. Um, she hosts NBC's Health and Happiness. She has her own Amazon live show, Health, Happiness, Joy. She is also a number one New York Times bestselling author of 14 bestsellers. Hi, Joy. Uh, her latest book is Joy Bauer's Superfood, 150 Recipes for Eternal Youth. Features, mouth-watering dishes to enhance health, boost energy, and increase longevity. So welcome, Joy. How are you? Hey, I'm great. And I'm so happy to be here. So thank you for inviting me. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us here today. I have some questions for you. Great. I'm ready. <laughs> so what does up your energy in life and business mean to you? Hmm. Well, so that's a big question. I would say um, having the energy to crush our to-do lists, which is pretty massive. And I mean that both on a personal level and on a professional level. Um, and there are so many ways that we can up our energy. And I love being able to say that because I think in a great big world where there's so much out of our control, it's nice to know that there are certain things that are within our control to really help to bump up our energy. And I'm sure you agree. 100%. Yeah, I, I love um, that there's so much that, that is in our control in today's world, right? There's so much that we can do to manage. Um, what is the best advice that you can give women going into 2023 to make great health and wellness you know, more simple and beneficial? Mm -hmm. um, so I think the first thing, and it, it's such a simple concept, yet it's very difficult for women who are juggling so many balls in the, the, the air to actually achieve, but we have to sleep enough. Um, and I, I think sleep is one of like the greatest luxuries and often we, we walk around so sleep deprived. So I think if everybody could really try to make sleeping a priority and when you want to look at your sleep, we're aiming to get between seven and nine hours most nights of the week. Um, and even if that feels like an impossibility, just adding on 15 minutes to however much you're sleeping now is going to have a huge payback um, from a health perspective. And there's a few reasons why, and specifically when it comes to energy. When you get enough sleep, basically what you're doing is you're slowing down 
your cells so that when you wake up in the morning, they're much more efficient at producing energy. So you don't just have more energy the next day because you're well rested. It's because your cells are rejuvenated and they're functioning more optimally. You also help to balance your hormone levels. It's getting enough sleep is important for weight control, for reducing your risk for uh, type 2 diabetes and heart disease and metabolic syndrome. So super, and also for our patient's level, right? Being more even keeled. So it's really, really important to get enough sleep. The second thing is to exercise regularly. And it doesn't mean that you need to sweat so much that it requires a shower. Just even walking 30 minutes a day, and it doesn't even have to be continuous. You could break it up 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the afternoon, maybe 10 minutes marching in place at night when you're binge watching one of your favorite shows on television. But um, if you just would walk for 30 minutes a day, you accomplish a few things. First, it just enhances your mental outlook. You know, you hear about those mood boosting endorphins. It's true. They really do exist. The second thing is it can also help to boost your energy. We know that on a metabolic level as well. And it also reduces your risk for certain diseases, just like the sleep does. So getting enough sleep, exercising regularly, and you know I'm going to go there, eating thoughtfully and staying hydrated. And when it comes to the food piece, if there's one thing that everybody remembers from my talk, this is what I want it to be. Incorporate a produce item with each and every meal. So that means either vegetables or fruit, and here's why. First off, they're high volume and they're low in calories, so they help to fill us up without filling us out. But the most important reason is, is that these things, again, vegetables and fruits, and also plant-based um, wonderful foods like beans and lentils and legumes and things like that, they're filled with vitamins and minerals and antioxidants and fiber. So every time we eat these things, they shower our body with all of the right ingredients that enable us to feel our very, very best, most energetic best selves. So breakfast in the morning, if you're having scrambled eggs, chop up some tomatoes or onions or mushrooms and put them in. If you're having a bowl of oatmeal, add some frozen or fresh berries. If they're frozen, nuke them in the microwave first. <laughs> so they're room temperature. And also when you microwave frozen fruits, all of the natural juices come out. So it's almost like you get this no sugar added syrupy sensation together with the uh, deliciously sweet berries. So that's what you could do for breakfast. With lunch, oh my goodness, have the most delicious voluminous salad ever with at least five different vegetables. Or if you're having a sandwich, all you have to do is pick up that top slice of bread and instead of just adding the go-to sad lettuce leaf, you could add roasted peppers, sliced zucchini or cucumbers, like just tomatoes, onion, pile it all the way up on whatever that sandwich is. And what's nice about this is you're actually making a larger lunch than you would normally eat because like the sandwich could be sad and thin. And now it's action packed and huge and filling and hearty. And then with dinner, the sky's the limit, right? It could be a broccoli shrimp stir fry. You could have baked salmon or even a lean steak. And on the side, sauteed spinach. I love roasting vegetables. It brings out the sweet factor. It caramelizes them. It makes them so darn interesting. So the sky is the limit. But again, if there's one thing everybody remembers from my talk, incorporate a produce item with each and every meal. And that will be your biggest health payoff, I'm telling you. I mean, it only makes sense, right, too, because you want to have fun with your meals. And at least if you're getting to enjoy it, you're supplementing your body, you're fueling yourself with the right nutrients, then you have that energy throughout the day to move forward and make smart decisions in life and business. I love how detailed you got into exactly how we can make it. Um, and you made it fun. You made it sound fun. I'm, I'm sure those who maybe sometimes struggle with being creative with their foods can uh, look at all the recipes that you have to share and really kind of pick something that matches what it is that they love to eat. Every day. So, yeah. and, and you know what, to your point too, like eating should not be a compromise. It should be an adventure. It should be fun. It should be delicious. 
And, you know, I mean, that's my greatest joy. My kids joke that I'm like a, a mad scientist in the kitchen, but I just love creating all sorts of beloved classics in a healthful way and like pushing them out there. So if anyone's looking for recipes, lots of free content, go to my Instagram, um, my Facebook, TikTok, my website, sign up for my newsletter. I'm telling you, and if there's something that you want me to create that I haven't created yet, I read every single comment. So you just let me know. I'm here for you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Joy. I mean, I know people are going to comment now. They're really going to want to know what you can create for them. Um, I'm here. Brownies, pizza, buffalo mm -hmm. wings. Oh, like, I got your back. <laughs> <laughs> so how can we stay motivated uh, to maintain optimal health and wellness and avoid burnout? Um, I think that the number one way that we can do this is to find your reason. You know, what is your very personal reason for wanting to start a health path and stick with it? And that's gonna be different things for different people, right? And your reason needs to be significant and enduring. And again, I'm gonna go back to very, very personal because everybody is going to have their own reason for wanting to stay energized and healthy. And when I say healthy, that automatically goes hand in hand with energized because when you are feeling healthy and you're living a healthy life, you will automatically up your energy level and your mojo and your confidence and your self-esteem. So that it's sort of like homework for people figure out what your very specific reason is. And, you know, when it comes to health, it can't be something, you know, sort of time sensitive, like, because I want to fit into a certain dress for my daughter's wedding. It has to be bigger than that. Something like, I want to reduce my risk for a recurrence of breast cancer or, you know, I just want to wake up in the morning and feel comfortable in my skin. Or I want to be around for my kids and for my grandkids. Like, these are big reasons why. Or I have a strong family history of heart disease. And I want to make sure that I can get off statins or drive my cholesterol down. So these are the reasons. And by the way, you should write down your reason. Make it official. I would put it on post-it notes. I would put one on you know, your vanity of your bathroom mirror. So you see it when you wake up, maybe one on the side of the fridge, one on your screensaver, on your computer screen, put them all over the place. And you can reassess over and over again. You don't have to be married to that very same reason ongoing. And so every few months, take a look at it, see where you're at, pat yourself on the back, because we all have wins you know, as we go along our journey and don't play those down. You know, you got to be giving yourselves hugs and love and high fives so that it fuels your motivation and you can continue going with that drive. But I think finding your reason is probably the most important thing. And the second thing sort of goes back to what I had said earlier, eat the foods that you love. So life is not about compromise. And I want you guys to know I love chocolate. I love wine, I love pizza, and I fit these things in, and I'm a health nut. I think life, when it comes to food, is about 90-10. Go out of your way to eat healthy 90% of the time, and then 10% of the time, you have wiggle room. And learn how to make all of the foods that you love, we talked about this earlier, in a healthful way, so that you can enjoy them any single day of the week without feeling you know, regret or aftermath or, you know, like you're compromising. So finding your reason would be my first thing. Um, learning to eat the foods that you love. And I think a real, real biggie is forgiving slip ups. I think as women, we're so hard on ourselves. And I always try to Think about how would I advise a friend if they would have a slip up? We would say, oh my goodness, shake it off. You're human. You're not a robot. So that's how we have to view slip ups in our own world as well. And no matter what we slipped up on, whether it be a relationship, advice for one of our kids, our diet, not exercising enough, a financial slip up, it's okay. Again, we're human. Be forgiving. Be kind. Have the same compassion for yourself that you would for others. 
Love it. It's so, it seems so simple, but when you start to expand on it, it makes your brain think, you know, there's all these nuances in life and how perfection is never going to be attainable. You have to have progress and um, like you can live in a world of feeling like everything is going right. And once in a while, something's going to knock you off your path. So I love that you talked about, you know, forgiving the slip ups, you know, it's just, it's part of life and it's going to happen. So I thank you so much for all those tips. So sure. How do you feel about women reinventing themselves more than once? I love it. I'm going to say that again. I absolutely love it because it's exciting. It's invigorating. Um, it's a new adventure. Mm -hmm. I always look to sort of freshen things up. So I don't, I'm not even going to give my opinion on it. I'm going to encourage it. And I'm constantly reinventing myself. I started out working as a clinician in a hospital. Um, then I became a writer. Then I became a culinary expert. Then I became a snack developer. I'm a media personality. Like I'm always looking for that next thing because I want to feel stimulated and excited. I think it's just an awesome thing. And I, and I, and I also think it helps to constantly give us a new purpose. And, and for women who had decided to stay home to raise their kids, which is a great um, experience, my goodness. But I think as our kids get older, it's a perfect time. Or, you know, even if your kids are still in school and, and you still are home raising your children, it's a great time to find other avenues to feel stimulated and useful and purposeful. And it could be volunteer work, or it could be a business, or it could be being part of the PTA, or you know, honing your skills in the kitchen. There's a bazillion ways to recreate yourself. And I just, I absolutely love that thought. I agree. And I think it's too, like when we're younger, we have all these ambitions and ideas of what we could become. And you start to, when you go older, you go through some trials, right? Tribulations, and you have these moments of, oh, I can't do that. So you start to kind of have less confidence as you get a little bit older. Then you get to the age of where you're breaking through those barriers that you thought weren't possible. So now you kind of come back to those thoughts of, hey, I can do this, I want to do this. And you start to explore, re-explore, adapt yourself, it just, it's a lot of fun. And I love your point, Joy, about um, when you start to become the empty nester, your kids are off doing their own things. And now it's really all about you again. And wow. sometimes that can be scary, nerve wracking, um, but it's, you know, giving per people the permission to be themselves is all that they really right. need. So and you also, like, as we get older, we have opportunities. So something that you think about starting now, again, whether it be a business or whether it be a volunteership or whether it be getting involved in the community or a new hobby, these are things in the here and now that we never would have thought of 20 years ago. And there's something so exciting about that. I agree. So speaking of business, I'm going to give you a little curveball. How can we as women show up uh, healthily in our business? Well, um, I think the cliche, but I'm just going to say it because we never hear it enough. We have to make ourselves a priority because if we don't have a full cup, we cannot pour for other people. So, you know, I live it. We all do. And I really understand that there's not enough hours in the day, but we really do have to take enough time to make sure that we, the caretaker, the juggler, um, the, the, the woman who gets stuff done in a million different directions. We have to make sure that we get enough sleep, that we eat healthfully, that we're exercising, that we have me time. I think one of the things that everybody can do is schedule a monthly me day. And whatever you want that to be, you make it happen. If you want to sit cuddled on the couch and sip some warm tea and read a juicy book, you go to it. If you want to binge watch something on Netflix, if you want to go get a manicure and a pedicure, if you want to take a walk or hike, whatever it may be, but you have to make it non-negotiable. Every single month, we each need a me day. And so I think 
by taking care of ourselves, we are much more able to get all of the things done and stay energized that we need to get done. Um, and the other thing I think is really worth mentioning is making sure that we all schedule our annual screenings and doctor visits. Again, these are the things that we push other people to do. Did you go to the doctor? Did you make that appointment? And then suddenly we fall through the cracks. So making sure that you are on top of your mammographies and colonoscopies and your annual checkups and all of the above, getting, getting your eyes checked year after year. Like these things are so important and they help us to operate on, you know, high throttle, all cylinders go sort of thing. And then the last thing I would say is one of the bravest things as women we can do is ask for help when we need it. You know, we're usually the helpers, but surrounding yourself with people who can be supportive and reaching out to people who can help you when you need it is critical. And, and again, one of the most courageous things that people can do. And as a businesswoman, I will tell you that one of the smartest things that I do is I surround myself with people who are smarter than me and more capable than me in the areas that are not within my wheelhouse. And, you know, I, I will tell you firsthand that that is what has enabled me to be successful not my own skills, but knowing where I have weaknesses and filling those weaknesses in with like smart, badass women who can help me in 360 direction. Love it. Yes, I agree. I think surrounding yourself with the right community and then always, you know, being able to push yourself in a healthily way, of course, um, and that, that mindset of being able to be around people who know more than you comes from in my opinion, that collaboration over competition, because you're not trying to compete. You're not trying to put yourself down. You're not trying to put others down. You always want to be able to help one another uplift, educate and celebrate. So you said it so perfectly. Thank you so much, Joy. You're so amazing. I've, I've had such a pleasure listening to everything that you have to share with us today. Uh, what is one thing that you think you can share with us, of course, uh, um, that maybe most people don't know about you? Oh, what most people don't know about me. Um, I was in a rock band before my nutrition career. <laughs> oh, my. That is probably a big surprise to people. Um, and that was a little bit of a, a curveball question, but, but that probably is a great surprise and something that people just don't know about me. I was in a rock band. I play keyboards. Um, mm -hmm. Just to be clear, I don't sing. <laughs> but I, I'm a mean keyboard player. And I was in a band in high school and all through college. And it was such a joy. And I am passionate about music. And to this day, when I'm in the kitchen and I'm whipping up all of my creations, at any given time, you will hear great music blaring from the speakers. And I'm just like, moving and grooving at my cook. <laughs> That's so awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us. We always love to get one extra little nugget out of our speakers. It's been such a pleasure, Joy. I really appreciate your time and taking it with us here today. And um, have an amazing rest of your day. And thank you for sharing your Up Your Energy tips with us. Oh, well, thank you so much. And I want, want to wish everybody a great um, event and conference. And like, thank you to everyone for listening. Mwah. Here's the high energy women. Thank you. All right. So we have some amazing speakers, like I talked about, over 20 women here today. Um, I have a special guest with us that's going to help kick off the rest of this segment, which is health and wellness and how to avoid burnout. So you may have heard of Natasha Gaines. She is an awesome woman. She is backstage with us right now. I'm going to go ahead and let you learn a little bit more about her. So Natasha is a published author. She is a certified stress management coach and a guided meditation and EFT taping practitioner who leads wellness workshops across the U.S. and Canada. Her articles, fiction, and poetry have appeared in publications nationwide she is an English professor, professor at West Cliff University in Southern California, a podcaster on Where Money Meets Soul, 
and also co-founded the companies In the Life of Zen and Treehouse Arts and Writing Services. For decades, Natasha has worked in health and wellness industries and knows that when people take time to prioritize their spiritual, physical, and mental health, it leads to a more balanced and happier living. When we get our head and heart and body into alignment, life becomes more enjoyable and helps loving helps to love individuals and help get them to that place. So thank you so much, Natasha, for joining us here today. I'm so excited at what you have in store. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for that introduction. <laughs> Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to the summit. So speaking of that intro, and also alluding to what Joy was saying about that idea of, you know, constantly reinventing yourself. My current career is actually a detour from how I started, which was climbing the corporate ladder and attending grad school, trying to juggle two, uh, two graduate degrees at the same time. However, there eventually came a point in my life, obviously, where the stress from all of that started to overwhelm me. And I turned to the wellness industry for answers. And since then, I've worked uh, in the health and wellness industries. And in that time, I have learned that one of the easiest ways to balance all areas of your life that pertain to your health is uh, by making self-care a priority. Um, although I do want to kind of clear up one misconception right from the start. Self-care is not synonymous with self-indulgence or being selfish, right? It simply means taking care of yourself so that you can do all the things that you need and accomplish to do in a day without getting all burnt out or overwhelmed. If you think you've been hearing more about self-care lately, then you're right. In fact, according to Google Trends, the term and the searches for self-care have more than doubled since 2015. I mean, at this point, the need for self-care in our lives is pretty evident. We have an epidemic of anxiety going on in this country and everybody's feeling it. Self-care is part of the answer to how you can better cope with your daily stressors and optimize your health in every area of your life, whether that be work stress, the stress of trying to keep up with the, just the pace of daily life, which technology, of course, has made even harder than ever. I mean, just think about all of the emails and the texts that you receive in just one day. People are less able to unwind and slow down, which makes them feel more anxious and overwhelmed by even the simplest of tasks. So what we really need to do is to build our resilience to stress. And the best way to do that is by creating a daily sustainable self-care practice. Now, there are tons of tools and resources available for self-care and stress relief. All of them, pretty easy to learn, and you can do them all on your own. And each of them tone down, overwhelm, but just in different ways. And their effectiveness is twofold, actually. They make your mind and your body feel almost instantly calmer while you use them and for some time afterwards. But with regular practice, they also help to build your resilience to stress as well. So today, I want to show you a couple of quick tools that you can use on a daily basis to help keep you healthier and happier. The first one is breath work. So you probably know when you become stressed or anxious that you're brain releases cortisol, right? Which is the stress hormone. And by taking deeper breaths, which is something that you do in breath work, your heart rate slows down. More oxygen enters your bloodstream. And ultimately those breaths communicate with your brain to just relax and calm down. Deep breathing also increases your endorphins, which is the feel good chemical. That endorphin release combats pain, stimulates the lymphatic system, which detoxifies your body. Because when we slow down our breathing, we release more carbon dioxide into our system than we do with regular breathing, which means that your body doesn't have to work as hard to get rid of any toxins. I'm gonna show you just a quick, simple breathing exercise that helps to regain focus, slow down your heart rate, and clear your mind chatter. So all you have to do is breathe in through your nose, filling your abdomen and chest for five seconds. And then hold at the top for three seconds. And then slowly release through your mouth for five seconds. Simple to remember, right? In for five, 
out for three or hold for three rather, and then out for five. Do it for a couple minutes. Anytime you're starting to feel a bit stressed out or overwhelmed. You know, when you practice breath work, you really tune into your body and you connect with your physical self, which helps you to stay present and keep your mind focused. And then another thing that you can do to quickly relax in a moment and ground yourself is to focus on your senses. What can you touch? What can you hear? What can you smell? What can you feel? What can you see? Tuning into your senses when you're overwhelmed really helps to ground you in the present moment and keep you mindful. And speaking of that, we have just enough time here for me to show you one other tool, which is the body scan. And the purpose with it is to tune into your body and reconnect to your physical self so that you can notice any sensations that you're feeling. Body scans train your mind to be more open and aware and accepting of sensory experiences. And with practice, they build your ability to focus and be fully present in your life. And they also keep you mindful, which goes a very long way in increasing your resilience to stress. For many of us, stress not only has mental and emotional symptoms, but also physical symptoms as well. In fact, sometimes we get so caught up in our stress that we don't even realize that our physical discomfort, whether that be a headache, a stomach ache, whatever it is, is actually connected to our emotional state. That's when a body scan can be particularly useful because it allows us to check in with our bodies. By mentally scanning yourself from head to toe, you bring awareness to every part of your body, noticing any aches, any pains, discomfort, tension that you might be holding. Staying present with and breathing into those sensations can bring relief to both the body, but also the mind. And I'm gonna lead you through a quick one, just real fast. So go ahead and close your eyes so you can tune in and just listen to my voice. And start to bring your attention to your body. Feel the weight of it wherever you're seated or standing. And start to let go of any noises around you. Shift your attention from outside to inside of yourself. Next, focus on your breath. And on your next inhale, bring in more oxygen into your body. And as you exhale, feel a sense of relaxation more deeply. Start to notice how your legs feel. Pressure, pulsing heaviness or lightness. Now bring your attention to your stomach area. It feels tense or tight, allow it to soften. Start to notice your hands, Do they feel tense or tight. See if you can allow them to soften. Now bring your focus to your arms and feel any sensations in your arms and just accept whatever you feel and then allow it to soften. And bring your shoulders down, relax them. Notice your neck and your throat, let them be soft and relax. Soften your jaw, relax your face. And now expand your attention out to include your entire body as a whole. And bring into your awareness the top of your head all the way down to the bottom of your toes. And feel the gentle rhythm of your breath as it moves throughout your body. And inhale relaxation throughout your entire body and exhale any rela remaining tension. And go ahead and give yourself a big stretch and blink open your eyes. You can come back to that one anytime that you wanna to tune into your body. When you practice these types of self-care tools on a daily basis, you go a really long way in improving your health and helping to avoid overwhelm and burnout. And the thing is, is most of them can be done at any time in any place. If you'd like more information on these tools or the many others that exist for self-care, or you want to work with me further, just visit my website, natashaganis.com and reach out. Thanks and enjoy the rest of the summit.
Awesome. Thank you so much, Natasha. That was amazing. I feel way more relaxed already. Um, we have some more amazing women coming your way. I'm super excited. I just want to say thank you one more time to Natasha. Go ahead and check her out. We'll go ahead and add any links after the summit today. I am super excited to announce our next guest speaker. Her name is Andra Annette. Um, Andra is a transformational coach. She is an EFT practitioner and uh, so many more things that it's, I, I'm, so, I'm super excited for her to be talking on this subject. So um, you might know her because she is an expert in digital uh, nomad who's taken the road less traveled. She empowers women in business to boost their confidence by unraveling and clearing beliefs um, relating to imposter syndrome. And she helps empower women in business every single day by um, teaching us to use our EFT tapping. So she does uh, the emotional freedom technique. And this is a powerful tool for the mind body uh, to help remove emotional blocks that hold women back so that they can have the most successful life that they deserve to live. Andrea is an encouraging motivator and an expert um, who lives in Mexico, so who has lived in Mexico, Italy, China. So she is definitely a traveler. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Andrea, how are you? Hi, everyone. I'm so grateful to be here today and really be able to give you some quick wins in how to obtain optimal health in both your life and business. I think um, I want to also thank our hosts, Adriana and her mom, Hannah, for really bringing this together and all the women that are coming here today to really share their time and their expertise. My name is Andra Nett. I think there was a little snap though. I am not a transformational coach. I am a gut health expert and a nurse. So Today, I want to share a couple of things with you that are really dear to my heart. And like Natasha, self-care is really big on my list, little on setting priorities and, of course, gut health. So setting priorities is so important when you only have 24 hours in the day. And we take on, as women, so much more than we can really handle. And that will make such a difference in your life between balance, and burnout. So we really want to not take on more than we can. And we want to really create a plan that allows us to have balance throughout our day, take time for our family, our friends, our vocation, and our business. So self-care, for me, I, I relate to it in a different way. I like to think of it as really filling my own cup. Because if you're not taking care of yourself, you are the highest priority on that list. So I like to think of things that I could physically do because I'm a physical person that helps me unwind and de-stress. Like Natasha so eloquently said, I loved listening to her. I was getting so relaxed backstage. <laughs> so you can go out and take a walk and get outside and enjoy that fresh air where we connect so much better and more fully to ourselves. You can pamper yourself. It's okay to sit and write in a journal, to relax in a hot bath, or just be silly. Give yourself permission to be silly and dance around the house or spend time laughing with friends because laughter really is the best medicine. So there are other things we can do because exercise and everything is important, but many people think that exercise and eating well and sleeping is all that self-care really is. But as I mentioned, it's really more about filling your own cup. Excuse me. So, you know, there's going to be times where things or um, distractions come up in your day. And you really need to give yourself permission when you're taking care of yourself to say no. You know, we all have those friends in our lives that can make breaking a nail into a tragedy. And that's when we really have to set limits and minimize our distractions because building a business and creating balance in your life can be difficult. There's going to be times when you really can't be there for everyone. 
when your friends will say to you that they want you to come to a show or an event and you have to say, no, I'm sorry, I can't make it. So we somehow feel that we are disappointing everybody. And the truth is we're not. In order to really balance our life and make that difference between, so, you know, between balance and burnout, we really have to do what's going to move us forward in both our life and our limit and in, and in our business. So sometimes that really means setting limits. So lastly, I want to talk a little bit about gut health. So you hear a lot today about gut health and how having an unhealthy gut microbiome can really lead you to sickness. Well, it's a very different scenario for me, for someone who lived with it. So as someone who's worked in healthcare for 36 years this year, um, I can understand how the body works together as a system so that when one system fails, they all fail. So yes, gut health is important. But all of your systems work together and interconnect and function together as a team. Your gut health, as I'm sure you know, is directly connected to your heart, your immunity, and your brain function. But you want to really focus on your gut health. Now, 12 years ago, my life changed. So it, this is why this is so very dear to my heart. I was a different person back then. I was working in a very high role, very stressed, you know, in my life all the time as a nurse. Um, I was riddled, my body was riddled with pain and I was 260 pounds. And I was going through a time where I, I lost a lot of people in my family, which just really amplified that and brought that full circle in my life. And I suffered from leaky gut. So what is leaky gut? And how do you get it? Well, you can get leaky gut by eating those processed foods that you hear most the nutritionists tell you to stay away from, those sugary sweets, environmental factors like pollution, medications like antibiotics and um, ibuprofen, even things like that. So what is leaky gut? Well, our gut microbiome is what protects us, okay? And it is really literally the gatekeeper. And what that gatekeeper does is it keeps things inside and it allows that to pass outside the body and it keeps out the things that are harmful for us. So it protects us. So what happens in leaky gut is that barrier that is millions and millions and millions of cells lined side by side they have tight strands and junctions and they start to separate and the things that are inside leak outside and they make us very sick. So is gut, it goes throughout your whole blood system. So it's very hard to diagnose leaky gut because it is running throughout your blood system and you can have symptoms just about anywhere. So it's so important to take care of your gut health. As someone who personally felt like she was on the, the her dying bed. I can't even tell you how important it is to really manage your health and really practice that self-care and set those priorities so that you can show up for yourself in your life, in your business as the best person you can. So part of managing good gut health is eating those things we always hear about, our fruits, our vegetables, and our whole grains. Well, those are prebiotics that aren't really processed and digested by the body well, they actually feed the probiotics that are, are in the gut mi microbiome and they help it proliferate and it strengthens and it's actually what gives us that immunity. So we, we want to eat nutrient dense foods and a large variety of fruits and vegetables. But to practice good health, hygiene and self care, is what it really comes down to, like we talked about before, because your cortisol levels, that stress is destroying your gut. That's where your hormones are regulated. So, and it's it's the biggest cause of all disease. So you, you really want to take care of yourself. And as someone who always didn't prioritize self-care 
and make priorities for myself and really focus on my health because I was so busy trying to be everybody for everyone. I can tell you what a difference it's made in my life today and I'm able to help other people. You know, life is such a gift. You know, and the human body is the best machine that has ever been made. So if you take care of that gift, that gift will take care of you. So that's all I really wanted to say to you today. I want to thank everybody for, for being here today. And again, I am Andre Annette. Thanks for having me. Take care. Hi, Andre. Thank you so much. So sorry for the bio mix up. And um, I was so excited and happy you cleared it up. But you, you talked about so many important things about the gut. And I saw a lot of influx of comments coming in about how you really helped change a lot of people's lives. And um, it's, a, you know, the gut isn't something that we talk about often enough. So I love that you shed light on it, went into a lot of great detail. And I just want to thank you so much for joining us here today, Andra. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you so much for having me. Love you guys. Love you too. Have a great day. So up next, we have an amazing speaker. Um, her name is Samantha Lander. You may know her as a functional diagnostic nutrition, and she helps uh, individuals to um, heal themselves from allergies. So she's healed herself from allergies, food sensitivities, hormonal imbalances, and parasites. She's also the founder of Sea Fit, Fit Living, where she coaches people back to optimal health when they can when they can't quite put their finger on why they feel so bad so i want to welcome samantha lander here today thank you so much for joining me oh thank you for having me oh well my screen just went crazy okay hi how are you i'm doing well so you're here to talk to us today more in depth so i'm gonna let you take the stage all right i'm happy to <laughs> All right. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Um, I think it's great that you're, the fact that you're tuning in on something like this alone means that you're already taking the initiative and the steps that you need to, to practice self-care. Um, so for me, it was, I am a functional diagnostic nutritionist. It's a very fancy name. Um, and a lot of people get very confused, but I handle all things sort of health. Um, and I help identify the root cause of what could be causing, underlying health issues within the body. Um, so the way that I do this will be, you know, I, I learned to do this because I, like many other practitioners, struggled with my health. I had been to all the doctors and ran all the labs that a doctor would run. I think I went to an endocrinologist, a, G a OBGYN, a GI doctor, and I was getting nowhere and I almost started to feel worse. And I was also working out a ton, which I know a lot of women do and eating really, really clean. And you start to then not get any results and then you work out harder and then you eat less. And it's actually, that's doing more harm than good in the body. And a lot of times what I find um, from when I was a personal trainer, I still am, that my clients and I were doing all the right things and not getting any results. So we'd go to the gym and we would eat, you know, the clean foods and be really, really strict or, you know, do the weightlifting and do the cardio. And the results were just, it's almost like we all felt worse. We had more GI problems and more things going on. And that's when I knew that there was more pieces to the puzzle. And I knew I had to figure out what was going on with my health because I, I was getting to the point where it was causing, I'm an extrovert and it was causing severe I was becoming an introvert. I didn't even want to get out of bed. I didn't want to get dressed. I would just go to work and go home. And it was, it was a real struggle. And I, and I work with women who are, they almost feel like they need anti-anxiety medicine and anti, you know, depression meds, just because there's some sort of root cause going on and nobody's able to identify it. So some of the symptoms that I see with a lot of with the women that come in are brain fog, um, so you feel like you're going to go upstairs and you're going to do something and then you totally forget what you're going to do. I know we can all relate to that. And you're like, oh, do I have ADD suddenly or what's going on? Um, and you have the inability to lose weight. So it's like no matter what you do, you get your thyroid tested. You might even go on thyroid meds. Every, you're, you're doing everything. You know, you're, you're following the diets and, and the meal plans and you're working out and nothing is budging. You might actually even be 
start gaining weight is what I see um, because your body is in such a high state of stress. Constipation, diarrhea. I can't even tell you how many women come in with, to work with me and they do not go to the bathroom. And um, they do have chronic diarrhea, but one that's really bad is constipation. And they aren't going, you should be going to the bathroom at least once a day. And this is poop we're talking about. And the importance of that is because it's going to start to detoxify your body. That's where you're like the waste goes. And you need to make sure all your drainage and your cleansing pathways are really clear in order to go to the bathroom and eliminate all the toxins from your body daily. So imagine if that just starts building up day after day after day, your body on the inside becomes incredibly toxic. So I am a firm believer, right? Your gut is your second brain and you really got to heal the body from the inside out um, to get the results that you want. And it's not all about superficial stuff and how you look. Um, low sex drive. So that is another really, really big factor that I see with my clients. Exhaustion, just always tired. It doesn't matter how much they sleep. Um, they have a lot of sleep disturbances, so their sleep is really off. So they wake up a lot at night and then they can't go back to sleep, which could be a sign of a parasite because they're very active at night and that is stressful for the body. Um, they um, are having hormonal imbalances. So even if you're going through perimenopause, menopause, or just uh, you have a normal cycle, your cycles become irregular. You become extremely bloated during um, and a lot of PMS symptoms, or when you ovulate, your symptoms become really, really increased and intense. And you just can't get a handle on like ever feeling good. Like literally you feel like you have PMS three weeks out of the month. Um, and maybe there's one good week in there. You might have really, really heavy periods, um, infertility. These are all the types of things that I work with that can happen that have like their underlying hormone imbalances or underlying, you know, adrenal issues or underlying gut and GI issues. And all of these things start to symptoms start to arise telling you, okay, we need to do something about this. Um, a lot of autoimmune conditions will pop up. So polycystic ovarian syndrome, Hashimoto's, um, Graves disease. There's a lot of um, correlation between autoimmune diseases and chronic stress on the body. And remember, your body does not know the difference between good stress and bad stress. So you could be doing a five mile run, but that is a steady state of cardio, which is a steady state of chronic stress. Instead of just going and doing like 20 minutes of hit intervals where you just go really hard, rest, and then you're done. Um, it's all about, you know, time management with your workouts, not overextending the body. Um, so what I do is I run labs. So I do functional lab testing. They typically are not covered by insurance. But what I'll do is I'll test for food sensitivities. And that's where we work on your nutrition. And we work on um, how to get proper like meal planning. I don't put anybody on a diet. I always make sure that this is a lifestyle plan. We're going to teach you how to eat this way for the rest of your life. I, am, I do believe that it's okay to have a cheat meal. I don't think that you should be miserable if you want to have a piece of chocolate or whatever it is that you like. You know, mine is Chinese. Then do it. But I like to get people to the point where they're able to eat that and not feel like so bad that they can't even function the next day. So we work on the nutrition. We remove the food sensitivities. We decrease the inflammation in the gut. We do a GI panel looking for any parasites or underlying infections or candidia, SIBO, um, heavy metals. So I identify all these little stressors that are hidden in the body that most people wouldn't probably see if you just go to the general doctor. And from there, we're, we're able to, as we, we mentioned earlier, is work on the leaky gut. So we find out what's causing the leaky gut, which could be food sensitivities, parasite infections, whatever it is, some sort of bacteria overgrowth. We remove all of these infections and inflammation using supplementation. And that's when we start to work on really um, healing the gut. And we're able to then get to a point where people can eat the foods that they, you know, have a cheat meal and do these things and kind of live a more normal life. And they go to the bathroom and they, they, um, you know, I have some people that have to literally find the bathrooms on the way to work to, in case they have diarrhea. So, um, we will run functional labs. So my big ones are food sensitivity, heavy metal. I do GI panels, a very comprehensive one. I'm very particular. I love parasites. I, 
I, that was sort of the root cause of a lot of my problems. And as soon as I actually got rid of the parasite and my estrogen was super high is when I started to see the results. And that's when I started running the labs on all of um, my clients and seeing that there, it made a massive difference and everybody started getting results. Um, and I'm kind of, you know, a bulldog when it comes to that. So I'm, I'm, I will find what's going on. I had to be very proactive with my health. I mean, I just had to go through um, a big thing with a biological dentist just with my teeth. So it's, it is sort of a never ending product project for women, but it is very important because then you're able to be better and more, um, optimized and able to work better and run a business and do all those hopes and dreams with your family and, and go out to, you know, out of town on vacation. I remember that used to be very stressful for me because I didn't know what to eat and I was scared. I wasn't going to feel good, you know, with my family and you don't want to complain. It's a really, really hard kind of path to have to go down. But if you can find someone to work with and work on the gut and work on the hormones and balance the hormones and get rid of the night sweats and the hot flashes, like all these symptoms are not a normal thing. And, um, you know, there is, there is a possibility to really live a, a fruitful life, shall you say. So, um, I just want you guys to all know, like the takeaway is you have to be proactive for your health. You have to be an advocate at the doctor. If you're working with a doctor that doesn't really take a functional medicine sort of holistic standpoint on things and you're worth it and it's okay to treat your doctor or the practitioner that you work with like a Bumble app is what I say. And you can swipe and say no, and you can interview, but it is your health. And that's the most important thing that you have and you have to take care of it. And I think that's it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Samantha. That was amazing. I love the detail. I love the examples. I love the tips and all the strategies that you shared with us today. Thank you so much for joining and sharing all of your nuggets. Thanks for having me. Of course. So up next, we are going to still stay on the topic of health and wellness, as well as avoiding burnout. I have a very special guest. She is a return speaker. Her name is Leslie Gaudette. She is a motivational speaker, international best-selling author, and self-care specialist for female entrepreneurs and professionals who need help who need to incorporate, I should say, more self-care into their life and in business so that they stay sharp, focused, and wake up with more energy and intention to tackle their daily activities with confidence. I want to thank you so much, Leslie, for joining us here today. I'm excited. I love veterans on our summit, so thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Wow, what a lineup we've had so far. I've just learned so much and I'm excited actually to reach out to some of these ladies uh, for a lot of different reasons because self-care is like my jam. So good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're enjoying yourselves today and all that you're learning about and what's being poured into you so that you have an amazing life. And I'm excited to continue this journey with you. So with that being said, let me ask you this. Have you ever asked yourself this question? How do I stay motivated when I feel like I have no energy and I feel like I'm on the verge of burnout? It really does come down to one thing, and that is self-care. And what I'm going to talk to you about today, it will specifically address energy and burnout. Now, let's start with the end of your day first and take a look at what you do now that perhaps isn't in your best interest for optimum rest so that you wake up with more energy and are able to tackle your daily activities with confidence. So number one is setting yourself up for a good night's rest. And you've heard a little bit about this earlier today, but really, have you ever woken up feeling so super tired, feeling like you didn't get a wink of sleep? Or do you find yourself getting on social media just before bed or checking your emails or text messages before turning in for the night. I know I used to be a repeat offender on that. Do you find if that's you, that you can't shut off your brain and you're faced with what I call monkey mind, where you're all over the place, thinking about all that you have to do tomorrow, the stuff that you didn't get done today and your mind is just going a hundred miles a minute. So how do you set yourself up for a good night's rest? Here are some things that I do that I hope can inspire you to set yourself up as well. It starts with having a no scroll rule after a certain time of the day. Mine is 7 p.m. And that also means no answering of messages, whether it's emails or DMs or text messages, because I realize that it will all be there tomorrow. 
and you'll have time to get it done once you have had proper rest and can wake up energized and refreshed for a brand new day. If you find that you typically go to bed with monkey mind and feel like you just can't shut it off, no matter how hard you try to force it by counting sheep or counting backwards, worrying what you didn't finish, worrying about all you, you still have to do tomorrow, I encourage you to get out a notepad and write it all down before you go to bed. Everything that's in here, get it out to paper, out of your head. That way, when you wake up tomorrow, the next day, you can look at it, look, th look it over, pick out and prioritize your important tasks. And don't overwhelm your to-do list either with 10 plus things to get done. In fact, I've heard it said that 80% of your results come from 20% of your work. So that means if you have two tasks on your 10 to-do list and you complete the two of, out of the 10, then that means 80% of your results will come from that place. Of course, that also depends on you being confident and clear about what's important to get done, which is in alignment with what you're working on right now. And that will get you that much closer to reaching your goals. Does that make sense? One last point around monkey mind. If you find yourself waking up in the middle of the night and you can't shut off your brain, use the notes app on your phone and get all of what you're thinking about in a note. That way you don't have to worry about forgetting it, especially if you're like me. And when you're in creator mode that you sometimes wake up in the middle of the night with some amazing aha moments. Yeah, it still happens to me now and again. And I love that I have my notes app so that I can get it all down that way. I won't forget what it is that I'm thinking about at that moment. I'm suggesting this to you so that you're not leaving your brain on constantly thinking about the idea or the insight because you've put it in a note, which allows you to feel confident to go back to sleep because it'll be there tomorrow. Number two, daily mental breaks. So important. And one area of, I think, most women, especially if you're an entrepreneur, we seem to really resist this. It's why it's mental breaks daily is important for you to let your mind unwind throughout your day. There are scientific studies done around health benefits of taking mental breaks. In fact, according to an article that was done recently by Cornell Health, research is showing that taking purposeful breaks anywhere between five to 60 minutes from studying to refresh your brain and body increases your energy, productivity, and your ability to focus. The study also shows that social media, by the way, doesn't serve as a break that supports you. In fact, it does quite the opposite. Research reported by Bustle.com reported that scientists found supporting evidence with college undergrads that when they were took a break from studying they and turned to their phones and social media, that their mental efficiency and quickness plummeted. So that means that checking your messages, scrolling through social media and getting caught up in scrolling is not allowing your brain to take a much needed break. So the key takeaway here, ladies, is, is to give your brain a break. I take breaks every hour to allow my brain to reset, recharge and re-energize so that when I do get back at it, I'm ready to tackle the next step with a relaxed and re-energized brain. Now, number three, knowing your energy, right? Let's talk about your energy and timing of when you do your tasks for your day. There's a book that I read, uh, well, actually, I'm still in the midst of reading it. It's by Daniel H. Pink. It's called When the Scientific Secrets of Perfect Timing, which I highly recommend. And it's all about timing of us knowing our energy, of us knowing when we're more inclined to focus on larger tasks and have the most energy to do those, as well as when to do our admin tasks. And of course, it's you noticing your patterns. Someone I know once told me, she asked herself this each and every morning, two questions that set the pace for her day. They are, what do I need? And what does my business need? First, you pay attention to what you need, your energy levels. I truly believe that when you start with self-care first thing in the morning, things that fill your cup daily, that it makes it that much easier for you to focus on your day and be more intentional about what you do. But self-care isn't just a morning thing. It's a daily, all-day thing. And it's a lifestyle choice. When it comes to your business, think about what tasks you have during the day that will take up a huge chunk of energy. For example, 
I'm a morning learner, meaning I like to do my head down, totally focused work in the morning. And then I'll do usually do light admin work in the afternoon, followed by brainstorming and creative work later in the day. But also pay attention to what you feed your body as you go out throughout your day. And especially if you're in that creative mode or especially if you're in that head down, you know, that learning mode where you have to focus. Realize it's not just your body that's affected by what you eat because your brain consumes about 20% of your calories. And that's just a thought for you to think about as well as hydration. Your brain is... So it needs to be hydrated just as well as your body. So remember that. Now, here's a bonus one I wanted to add to you because I know that this really will help with the energy because it helps with sleep. And that's practicing gratitude. It's how I start my day as part of my self-care routine because it gets me on a very positive energy level. In fact, gratitude energy is one of the highest vibrational frequencies you can be on, like the energy of love. So start your day with gratitude and end your day with gratitude. And this is what I, I like to call gratitude stacking. So in the morning, think of three things you're grateful for. One person, one experience, and one thing about you. Don't forget about you. In the evening, you end your day with gratitude by writing in your gratitude journal. So before you turn in for the night, write five new things daily that you're grateful for, which helps you focus on all the goodness in your life. Now, there are scientific studies around the benefits of practicing gratitude. In fact, time.com wrote an article and they said research done in the Journal of Psychosomatic Research has found that feeling grateful helps people sleep better and longer. There's so many other benefits of practicing. Too. I want to share this one in particular because it pertains to energy and the importance of resting your mind and your body. By, bottom line here is take care of you. You, you will have more productive days and you'll feel more energized, focused, and ready to tackle your days with confidence. Thanks for being here. Hope that you found some value in what I shared with you today and that you can take these tips and start waking up with more energy, focused, and ready to tackle your day with confidence. And that you also embrace self-care as a lifestyle choice for you that's meant to support you in such amazing and beautiful ways so that you show up as the best version of you every single day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leslie. I really appreciate everything that you shared with us here today. Um, I know it may have been a little bit laggy. Uh, Leslie does come to us. Um, I want to say she's in Florida right now. Um, but nonetheless, I'm super excited and grateful that she shared all her amazing tips. She's truly an amazing woman who has paved the way for women and was with us since beginning of our Becoming an Unstoppable Woman book series and book number one. Thank you so much, Leslie, for all that you shared with us today. So up next, and we are staying on the topic still of health and wellness and how to avoid burnout. I have with a special guest, her name is Alisa Fucci. She is a relationship life coach and energy healer. Now, she has an amazing calming voice. So please turn up your volumes. I want you to meet this wonderful lady. Um, through coaching and breath work, Elisa helps women let go of limiting beliefs, negative thought patterns, emotional baggage, and finally to be happy in their current marriage without waiting for their husband or circumstances to change. Elisa became a certified uh, life coach in 2021 through the Life Coaching School. She has become an international best-selling author with her book, Unleash Her. She hosts a podcast to empower Latina women to create the lifestyle they deserve, um, and it's called Living La Vida a Full. She has created events and workshops to teach women to tap into their inner wisdom, find their voice, learn to process their emotions, and how to drop expectations and start enjoying their relationships today. So thank you so much for joining me here today, Elisa. I'm excited. Thank you for having me. And hello, everyone. I feel like there's a topic here that we're all talking about. <laughs> and it's self care. So I'm going to just go on on that topic as well. But before I would like to start off by reading a little excerpt uh, from my journal a few months ago. And I want you guys to tell me if you re can relate with anything I'm reading to you guys. So 
Um, I wrote, I am feeling so much anxiety, overwhelm, disappointment, sadness. I feel like I can't catch up. I'm doing so much, yet nothing is getting done. I'm trying so hard, and yet nothing is getting accomplished. I'm feeling stuck. I wanted to share this because this is how my entire first year and a half of my entrepreneurship uh, was. It was uh, ups and downs of me feeling super excited and motivated and then collapsing and crashing into uh, panic attacks and depressive moments where I could not get out of bed. And I didn't realize what was the underlying problem until recently. And this is something that I believe it gets overlooked and not really seen by most people. We are told uh, most of the times by, by, you know, when we're starting our business or in our relationships of things we need to do to get a successful business. For example, in our businesses, we should have a funnel. We should hire a coach. We should be on social media. We should invest in marketing. In our relationships, we should have boundaries, communicate, be able to say sorry. We have all these how-tos. But what I would like to offer you guys is what if instead of all the how-tos, that we need to be doing so we can have successful relationship and successful businesses and successful careers. What if it's all about self-love and self-intimacy and self-awareness? What if the, the key to success in your business is loving yourself more? What if the key to having successful relationships is loving yourself more? Because I believe that the reason why you have problems in your relationships is because of self-hate. Because if you loved yourself enough, then when we love ourselves enough, we are able to say no more to others and more, yeah, and yes to ourselves more, right? If we love ourselves, we are okay feeling the discomfort of failing, and we are able to just overcome it and keep going. When we love ourselves more, we are okay with slowing down in our businesses, because we know we need it. We are When we love ourselves, we are okay taking a day off and slowing down and 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 doing like what all these women have encouraged us to do and take care of ourselves. But I believe the reason why I was bullying myself through success this past entire year was because of my self-talk, because really I was bullying myself. And it wasn't until I was able to slow down. And this was because God pushed me to get like I was sick and God pushed me and I had to stop everything because I couldn't think of anything else other than getting better and improving my health. I was just super sick. And that allowed me to really slow down. But if you're anything like me, slowing down is really hard, right? And even when we slow down, even when we schedule our date nights, even when we schedule our time, we're really not slowing down, right? (laughs) And we're bullying ourselves on the background, telling ourselves, oh, we should be doing this. And things are not getting done. And yes, I'm enjoying this. I'm taking care of myself. But on the background, you're telling yourself all the things you should be doing, all the things you didn't do, all the things that are getting missed. And you're really not enjoying yourself. And it's what I like, what I call it, you're bullying yourself to success. So what I like to to cover is how I got myself to being loving myself and having success in my relationships, having success in my marriage through loving myself. But it, because it wasn't until I was able to slow down and see what I needed to change in my life, what I needed to change inside me. It wasn't until I decided to put myself first to create boundaries that I was able to save my marriage in two months. It wasn't until I decided to slow down and look at what I was feeling and allow myself to feel the discomfort 
of just sitting down and not doing anything, of not getting things done and being okay and allowing myself to just sit in that discomfort, in those emotions, and then noticing what my inner narrative was. It wasn't until I was able to listen to that and allow myself to go through that, that process that I was able to change my inner dialogue and start being my own cheerleader, start loving myself more, start seeing myself for the amazing woman that I am, starting to see the worth I have and the value I can offer. And when I believe in myself and in my value and in my offer, then we become unstoppable and we show up for our clients, for our family in a whole different way. We show up and we are not a we don't apologize for what we charge. We don't apologize for what we say or for what we stand for. So it all comes down to self-love. I believe the foundation to doing all these how-tos that we hear, all the things that we need to do, the foundation is all about self-love. Without self-love, we can create all these outcomes, but it'll end up in exhaustion, overwhelm, and burnout. Why? Because we are creating, uh, we're trying to create a positive outcome with negative energy from within. And that takes a lot more energy than if we were using positive energy to create what we want. And what happens is, yeah, we might get aligned with, with our outcome, with what we want, but really we will never be, feel like it's enough. When we get there, it'll feel like it wasn't good enough. And we'll be always looking for that perfection. And the reason because why this happens is because of our inner dialogue, because of the way we talk to ourselves, because we are not loving ourselves more. So the what I would like to read something that uh, Mia Angelo said, success is liking yourself Liking what you do and liking how you do it. Exactly. Because why do we burn out? Why do we get to that point where it, we're starting to resent everyone in our relationships? Why? It's because we have neglected ourselves. It is a continuous way that we have of neglecting ourselves. So I encourage you to start slowing down. And allow yourself to feel that emotion. And what that looks like is just tapping into your body. Where is it? Is it in your, in your chest, in your throat, in your head? What is it trying to tell you? Because every emotion has a message for you. It's a wound that needs to be addressed. And then when you're able to see that, what the message is behind that emotion, you can decide what is true and what is not. You can believe it or not. Are you, are you uh, supporting yourself through your talk, through your dialogue inside you, or are you bullying yourself to success? So again, slow down. And I know that feels so uncomfortable. Allow yourself to process that emotion. Allow yourself to feel just that emotion, that vibration in your body. It will go away. It doesn't mean anything. Don't judge it. Don't make it mean anything about you because that emotion has nothing to do with you. It's just a reaction in your body. And then once you decide what your brain is making it mean, then you can really go into the facts. You can neutralize it by realizing, is this me? Is this really who I am? And is this helping me stand up for myself, love myself more? So... If any of this resonates with you, if any of this feels true to you, I encourage you to follow me on Instagram at Elisa Fucci Coaching, and you can click on the link on my bio where I have a free guided meditation. You can schedule a one-on-one -on -one call with me and see how I help women through breath work and coaching finally let go of negative thought patterns, negative beliefs that are keeping them stuck and emotional baggage so they can finally be happy in their relationships without waiting for people to change or circumstances to change. 
Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Thank you, Elisa. I told you, everybody, she was going <laughs> to warm your hearts, calm your inner soul. Uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here thank with you. us. Thank you. So up next, we have Andrea Hunt. This bio might sound familiar to you because earlier I did mistake two bios together. So please welcome Andrea Hunt. She is a transformational coach in, and EFT practitioner. She empowers women in business to boost their confidence by unraveling and clearing beliefs really relating to imposter syndrome, self-doubting narratives, and insecurities using EFT tapping. The emotional freedom technique is a powerful mind-body tool that removes emotional blocks that hold women back so that they you know, can have successful lives. And um, I'm super excited to have you join us here today. Thank you so much, Andrea. Hi, thank you so much for the warm welcome. I am so excited to be here. And so today I want to talk to you about the importance of your emotional health for both your business and also in your personal life. So I want to tell you a little bit about this really cool mind-body technique called EFT tapping. So first of all, being able to manage your emotions is actually a superpower. And after the speech, you'll probably understand more why. So first of all, EFT tapping can be used to prevent negative emotions. It can be used to clear and even recalibrate emotions when something bad has already happened. It can be used to clear the emotional stories that we have within ourselves about self-doubt or maybe the things that cause lack of confidence. But they are affect, are affecting our emotional health because they're creating fear and anxiety and worry within our lives. So let's start simple. So what is emotional health? So emotional health it basically involves the ability to control, manage, and also express our emotions in a, in a healthy way. So we are emotional beings after all, and many of our actions and impulses are unfortunately led by our emotions. So you might be asking yourself, okay, so what impact does that have? Well, let me give you a scenario and you see if you can relate to this or not. Let's say you woke up in a good mood, you're rested, you're calm, you had a great weekend, you're walking down the street, somebody bumps into you, maybe they step on your foot by accident, they apologize, you say, hey, no worries, and you walk off and you carry on with your day. You have a great day. However, let's think of the other scenario. Let's imagine that you're exhausted, overworked, stressed, and already crabby, and a stranger knocks into you. That's something else altogether, isn't it? You might explode on a total stranger. You might scream at them. Maybe you even get to your office and have a cry later because you're already in a frazzled state. So as you can see, we had different emotional responses to the same exact situation just based on our emotional state. One was a healthy response and the other one was probably not helpful. So what does that have to do with emotional health? Well. Today, as we're talking about the burnout, it should be worth mentioning that Deloitte had a report lately that up to 50% of women during the last few years have reported experiencing burnout. And this is hardly surprising given the last couple of years with the pandemic and all of the added responsibilities that a lot of women had both inside or you know, in, their, in their careers and jobs. So the problem with this is usually that you know, when most of us get into very stressful situations, we're just not really sure how to manage our emotions, especially when we have times of severe stress. So what happens? It builds up, it builds up, it builds up. And at some point, our body or our mind stops us. We might emotionally just have a breakdown. Our body might stop us by getting sick. We crash physically, emotionally, and in every single way. So today I want to talk about how we can take care of our emotional health because we want to avoid that kind of burnout. So it's important to understand that when we're in an emotionally healthy place, we're in control of our thoughts, feelings, and our behaviors. We're able to cope with life's challenges. doesn't mean life is perfect. doesn't mean we've eliminated all problems, but we're more resilient when those things happen so we can bounce back easier. But that's unfortunately not what most of us do. Many of us don't stop and regulate our emotions and recalibrate, so we often can spiral out of control. And all the while, we're telling ourselves we don't have time to take care of ourselves. We don't have time to meditate. We don't have time to exercise. We don't have time to cook a healthy meal. 
And this is especially one of the biggest issues that I see with my female clients is that they might be putting everybody and everything first. And the fact is we can't be anything to anyone if we're not taking care of ourselves emotionally and physically. We have to put our oxygen mask on first. So let me tell you about a really helpful tool that will help with that. So how does EFT tapping actually help you manage your emotional health? Well, EFT stands for the Emotional Freedom Technique, and it's a little bit of funny looking uh, mind-body tool, but it helps you to regulate your feelings, clear negative emotions, recalibrate your feelings, can empower you with positive affirmations and create more empowering and helpful beliefs. So I have been using EFT tapping on my own for the last 10 years for basically every situation under the sun from studying for finals exams to going to interviews to breakups to, you know, arguments with my parents. And now I can use it with my clients. I used to be one of those people who would get completely derailed by one thing in the morning and the rest of my day, I was just bumping into people and situations just reacting and exploding. Now I'm thankful to say that I am not like that anymore. So the emotional freedom technique uses finger tapping on acupuncture points on the face along the body's energy meridians, and it calms the body's fight, flight, or freeze response. And it's best used in three different ways I'm going to tell you about. The first is as a preventative technique. The second is responsive. And the third is a clearing uh, technique for limiting beliefs and also our self-doubt. So the first one is preventative. So my advice is always to use EFT tapping, tapping as part of your morning routine. There's plenty of videos on YouTube. There's even the Tapping Solution app. And basically, if you take 5 to 15 minutes in the morning at the beginning of your day to ground yourself, to center yourself, you're much less likely to be as reactive emotionally to the things that are happening in the rest of your day. So remember, prevention is always key. However, this brings us to the second way that it can be used. It can be used as a method to recalibrate throughout the day. So things can always happen. We just simply don't have control of, of everything that goes on around us. We might get an email from a boss that really makes us upset. Maybe our kids do something. Maybe our partner says something. Maybe we're stuck in traffic and now we're late. There's a million things that can possibly happen. And it's so important to be able to re, like to take our power back and get ourselves back into an emotionally grounded and centered place. So we're not just reacting to every single thing that happens around us. And this is one of those times where you can use those same videos or tapping meditations and just take five to 15 minutes, sit in your car in a parking lot, you know, excuse yourself to go to the restroom, take a walk, however you can get away from everybody and everything for just a few minutes to calm yourself down so you can go back to the situation in a clear head. And the third method that I wanted to tell you about, that is the one that I use with my clients, and it's using EFT with, for our self-doubting narratives and some of the core limiting beliefs that we might have that are causing us anxiety, stress, and worry, and, and fear. Let me give you an example of how this might show up. So let's say as an eight-year-old kid, let's say you had a book report and you're supposed to read it in front of the class. You go up there, the teacher says a snide comment. Everybody laughs at you. So what beliefs did you take out of that situation? You probably believe that I'm a bad public speaker. It's not safe to be seen. Um, maybe you don't feel that you can talk without everybody criticizing you and you carry that into adulthood. And so suddenly your boss wants you to pre present something to a client and you're gripped with anxiety and fear that you're going to mess it all up. And that's one of the really common ones. But there's also other limiting beliefs like people have, uh, I'm a fraud. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm weak if I ask for help. So these are the ones that I work with my clients on because these kind of beliefs create such heightened anxiety and fear that people put extra pressure on themselves that create all sorts of problems. Some of them physical, maybe they can't sleep or eat because of them. And it also can cause people to avoid situations or procrastinate. So this is why EFT is so powerful, because when you clear back the layers of these beliefs, I mean, think about it. Can you imagine the difference in how you would show up for a meeting 
if you believed in yourself and had more confidence instead of believing that you're a fraud. So in conclusion, you know, stress happens, life happens, but having the right tools to be able to manage your emotions and are imperative for your success and you're on a daily basis. So now I've told you three different ways that you can use EFT to manage your emotional health and be in control of your emotions. Take your power back. I hope that you can also look up and use this superpower, and I hope that it's piqued your interest. So whatever the situation is, that EFT tapping can save the day. I can't wait to hear uh, if it works for you, and please reach out to me on my website, www.drea.com, with any questions that you have. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful to be here. Thank you, Andrea. I appreciate it. It was an awesome topic that you shared with us today. I was doing the techniques as you were sharing it with us. Um, it's always helpful, beneficial. It really did work. You know, I feel more centered. So I, I love practicing that. It's something that I kind of newly integrated into my life. So I just want to thank you so much for sharing that. Um, our last speaker on this subject for health and wellness and how to avoid burnout, we have a very special guest. Her name is Crystal Casey. Crystal is an author, instructor, and empowerment coach who has overcome personal adversity to become a leader in the field of self-care and self-improvement. After years of traditional treatment for pain and emotional trauma, she discovered the healing power of yoga and eventually opened her own studio. However, life took a drastic turn when her husband was charged with sexual abuse against a minor and subsequently passed away. Despite her immense grief and trauma, she found the strength to persevere for the sake of her five children. Through the months of self-care, self-intimacy, and self-love, Crystal discovered a new level of resilience and inner strength. She is now on a mission to help others harness their feminine power and step confidently into their future. Uh, I just want to welcome Crystal. You are a true inspiration to many, and I just want to thank you for empowering women everywhere. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ladies, do you ever feel like there's something holding you back in your business? Like you aren't quite living up to your full potential or like something's missing. What if I told you that the key to unlocking your true potential as an entrepreneurial woman is to embrace your sexuality and feminine power? What did she just say? Yes, I know. It may sound unconventional, but hear me out. Close your eyes. Go with me. Close your eyes for a moment. And I want you to just imagine waking up each day feeling energized and excited to tackle the day. Imagine feeling confident and sexy and powerful in your skin and bringing that fire into everything that you do. Imagine watching your business grow and blossom and thrive. Open your eyes. As women, we have the power to change the world, to break generational cycles, to create freedom, love, abundance, peace. But in order to do that, like some of the other women said already, we get to take care of ourselves first. We get to infuse our lives with our creativity and our passion, and we get to tap into our sensuality and our sexuality to bring that fire into our business. I'm here to tell you that it's possible, and it starts with taking care of yourself in the bedroom. Listen, when we step into our sexuality and we embrace our feminine power, we gain confidence, authenticity, creativity and motivation, all of which are essential for business success. So today we're gonna to explore how embracing your sexuality and feminine power can lead to increased productivity, empathy, impact, and resilience in the workplace. We're gonna talk about how applying these concepts will help you see real results in your business. So are you ready to turn up the heat and up your energy on your passion and creativity? I know you are. So let's dive in and let's talk about eight ways that embracing your sexuality can seriously ignite your business success. Number one, embracing your sexuality can lead to an increase in confidence 
and assertiveness in the workplace. This can help you speak up for yourself to make your ideas known, and this can help you be more successful in negotiations and in meetings. This confidence will help you to speak your truth, to share your ideas freely, and to help you not be afraid to ask for what it is that you really want. Number two, one of the most powerful things that you can do as an entrepreneur is to be true to yourself. When you embrace your femininity and your sexuality, you become more authentic and more relatable. And this can lead to a greater success because you are more genuine in your interactions with other people, with everyone around you. You're also going to be more empathetic because you're more in tune with your own emotions and you're more aware and understanding of the emotions of those around you. So this is going to lead you to deeper connections with your colleagues, your clients, your partners, your team. And this doesn't only help you grow your business, but this is the good stuff. This is what matters in life. It's what it's all about. Step number three, embracing your femininity and your sexuality can lead to an increase in your creativity and innovation. Think about it. When you're not afraid to express yourself, you can think outside of the box. You can come up with new, fresh ideas. When you're confident and you're bold, you get to play, explore, discover, create something new, something that you wouldn't otherwise. Number four, Embracing your sexuality impacts your branding and marketing. What? Yes, being authentic and true to yourself is an important aspect of your branding and marketing. By embracing your sexuality and feminine power, you can create a unique and compelling brand that really resonates with your target audience. Take Rihanna, for example. Rihanna is known for her bold, unapologetic approach to fashion and beauty. And this is reflected in her brands. Fenty Beauty is known for its inclusive and diverse shade range. It caters to all skin tones and is super inclusive in terms of representation in their marketing campaigns. Savage X Fenty is a lingerie brand that celebrates all body types, all sizes. It encourages self-expression and self-love. So Rihanna is really using her own personal style and her confidence as a way to connect with her target, her target audience, and it helps her to promote her brands. Her approach to branding and marketing is all about embracing femininity, sexuality, inclusivity, and this has been a big part of her success. Step number six, embracing sexuality and feminine power can help you become more resilient. So just like Andrea was talking about with the um, emotional resilience, being resilient is super important when you're a, a boss babe, right? When you're running your own business and when you feel comfortable and confident in your own skin, you're better equipped to handle the stress and the challenges that come up in the workplace. You're likely to bounce back from setbacks and to keep going. That means you're going to overcome your challenges and you're more likely to succeed. Number seven, when you're standing in your full power, you're more motivated to achieve your goals, to exceed, succeed in business. And this increased motivation leads to increased productivity, which means expansion, business growth, becoming confident and sexy is actually going to help you become more successful. And number not, I'm sorry, number eight, when you embrace your sexuality and feminine power, you tend to have a greater impact in the world. And this is because you're more confident, authentic, and motivated to make a difference in your industry. When you show up and you be who you are, you get to impact everyone around you. And this leads to a positive change in your business, in your industry, in the world. It's important to note though, when I'm saying embrace your sexuality and feminine power, ladies, I'm not saying to be sexual or provocative in a business environment, okay? So we're not hiking up skirts and letting the girls out. Put them away. That's not what I mean. I'm talking about being comfortable in your own skin, being true to yourself and who you are. It's about embracing and owning your unique femininity and using it to your advantage in the business world. 
This can mean being more assertive, being more in tune with your emotions and the emotions of others, being more open to taking risks or being more creative. It's also important to know that everyone's version of femininity and sexuality is unique to them. It means different things to different people. There's no one right way to be sexy. The key is to find what works for you and to be true to yourself. And by doing this, you achieve your full potential. You make a positive impact. So are you ready to step into your full power as an entrepreneur and to embrace your unique femininity and sexuality? Because when you do, you open yourself up to a world of possibilities. You gain the confidence, authority, creativity, and motivation to take your business to new heights. Embracing your sexuality and femininity, it can be the key to unlocking your true potential as a businesswoman. So I encourage you to take a step back. Reflect on what it means to you to embrace your feminine side to embrace your sexuality. And I encourage you to start taking steps towards making it a part of your professional life. If you're not sure where to start, I can help. Connect with me. We'll set up a free one-on-one confidence call where I will help you create your own personal mini empowerment plan with steps that you can take immediately to start igniting that fire. Remember, when you own your femininity and your sexuality, you empower yourself and those around you. So let's pave the way, ladies, for a more authentic and successful business world. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Crystal. I loved it. I love the journey that you take us on. All Thank right. You. So we have some, some fun stuff coming up next. Um, if you are a ticket holder, you got your ticket. Right now it is raffle time. I want to go ahead and preface that Make sure that you are going to um, claim your prize within 48 hours. I did put some instructions down below. You're going to email us at info at studios.com. Please make sure it's within 48 hours. Email us that you are a prize winner. Um, we already have the notes on the back end, so we can go ahead and, and check that for you. So I have, I'm going to go ahead and start my little drum roll sound effect on the back end um, for our first Guys, it is, I'm going to have two printed copies of the December issue, Becoming a Woman, and the January issue as well. Um, and the prize is Sarah Jane Layton. Woo-hoo. So you have your copy of the magazine, Becoming an Unstoppable Woman, December and January issue. Go ahead and email us within the 48 hours to claim your prize, and we will send that over to you. Congratulations. There's a lot of awesome tips, and we had um, so many amazing women that that were featured as articles in there, so uh, congratulations. Our next raffle is going to be from Angela Bell. She is also a speaker here today. You might know her as the Inspired and Profitable Mompreneur. Um, She is raffling off a goal setting and achievement setting uh, for mompreneurs. So I'm going to go ahead and let's get it started. The winner is Shelby Decker. All right, Shelby, so you have 48 hours to go ahead and claim your prize. You're going to email info at She Rises Studios. Um, I'm super excited. Angela Bell is an amazing woman who has lots of tips to be sharing with you. So please do Uh, claim your prize. Okay, so up next, we have a gift from Martina Kwan. Um, She is going to be sharing eight steps to stop procrastinating in its tracks. Play on words, and you'll know why a little bit later today. Uh, So Martina, for the prize winner, let's see who we have. It is Caroline Passmore. So Caroline, if you're listening here today, go ahead and email us info at studios.com. Claim your prize within 48 hours. And you have your eight steps to stop procrastinating from Martina Kwan. Um, that's what we have for the first 
raffle. There is still another raffle plan that's going to be taking place um, around 2.30. So please stay tuned for more raffle prizes. We're super excited. Um, and I have one more special one that's coming from She Rises Studios. This is one of two website ones that we're giving away today. This special website one, I'm sorry, this special prize, I just slipped up. It is a website. So we're going to be giving away a $1,000 website giveaway. It, it's going to have your domain name, your hosting for a year, your professional email, an SSL certificate. You're going to get unlimited re uh, revisions before your final approval. You get up to four custom pages, basic on-page SEO, all the good stuff, honestly. So if you are watching live today, let me go ahead and see who our winner is for this website. And it's Leah Cicero. I apologize if I pronounced your name wrong, but Leah Cicero. Thank you so much. And that was all for round one of raffles. We have so many amazing speakers still to come. I'm super excited. And I want to thank everyone who has joined us here today as a speaker, as a guest, and for you watching us at home. It, we always appreciate it. If you're watching and catching the replay, I hope you're having fun, having some popcorn, relaxing, and enjoying yourself. Today was really all about upping your energy in life and business for this year, 2021, with over 20 speakers. We got to kick it off with Joy Bauer. It's been an amazing morning thus far um, and early afternoon, so I'm super excited. We are going to be jumping over to, in just a minute, our next topic is collaboration over comp Oh, no, excuse me. I'm getting ahead of myself. It's actually how to successfully brand, market, and automate your business to gain visibility and success in strategy. I'm super excited about this one. We have so many awesome speakers, but this is obviously a biggie in the, in the world of business. And it's something that we all struggle to find. Um, and I'm super excited to lead that with a very special guest speaker. So I'll let her start in just a moment. I do wanna say thank you so much to our beautiful CEO and founder, Hannah Olivas, uh, for paving the way and creating this amazing summit. Um, she was supposed to be hosting today and is out sick. So please do keep her in, her in your prayers. Thank you so much, Mama, and I appreciate you and love you. And I hope you're enjoying and getting the rest that you so much deserve and need. So without further ado, I am going to bring up our next guest speaker. I'm super excited. Her name is Samantha Shepherd. She is from Pennsylvania and thrives each day with Jesus and lots of coffee. She has two beautiful daughters that keep her super busy alongside her husband. They have built a seven-figure business in the financial service industry. Um, this has allowed her to experience all the ups and downs about building a business and the road to success and that, and really helps to show how passionate she is about sharing it with other women entrepreneurs. With a degree in marketing and over 20 years of experience in this field, she is focused on helping other entrepreneurs reach their potential through business and marketing strategies. She also believes that each day should be focused on progress over perfection, especially on the days that are a hot mess. Oh man, I can't have said it better here myself. So um, I am gonna let S Samantha, hi Samantha, how are you? Hi. <laughs> Jump on in over here. She says her favorite quote is from, is from Eleanor Roosevelt, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams and the world full of noise stand out. So beautiful. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It is such an honor to be here on the summit today amongst all of these incredible women. Um, yes, I am from Pennsylvania. It is very cold here. Um, so I, I just really wanted to kind of, you know, thank you so much for the introduction. I have been in the world of business and marketing for about 20 years. Um, I love all of the ups and downs and lessons that I've learned. And I love that I have the opportunity to talk about branding and marketing. Um, I am a self-proclaimed marketing nerd at heart. Um, I love reading everything and, and learning everything I can about this topic so I can really just kind of help other people. You know, when my husband and I first started our business, like many of you probably can relate to this, is we didn't, there was no guide. There was no step-by-step, -step, here's what you do, here's what you don't do. Uh, we were 22 years old and just young and naive enough to just jump in and just try something new. And I'm really thankful that we were able to learn a lot along the way, the good and the bad. And I often think a lot of times when it comes to business growth, 
we actually learn the most through our failures. You know, so what I want to do today is share with you um, in the time that I have the five, five easy steps on how to market your personal brand. Because most people don't even know what their brand is. They think that their brand is the products and services that they promote and sell. And although that's part of what you do, your products and services are not necessarily your brand. So um, if we have to really kind of break that down to a really simplistic form, your brand is kind of who you are, what you stand for, um, what you want to represent, and it also involves your business. So one of the things we have to start with, ladies and gentlemen, is, is mindset. Um, I know a lot of the speakers have already talked about, you know, mindset and self-care and taking care of ourselves. But when it comes to branding and marketing, what we don't realize often is that how we think about ourselves is how we come across to the world. So if we don't have confidence in ourselves, if we don't have an organizational plan, if we're not confident in what we're saying and how we're saying it and how we're going to grow, you could have the best product and service in the world. But if you don't believe in it enough to share it with other people, no one's ever really going to learn about it. So, all right. So we are going to rip the Band-Aid off today. And I have notes here because I tend to talk a lot. And I want to make sure that I remember everything um, that I've learned over the past 20 years. I'm going to try to put it in the next five minutes. So um, step number one, I wish I could talk to you guys. This would be super fun to be engaging, is I want you guys to reframe. I'm going to promote myself to sharing myself. They are completely different things. A lot of times people steer away from marketing their brand or even talking about their business because they don't want to come across salesy. They don't want to come across pushy. They don't think that no, they think no one's going to want to hear what they have to say. Well, newsflash, they do. It's all about how we think about ourselves and that comes across in how we represent it. Let me give you an example. Okay. I'm a marketing and branding consultant um, and I help businesses. That's kind of a short clip of what I do. So if I came to you and I said, I'm a branding and marketing consultant, I help people update their websites, put together social media content, put together media kits and help them with marketing strategy. Pretty boring, right? Like that's not going to grab anyone's attention. All I did was promote myself and basically list a resume of everything that I do. But if I said, I work in the field of branding and marketing, my job is to make marketing easy for you so you can get back to what you're good at, which is growing your business. That's a lot more appealing, right? You know, you want to be able to put yourself into your promotion and sharing of your business, but I want you to really practice on some verbiage. Grab a girlfriend, grab a business colleague, someone that you trust that you can wordsmith off of, because I want you to go from promoting yourself to sharing yourself, which leads me to number two, and everybody always hates this one, but it's the elusive 30-second commercial, or some people call it an elevator pitch. We as adults and as humans usually have a very short attention span. So if I came to you and said, tell me what you do, if you can't explain it to me in 30 seconds or less, I'm already paying attention to something else. So the biggest thing with a 30 second commercial is you have to really understand that time is of a premium. And what that means is that people, you have very, very short window to grab their attention. So a 30 second commercial or an elevator pitch needs to be basically saying who you are, what you do a problem that your business solves and how you solve it. Now, that might sound like a lot of things in 30 seconds. What I want you to do is I want you to answer all those four questions. I want you to write every thought possible. And then I want you to start paring it down. Because once you get that 30 second commercial down, you're going to find out that it's going to be 10 times easier to really, really market your business and your brand because you're going to have a very clear, concise thought on how to communicate what you do. And by doing it over and over, that's going to help you build your confidence. So you're going to want to share it more and more. Number three. All right. Engage with your audience. Yes, you actually have to talk to people. Too many people I speak with, they, they think by just putting a simple post out on Facebook, it's going to grow their business. No, that's part of it. But what comes next? It's the engaging. It's the relationship. You know, it's very, very important to, to not only share who you are and what you do, but then you have to engage back. I always believe that you must, must be a selfless leader first. And it's always better to give first and receive later. If we want people to really kind of resonate with who we are and what we do and have that influence over their um, buying decisions or who they share referrals with, we have to be able to share first. You know, I always like to give tips away and um, I have workbooks that I like to give away, things that I've learned that have helped me that I can help others. 
But the biggest thing with number three, engaging with your audience is follow up. It's not like you can just talk to somebody one time and then you don't speak to them for six months and wonder why they're not a customer. Follow up, follow up, follow up. One of the keys to eliminate future prospecting in your business and a way to create customers to come to you on a regular basis is wait for it. Create a systemized, consistent follow-up plan. My husband and I have been in business um, in the financial world in the one business that we have um, for about 20 years. He and I don't ever have to look for referrals anymore because we spent the first large chunk of our business taking really, really good care of our clients. We are always providing them with education, value-driven information, um, telling them that we appreciate them, letting, letting them, letting them hear from us multiple times a year. Do a gut check, ladies and gentlemen. Are you doing that kind of follow up with your clients? Because if not, that might be a way to kind of reverse and then go ahead with putting together a good follow up plan in place so you can do that. All right. Number four, pick the right occasions to share your message. All right. Um, show of hands. I know I can't see you, but pretend that I can. How many of you um, are up watching late night television? Have you ever noticed the commercials are usually for fast food? Why? We usually get hungry at night, right? Why do you think fast food commercials usually do a large amount of advertising in the late night hours? Because most people want to binge eat, they're, they're hungry, um, they usually make bad decisions when it comes to eating then. The same comes with your business. You have to think about timing and the right, right, right places um, to share about your business, okay? For example, if you know you have a launch for something coming up in seven days, work back seven days. Seven days prior, start talking about, you know, a new project that you're working on that you can't wait to launch with people, a problem that you can't wait to share that you have the solution to and kind of work your way up to it. The timing of how you share and market your brand is really, really important. OK. All right. Number five. You ready? If you guys are taking notes, um, I wish I could talk to all of you, but repeat, repeat, repeat. Repeat, repeat, repeat. That is the most simple marketing strategy ever. Did you know? that it takes seven to 10 times of your repeated same message for anyone to even remember what you say. I learned that in college and that was a couple years ago. <laughs> but we have to understand that you are the guru for your business. You know, in the ins and outs, the ups and downs, you know everything, but not everybody else does. There are thousands of messages that are thrown at people on a daily basis for marketing, branding, all the things in between. You need to be the loudest, most consistent, positive voice in people's ears and on their screens for them to ever remember your message. So repeat, repeat, repeat. You need to be clear. You need to be concise. And ladies and gentlemen, in a world full of noise, don't ever be afraid to stand up and stand out. If you have any questions about marketing or if you just want to kind of have someone's brain to pick for a marketing strategy, I would love to talk to you. Um, my website is samanthashepherdconsulting.com. Um, I'm, I'm on all the social channels too, um, but it was an honor to speak to you today. I hope these five tips helped you kind of, kind of revamp away um, and a strategy for you to market your brand. Um, so get out there and share it. Woohoo! All right, Samantha, repeat, repeat, repeat. Thank you so much, <laughs> Samantha, for joining us here today. It was such a Thank pleasure. Thank you so much. You got a lot of love in the comments. Go check them out. Oh, um, yay! <laughs> <laughs> so our next speaker on the subject, again, of how to successfully brand your business, automate, um, and all that good stuff. Um, we have an awesome speaker today. She is not only hilarious, but she's a wonderful um, lady. Her name is Annabelle Beckwith, and she's been a business consultant and coach trainer for over 20 years, working with entrepreneurs and business owners um, and Fortune 100 companies all around the world. She specializes in working with people as human beings first, building um, individual clarity, confidence, and capability before working on their business goals and aspirations in both a strategic and practical way. Her career has also included work in uh, daytime TV production and in PR marketing as head and development of public affairs at the Royal Scottish Academy of Music and Drama. She is the best-selling author of Get Your Peas in a Row, Five Key Factors to Propel Your Business Forward, which focuses on key principles for uh, personal and entrepreneurial growth. And she co-authored Dream Big, Do Bigger, and Women Disruptors in Business. Annabelle is the proud mother of 220-somethings, lives in Scotland, and works internationally. So thank you so much for joining us, Annabelle. 
Hello, hello. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction there, Adriana. And good evening, everybody um, from Scotland. Um, my work focuses on leadership development and business growth. And today I'm going to talk to you about something very, very practical. And that is about how to position yourself as a thought leader and your business as the go to through PR. Now, there's a couple of things. Before I give you my five top tips here, there's a couple of things that I want to say first. The first thing is, I'm assuming that before we even start thinking about PR, um, that you are clear about your brand and your strategy, the clients that you serve and your core messages. If you're not, please do that first because that is absolutely foundational. Without that, you run the risk of grabbing on to PR opportunities and then to find that they're bright shiny objects they're not really driving your business forward so do the groundwork first the second thing is just to clarify when i'm talking about pr in this um, in, in my session just now i'm talking about free coverage that you can get in existing publications two really brilliant things about that there's the first thing right there it's free the second thing is, if you can get editorial coverage, that carries more weight with readers than advertorial and than, uh, than advertising. So five top tips. Now, the first one is be really clear about what are your objectives for PR? What are your objectives for getting coverage, whether it's online or offline? Um, and when I say what are your objectives, I don't mean I want to be featured in such and such a magazine or I want to have um, a press release appearing here or there online. I mean, what do you want that press coverage to do for you and your business? What is the result that you want beyond the publication itself? Do you want to position yourself as a commentator on sector issues, as a thought leader? Do you want to highlight a new innovation with your company? Are you wanting to highlight a success that you have achieved with and for your client? Are you wanting to branch out into a new market? Is that something that you want to herald? Think really carefully. What is it that you want this coverage to do for your business beyond the press release itself? The second thing to think about is the publication that you're actually pitching to. Now, make sure that you really know and understand that publication. Um, what's, what's the tone of voice that it uses? What's, what's um, the way in which it communicates? What's its style? What are the expectations of its readers? Stalk the editors online. Have a look. Do your research. Look at Amazon and look online. There are publications for pretty much everything than you, that, that you can think of. When I was working in PR many years ago, there were publications for wastewater treatment and still water trout angler, plastic and rubber weekly. It's all there. It's all there. You will find a publication that is absolutely right for your market. And actually, this leads me to a bit of an insider tip here, because quite often we will gravitate towards the publications that we ourselves want to be seen in, you know, the big splashy names that look good on our websites. The smart money is actually in niche publications, niche publications, as I believe you say, your side of the Atlantic, niche publications, sector specific publications that might be a bit more obscure. Those are the ones that people are reading. So look for the obscure publications. You'll, far, you'll find it far easier to stand out in a very niche publication than clamoring along with everybody else on something that's got a broader remit. So if you work with a lot of dentists, then dentistry today, dental practice monthly, those types of publications, look for those. That is where the secret money is. Don't overlook those publications that might not be quite so sexy and glamorous, but that's what people are actually reading. Now, my third point is so crucial that if you remember nothing else of what I say uh, to date, please remember this. What's the story? People who you are pitching to, journalists, editors, they are looking for a story. Now, sadly, and I count myself in this, none of us are that interesting that saying author writes new book is going to cut the mustard when it comes to something newsworthy unless you're Michelle Obama or JK Rowling or somebody, we have to be current and relevant. So by all means, talk about your thing, but make it current and relevant. Now, a couple of things that you can do there is peg it onto the news. What have you heard that's going on at the moment? In the light of recent legislation on XYZ, in the light of a government announcement on blah, blah, blah. 
Maybe it's the anniversary of something. On this, the anniversary of the Gettysburg Address and something that is that is relevant, obviously, to the themes of the Gettysburg Address. You know, don't make it completely irrelevant. Look also at obscure celebrations. Well, International Women's Day is not an obscure celebration, but that's the sort of thing. There's, a, there's a, an internationally or nationally recognised event that you can pin your press release onto. There will be random things. Uh, I remember finding getting a lot of PR for a chef who was assembling a dessert because it was Bramley Apple Week. I know, go figure. Look for things like that. There's bound to be national such and such a week, international day of the whatever. What will make your story interesting and relevant and current? Now, another insider tip here, what you can do also is once you've identified your target publications, get in touch with them and ask for an editorial schedule or a forward planning schedule. Sometimes they'll call it an advertising schedule. Now, what this will do is set out thematically what that magazine is going to be talking about, what that publication is going to be talking about in the coming months. So if you're in real estate, you might discover that, for example, July is going to have a feature on holiday homes. Great. You can be thinking, hmm, what can I pitch that is relevant to that theme? Maybe in March they're looking at renovating your home for profit. Ideal. It gives you something to pin your own press release on. The advantage of doing that is that you are entering a conversation that they are already having. You're entering a subject that's already in their head. You're not having to spend energy going, look at me, look at me to try them, win them over to your, uh, to your story. Point number four is know the difference between a press release, a news release, and an article submission. I'm not talking about article submissions. I'm talking about submitting something that's current that will get you coverage pretty quickly. And if you look at newspapers and the way in which they structure their stories, that tends to be a formula to follow. Now, I do have a little bit of a cheat sheet that goes with this that just outlines that and gives a very, very brief outline of a suggested structure. So do get in touch by email through my website. I'll give you the details at the end of this if you would like that cheat sheet. Basically, it needs a snappy headline, something that's going to grab the attention of the editor, the journalist, when you slide into their email in tray, and then a subheading that is going to give them the essence of your story, and then you go into the main body of your story. Now, when you've written all that, it's absolutely crucial, you would not believe how many people forget this, to put editor's notes underneath that. And in those editor's notes, you're going to be giving them your contact details and additional information so-and-so is available for interview or comment, photographs available on request, maybe a short bio or something of that sort, something that is going to enable the journalist or the editor to get in touch with you. Now, once you've got your coverage, that of course isn't the end of it. It's really important that you monitor what that coverage is doing for you. If you've set clear objectives at the outset, that is going to be easier to do and squeeze the heck out of it. Use that PR, share links with your potential clients and clients, blast it all over social media, squeeze every last inch of, uh, in, uh, every last inch of, of publicity that you can from that. And also, insider tip number three, don't forget to thank the journalist who wrote the piece or the editor who published the press release. Um, particularly with journalists, Oftentimes they're freelancers and they might be working for several publications. If you are useful to them and you're a nice person to work with, they may well be in touch in the future for future articles and so on. So that was a whistle stop tour, a very practical look at five things you can be doing to position yourself as a thought leader and your business as the go to within your sector. If you would like to connect with me, please do so via my website, which is at yara-journeys.com or on LinkedIn. I'm on all the social media. And if you would like a copy of that cheat sheet, again, contact me via my website or on LinkedIn and I'll ping it across to you. Thank you very much. Yay, that was awesome. Congre Thank you so much, Annabelle. You're an amazing, I love how quickly you broke everything down. You hit the whys, you hit the hows and everything in between. So thank you so much, Annabelle. I really appreciate it. Um, we're gonna lead, this actually leads into our next speaker. Um, she is also in the PR field and industry. So I'm really excited to get another perspective on this topic. Uh, we're gonna be introducing Carissa Lawrence. She is reputably known for her creativity and ability to connect and position professionals. 
Um, she has spent 11 years as a brand and public relations consultant, starting her first business at the young age of 22. She specializes in creative brand consulting and public positioning, exceeding her client expectations with innovative brand awareness techniques. She is passionate um, for entrepreneurship on all the levels and is working to become a multifaceted serial entrepreneur to asset the business world sorry, to assist the business world on every angle. In addition to her PR company, Carissa Lauren Collective LLC and Fame by Carissa Lauren. She is ex she's expanding her education in real estate, property investments, and creating a lifestyle brand. She is the mother of two, and together they enjoy traveling, crafting, baking, and adventuring. So welcome to the stage, Carissa Lauren. Thank you, Carissa. Hi, Adriana. Hi, Hannah. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm really excited to help share a few tips um, in my about 12 years in business now. I've been in PR for about 12 years. Um, I'm actually known as the humanizer of the PR world. And that's because I really stress and emphasize the importance of humanizing who you are behind your business. Um, so before people even sit down with me when they when they're interested in stepping up their PR game, I always use the quote, it's not the business that will sell the business. It is the person behind the business that's going to sell the business. So I really focus on bringing that you aspect into storytelling because that is what PR is. It's storytelling. It's the connecting point between your customer, your client and yourself. Um, I think PR is the service that best and most effectively sells you to the public. It's commonly said that it's more effective than advertising because at the end of the day, an ad is gone in a click, I always say. When you're sharing your story, you're making a lasting impact. Um, so when I, when I first started in PR, it was simply writing a good story and pitching to an editor to bring you awareness. Now PR covers a variety of services. You really need social media, PR outreach, newsletter, events. And today I kind of want to talk about my nine insider secrets that will really boost your business on a public level. And the first one is quarterly photo shoots, uh, not yearly. Many people make this mistake. Everything has gone digital within the last five to 10 years, Instagram, TikTok, I really express how important it is to have content and really getting those quarterly photo shoots on your calendar so that you continuously are showing face behind your business and you're continuously showing people who you are. I don't stick to this rule typically myself, um, but I do emphasize this for clients. Show people who you are in your business and do so with photo shoots. The second one I always emphasize is social media posting. This is something we also offer to our clients. Nowadays, it's something we all can't avoid, right? You have to be posting two to three times a week. And stories, I always say, do daily stories. And don't just post photos anymore. Do live videos. Talk to your audience. Communicate with your audience. Your brand wants to see who you are, whether that's TikTok, Instagram, or Facebook Live. Engaging with your audience is a third tip. You actually have no idea how important it is to just simply respond to every comment that you get. Um, why? Why do we respond to every comment? Because actually when you're responding and you're not only giving your business a person behind the business, but it actually boosts your posts so that it's more visible on the ever streaming feed of Instagram and Facebook. Uh, before taking a brand public, something that I always talk to my clients about are the branding. And everyone who watches and tunes into the summit today, I have a free branding checklist. And these are all the branding steps to take before you're ready for PR. One of them is, do you have a professionally branded website? It's amazing how many people are not aware of how important it is to have a professionally branded website and polished social media sites. If you are going to be placed in the news, they're going to need a web link. And a lot of people could potentially be trafficked to your website now. So you want to make sure that that's representing you in the best light possible. 
uh, bi-weekly newsletters. I know that there are several that I follow, whether it's other marketing and PR professionals that I love. Make sure that your content is readable. People go for content that is something that they want to hear and learn from. Um, so whether that's offering a different tip bi-weekly or just tuning in and giving them some notice of what your company is doing, make sure that that content is always there. So in, in my PR plans, I always say have an ongoing press and media plan. Every year in January, what you should be doing is getting out a calendar, writing down specific tar targeted holidays in ways that you could angle yourself in press. You need a consistent press and media plan if you're going to succeed with PR. Strategy is everything. Um, now this one's important. This is the next one and it's actually creating video content for social media. If you guys haven't noticed, TikTok, Instagram Reels, Facebook Reels have kind of become the new photo, specifically in the last two years. Um, videos are seven times more likely to be seen than photo content right now. So I would definitely recommend if you have it within budget, work with a videographer to really position your message with social media. Um, Reels and TikToks are the whole mood right now. This one is so important and She Rises does such a great job with doing this, but collaborate with other businesses, other professionals and influencers. My favorite, favorite phrase is collaboration over competition. You will never lose out by collaborating. Collaborate with as many people as you possibly can. It's the virtual way of networking. Um, finally, one very important step in PR is have a key charity and donation plan in place, or at least know your values in your business and show your values in your business. Um, again, this is a big part of the humanizing aspect of showing who you are, what you care about, what your beliefs are within your company and who you are as a professional. People want to work with you because of who you are, not because of what you sell. Um, and make sure to have that positioning strategy. Um, of course, work with nonprofits and charities as much as you possibly can. It's so important to show your values and what you're passionate for. So these are nine tips to level up your business in one month. I own Carissa Lauren Collective. If you have any questions, please come to me. I also have a branding checklist that I will send out to each of you. And these are all of the things that you should have in place before you're considering taking your brand public. Um, it's target audience, font palettes, brand colors, everything that you need. It's so important to make sure that your brand is visibly done well and targeted well before you take it to the news. Thank you guys. Thank you, Carissa. I love all the strategies, the tips, the nuggets. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, I'm super excited to introduce our next guest speaker. You might have seen her before. She does travel a lot. So straight from the backwoods of the bayous of Louisiana, our next speaker is an avid motorcycle riding grandma and serial entrepreneur with a love of storytelling. Dr. Elizabeth Clamon has been featured on NBC, ABC, Fox, and CBS, just to name a few. Though she admits she can't spell to save her life, she nonetheless is a multi-time number one international, international best-selling author with a PhD in naturopathic medicine. Elizabeth is an expert storyteller and marriage coach, international speaker, founder of the Expert Storytellers Academy, and co-founder of Married by Design. She helps clients go from rough idea to finished story that wins people's hearts. She is a survivor of a traumatic, abusive childhood, chronic illness, and severe pain caused by multiple disabling auto accidents, one that left her bedridden for over 12 years. Her greatest joy now comes from traveling with her husband, in their motorhome and spoiling her six grandchildren. Welcome, Dr. Elizabeth, how are you? And don't forget to unmute. I noticed you're still muted. <laughs> Thank 
thank you for reminding me. I um, That would be terrible for me to stand here and talk and move my lips and nobody hear me. That's just a terrible thing for a storyteller. I am so excited to be here with you guys today and so excited to be here for Up Your Energy. Do we up, Are we up in our energy? Come on, we're supposed to be up in our energy. I am in frozen Texas today. So it took a lot for me to get my energy up to be here. Let me tell you today. And let me tell you the hardest part of me being here today is 10 minutes for a storyteller because storytellers are all about words and 10 minutes is really hard to fit all our words in. So I want to talk to you today about the importance of storytelling in your business. Three secrets of growing your business through storytelling. My first secret is how to make storytelling your secret weapon. And you can make storytelling your secret powerful weapon by sharing who you are in storytelling. Because clients want you to peel back the curtain and share a personal part of who you are. That's how they connect with you. That's how they get to know you. Just like my fellow PR people were talking about, they want to know who you are through lives, through speaking, through other avenues, your writing and your, your posts and everything you do. They want to know that connection with you. And we're going to discover in a little bit how important that is in your business and in what you're promoting. So, you know, you want to be your authentic self. You've got to be who you are. This is who I am every day. Whether you see me here or you see me in Walmart or you see me walking down the road, I'm going to be Elizabeth. Don't call me Dr. Elizabeth. Just call me Elizabeth. That's who I am. You want to make a heartfelt connection and you do that through stories. So I want to give you a, a brief example of that. And if you want to see a, more of an example of that, you can go to my YouTube channel and look up my video reel or on any of my social media. Everything's under Elizabeth Clayman. My website is under construction right now. So you'll have to kind of work around to kind of find that. You can go to ElizabethClayman.com. You can get on just one page of my website to find my speaker website. But um, allow me to share with you the story of my 12 years in bed. My family is a military family. And we love to travel and camp, obviously. My husband and I now retired, live in an RV, and we travel to speak and to do book signings and to talk with people all over the country. And we had one particular trip that would change my life and my family forever. We were traveling back from a camping trip for in uh, Kentucky, and we were coming into Michigan, which was our duty station at the time. And we crossed the line, and there was construction everywhere. If you know anything about the Midwest, they have two seasons, construction and winter. And we were deep in the middle of construction season. So we were traveling and we had the semi truck in front of us that just did not get over. And he was supposed to shift into the left hand lane, which was the right lane. And he just did not shift. And so we continued on for about six miles into Michigan when he got to a bridge he didn't think he could clear and he slammed on the brakes. He slammed those brakes on and we could not stop with the camper behind us. So we slammed into the back of that truck. Our camper slammed into us and the truck slammed in. And then my daughters who were 16 and 18 slammed into the camper and the camper hit us again. We were one big accordion crash, y'all. We were trapped in that Suburban. My husband had to kick the window out, pull my 11 year old son out, take him to my daughters on the side of the road, he came back and ex excavated me from the car. Once we got to the hospital and the diagnosis started coming in from the doctors, my family was fine. Thank God. But I got my diagnosis five days on the cardiac ward because I had a broken sternum. We just saw the instance of this on the NFL here in America where we had a football player who got hit in the sternum just right and he had a heart attack. That's what could have happened to me. But because I got good medical care and I got watched for those five days, I was able to avoid that. But when I got home after that five days at the ripe old age of 38, I was 100 percent disabled and bedridden for the next 12 years. I went to doctor after doctor after doctor, and they kept giving me medication after medication after medication, surgery after surgery after surgery. And I, by the ninth surgery, they could not control my pain. And I was going into shock. I was on such an obscene amount of medication that I could not, they could not give me enough to control my pain because I was going to go into shock. And I was shat, tea shattering, shaking, sweating. And I had this moment of clarity. And I looked at my husband and I said, I am done. 
I will not let this be my legacy. This is not how it will end. I have a job and a purpose to empower women to tell their story and to get uh, and to leave their story and leave their legacy. This will not be my legacy. And when I got home, I figured out how to get off that medication and I figured out how to get back on my feet one day at a time, one step at a time. And now I get to travel all over the world telling women how empowering it is to tell your story, how healing it is if you've been through trauma to tell your story, whether you tell it from a stage, whether you write it in a notebook and leave it for your family or you publish it in a book or you write a chapter in an anthology. It gives you power over those things in your life that took your power from you. And it also helps you to cement yourself and your business in the minds of your clients. That is a powerful thing because people don't remember your business. They might not remember your name, but they remember your story because they make a personal connection with you through your story. So once I got out of that bed and I started remembering back, to storytelling. I remember the amazing stories my grandmother told. And I started telling stories. And stories started giving me the power to get up. Storytelling is phenomenal in your business because it connects people to you. Stories make a memorable impact, like I said. Stories inspire people to action like nothing else can. And isn't that what we want in our businesses? We want to move people to action. We want them to take an action. For me, I want them to feel inspired to tell their story, the story of their business, their own personal story, to heal their trauma. I want them to leave behind the legacy of their story. I don't want to see another woman leave this planet without leaving her story behind for those who follow her, because there are valuable lessons to learn and they will get lost if she leaves this planet without leaving that story. Even if she records it on her cell phone for her kids to have after she's gone, that's fine as long as she leaves that story for the people who come behind her. Story is a powerful tool and story is a par profitable marketing tool. Do you know that it takes seven to 11 touches on social media for someone to purchase from your business. But if you talk, if you meet them through an event, if you meet them through storytelling, through speaking, even if you're speaking in an event like this, people will look you up. People will seek you out. People will seek out your brand because they want to get to know you. They want to find out more about you. I had this just happen last week. I spoke at a live on Facebook in somebody's group and I had five people reach out to me within an hour. Of speaking. That's the power of storytelling for your brand. And storytelling verbally, there's nothing else like it for your brand. It Everybody can be a, a great storyteller. If you're not a great storyteller now, it only takes a few lessons to learn how to become a great storyteller. Expert storytellers can be made. They don't have to be born. But great storytellers are few and far between. But Speakers are a dime a dozen. You can find a great a speaker anywhere. Great stories generate more leads. Great stories increase your sales. Great stories sell your products. Great stories make you unforgettable. Great stories move people to action. It's like Seth, Seth Grodin says, marketing is no longer about the products you sell, but it's about the stories you tell. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Elizabeth. I appreciate it. You are an amazing storyteller. I hope everyone goes and checks out your uh, YouTube channel. I watched it for myself and I learned so much. So I just want to thank you for joining us here today. Thank you. I enjoyed it so much. Thanks, Adriana. And up next, speaking of storytellers, we have an amazing one. Uh, maybe she doesn't know it sometimes, but she's so she is a powerful storyteller. Uh, so Alicia Marcos Barong, she is a pioneer in the field of child mindfulness. As the founder and owner of Guided Choices, her signature programs, Chatter Girls and Pediatric Life Coaching, have gathered national attention for their transformative abilities of children. Alicia spends her time teaching others how to coach children. 
while also speaking many forms of empowerment, including confidence, self-esteem, aspirations, and responsibility. This has brought her to the same stages as Mother Teresa and pa uh, Pope John Paul II, with a passion for empowering children and teens especially. Alicia authored the best-selling book, Changing the Chatter, to assist young girls in developing life skills for becoming confident, strong young women. Chatter Girls was, a developed, was then developed to assist normal public education as well as offer after-school programs with in-person, hands-on guidance for ages eight to 14 years of age for, for girls. Chatter Girls has grown into a nationally recognized program for building a solid foundation of positive self-acceptance which carries girls through their teenage years into adulthood. So welcome, Alicia. How are you? Their teenage years into adulthood. So welcome, Alicia. How are you? A little bit of back I'm great. How are you? A, another screen open. Feel free to close it out. How are you? A little bit of back I'm great. How are you? A, another screen open. Feel free to I'm trying to turn off something. Okay, here we go. I'm ready. Do you hear me? Good afternoon, everyone. As she said, I'm Alicia Marcus Barong. And today I'm going to give you some tips on le leading powerful speech for your audience. I am so glad I went behind Elizabeth because everything I have to say supports what Elizabeth says. So first of all, I didn't start out going anywhere near a stage. I was the kid who could barely speak to the person next to me in school. I was the kid that couldn't do anything when it came to talking. I had disabilities. But one thing I did learn was if you have a story, it makes the difference. And I had a story to tell. So the first thing you need to do is to know your story. Begin with your story when you're talking about, as we heard Elizabeth talking about the fact that she had a disability and all of that. That's the important part of being able to share what's going on in your, in your uh, information. So one of the things I'd like to uh, start with is a little bit like Elizabeth did. My story begins with a young girl being late for school every day. And as she walks up the stairs and the S Sister Mary Joan is there go screaming at you, get to class, get to class. And she's terrified. She's left a dysfunctional family behind for the day. And she's going into a classroom where girls have bullied her. She walks into her classroom and she sits in that front seat next to Sister Mary Jean. And as she looks at Sister Mary Jean, all the girls behind her are laughing at her and making all kinds of sounds because Alicia was dyslexic. And so the first subject that we always had was spelling. Well, I wasn't too good at spelling. And so I would experience the situation of sister sitting there next to me with that ruler. And she would look at me and she would see how I was spelling receive. And she was going, no, and the ruler came down. That experience froze me for most of my life. I felt like I had nothing to give. It wasn't until early on in my life, as I got a little older, that I realized that there was more than spelling. So it became a part of me. And I have spent 35 years working with kids. And as I work with these kids, I know one thing. They need to know our stories. That's why I wrote Chatter Girl. Because you take your story and you take what you do 
your talk and you see how they relate. Relationships of that girl who had anxiety in that class and talking to those young women or those women who also had those experiences. And it begins to make a difference. They hear you. And when you take your product or whatever you're doing and then put them together, you have an opportunity for an audience to want to hear your story and to want to hire you to work for them. The other part of it is that you must have a bio. As you heard my bio before here, your bio has to tell your story too. It has to tell the things that you do well, the experiences you have. One of the things about the bio that I learned from my teachers was put down the people you had experiences with. I had had experience with Mother Teresa many, many years ago, but I really never remembered until I began to speak how much her story related to my story, which now relates to all of your story. The last thing that we want to tell them is the situation of your call to action, your opportunities to buy your services or your program. So you take the things that you know are going to help somebody else. And when you are working to be able to get a speaking engagement, be able to share with others what your qualities are that is going to make a difference for your audience. I'm a mother. I love speaking to mothers. I have a program that helps mothers, helps their daughters. When I speak to mothers, I give mothers an opportunity to be able to change their daughter's lives. When I speak to big groups like National After School Associations, I teach, talk to people who are working with children after schools to empower them. Those people in that audience is waiting for me to be able to empower them but they learned it from my story. Your story is essential, as Elizabeth says, but it must relate to the work that you're doing to be able to help you write your books, to be able to do your work. I have spent over 30 years being a coach, a therapist, a hypnotherapist, working with children and women. And what I do know is that my story and your story is what people want to hear. Sitting in an office with a client who is 30 years old, a beautiful woman, very successful. And she says to me, Alicia, I can't get past my experiences in school when I got told that I was ugly and stupid. And in the other room is a young girl, 10 years old. And she's in my office because she's being told that she's ugly and she's stupid. And when I sit with them, I tell them, you have control of your mind. Through mindfulness, you have the opportunity to be empowered and to be unique. You have all these wonderful gifts, every one of you. Tell your story. Make sure your story relates to your talk. And take the opportunity to call to action for people to buy your services to be that coach, 
be that businesswoman, be that person who's celebrating your uniqueness. I wish you the best in celebrating your uniqueness and your empowerment. You can get a hold of me at www.guidedchoices.com. And I appreciate this. And also, good luck on your journeys. Awesome. Thank you, Alicia. Amazing as always. I really appreciate it. I love the purple. Always rocking it. Thank you for speaking here today. I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to our next speaker. She is, I, I love the segue, by the way. I know my mom, she did an amazing job with this lineup. She made it a lot of fun for me to be able to host on the back end, whether it was intentional or not, but I love it. Thank you so much. And um, this speaker is someone that you met once before on the She Rises Studios platform live, as well as on our podcast, but I'm going to welcome Judy Veras Bueno. She is the co-creator and founder of the She Rises Studios Latina division. She is a transformational coach, speaker, best-selling author, and certified NLP and NAP practitioner. Her mission is to inspire and empower women to create a more purposeful, authentic, and fulfilling life breaking through the generational pattern of mental, emotional, and spiritual poverty that leads to financial struggle. For almost a decade, Judy has inspired countless women, entrepreneurs, and professionals to break through emotional barriers and discover their true worth through her award-winning transformative coaching programs, healing circles, blogs, books, publications, and speaking engagements. So please help me welcome Miss Judy. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing amazing. And to be to tell you the truth, I'm so thrilled to be here with all of you, listening to all of you. It's so inspiring. I'm sure that, you know, you guys are watching and learning so much and really absorbing. And so I am thrilled to be part of this amazing group of powerful women. I mean, I love Elizabeth's story, Alicia's story, because these are the, you know, um, in our, one way or another, we all been through a lot of challenges in our lives and a lot of um, things that, you know, ideas, right? A lot of ideas that have created this thing of like not valuing yourself and not, you know, um, it's this idea of, of feeling like I'm not worthy enough right not feeling enough and that's something that I struggle my whole life with uh, at least for 20 I, for 26 years struggle with this idea of um, not feeling worthy of telling my story because one of my core beliefs was you know who's going to listen to me and that core beliefs came from this inability to to be heard, right? To feel like I was heard, like somebody was there for me and what I have to say matter. So why is it that telling our story is so important? Why does it matter? Why does it matter? And so one of the things to understand is like telling your story is important, whether it let's say you publish your study um, or your, your experiences, um, or whether it is that you just journal. Like when I get my clients, I work with a lot of women, I give them a journal, right? Uh, because journaling is, is healing. So the idea of telling your story, uh, yes, it's a great marketing tool. It's, it's basically, it's allowed to establish yourself as an expert in your field. But also the idea of healing through your story, right? Because as a humans, we have six, six human needs uh, that we need to fulfill at any point in our lives. Otherwise, we feel empty. And one of the human needs is the need for significance, the need to feel that I'm important and I have something to say. And when I'm not able to feel that way, right? Like Alicia was sharing how she suffered from dyslexia and how it was so hard for her. In my case, um, as you notice, I have an accent, right? I'm a Latina, a Dominican. I came from the Dominican Republic when I was 16 years old. So I'm a mom and I'm immigrant. I'm a woman. I'm like entrepreneur. I have all this, you know, um, labels, 
But at the same time, I'm a human being, right? And as a human being, it's so important that we feel connected, that we feel that we're not invisible. So creating and having and sharing your story is powerful, it's healing. It's so healing because it's the ability to share with the world what you know what you have to say that need to feel like i'm connected and so another of the human needs is that need for love and connection which translate into that need for belonging and so when we tell a story and we can um you know i love she rises so much and that's one of the reasons i wanted to be part of the um you know creating the foundation for the she rises studio latina division because is that idea of um being underrepresented not having a platform to share my voice and my message and so she rises gives that opportunity to every woman to be able to feel like it's part of something and it's also that fulfilling that need that psychological emotional and a spiritual or spiritual need to know that what you have to say matter, that you are important, and that you have a sense of connection, that there is a sense of community and connection. And the people, you know, they are listening because you have something important to say. And so a lot of people have challenges like, so where should I start? Like, where, where do I start writing my story? And so in my case, as an immigrant, right, a woman who felt like this idea of like, who's going to listen to me, right, that my worst fear was not being understood and that my accent would be, it's it sort of like was that thing that was keeping me from, you know, sharing uh, something important allowing, helping women to go through this healing process, um, to be able to find their, themselves and to be able to empower themselves and to be able to create a legacy. Yes. So our belief system is something that we need to look into it because these, if I believe that I, I, that I, you know, I have no value and I have nothing to say, then that is the first, you know, thing that we need to start healing. And story is, is a, is that important tool that help you with that healing process? I remember when I was writing my book, it took me a little longer than usual because at that moment I, I was not connected to Chi Rises. Um, but one of the things that I realized as, as, as I was writing is that for the first time I felt like as an adult, I was grieving my dad. My dad passed when I was seven years old and my dad became one of the most powerful people in my life. And at that moment, when I was writing the story of like how I process that as a seven-year-old child, who my dad was my hero. I was look up to him. I was connected to him in a deeply, deeply, in a very deep way and losing that present. And for the first time as an adult, I realized that I was grieving for so long the death of my dad because at that age, I didn't have a word to explain it, to say it. Um, and it just realizing of the, the impact that that event in my life, losing my dad, um, you know, how it had impacted me, how it had changed me as a person. And so through telling my story, it was this idea of being able to grieve, be able to heal and learn. And so one of the things that you can start doing is to start journaling. Journal about how you feel about anything in life, about your business, about your personal life, about your relationship, and see how that relates, like Alicia said, how that relates to your message, and then be able to be authentic and be able to be vulnerable enough to share that. Because yes, sharing your story takes courage. Why does it take courage? Because of that need for significance, like that fear that creates a fear of being judged right? It's like, oh, how people are going to react to this? Did I share too much? Did, did I do the right thing by saying that? Because there, there is a fear of being judged, right? But the idea is, is that also sharing your story gives you that sense of connection because it's, it opens you up like this sense of vulnerability that we are missing so much, like the sense of like keeping things real and, you know, it's sort of like I, I don't like this uh, positive um, toxic positive positivism. There's my accent there, a bit right. Uh, 
it's about really go deeper into yourself and find that person that you are, what you believe, what you have, you have a value to give. You have value to give. And so in your story, you are also giving hope. In this story also, um, you know, when I wrote my book, it was that idea of like, there's going to be a point in my life where I'm not going to be here, right? Like we all need to basically face that idea that we not gonna, there's going to be a point in your life that you're not going to be here. So what are you going to, like, what are you going to leave behind? I think it was uh, Elizabeth who said, like, record it, record your story. But if you leave a legacy, it's something with your kids and your grandkids and, and the next generation can, you know, that, that allows them to know where they came from. Part of, and every human needs to know. Like where I come from. So telling your story is a powerful marketing tool, but it's also a powerful healing process. It's allowed you to give hope and receive hope. It's allowed you to connect, to create community, to create a sense of, you know, yes, I, I matter. Like you see me. Yes. And, and so I encourage each one of you that if you don't know where to begin, just write the first sentence. Journal. When I started journaling, I never thought that I would publish a book. I didn't journal because I wanted to publish a book. I wanted to journal because I wanted to be able to self-reflect on what was working and what wasn't working, right? Because in order for you to move forward, you really need to revisit your wound, the trauma that you have suffered, how, like, what did you learn from that? And journaling is, is a really great healing um, and a, a really good way to begin to tell your story. And so when the time came to put my book together, like, I don't know, four of the four of the seven chapters was already written because I've been journaling ever, ever since I was 10 years old. And so you can just begin with journaling, uh, whether it is that you are sharing the story or whether it is that you are um, acknowledging your own pain, because it is important that you acknowledge yourself. So sharing your story is powerful, is healing. It can be as simple as writing one line every day. I um, I remember that I will I used to sleep with my journal near to my bed because when I woke up in the morning, i if I had a, a dream or something that I want to remember, I will um, basically. I that's my alarm to say that I'm done. <laughs> Uh, but I will basically, it, it was able to write it down because what happened is when you don't write it at the moment, just think, then carry your journal or carry something when you can write on, right? Because you get a great idea and then you go into doing the things that you need to do and then you forget. So write things down, create a discipline. Love you guys. Find me on Instagram, Judy Veras Bueno. Um, in the SRS Latina, which already have an account. And I really, really love to connect. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Take care. Thank you, Judy. Thank you so much for joining us here today. And I hope you're feeling a lot better. I know everyone's been kind of going through something lately. And I just want to thank everyone who's shown up. Thank you all for who are still watching us and for those who are going to be watching in the replay. So to continue on with how to successfully brand, market, and automate your business, I have an amazing guest with us here today. Her name is Michelle Bell. She is the CEO of Virtual Work Wife, a marketing agency that is anything but typical. With a specialty in workflow and process automation, her agency is providing personalized solutions for any size business seeking to create more balance. Founded to help busy entrepreneurs like herself find creative solutions so that they could work around their family schedule rather than scheduling family around work. And their core values are work less, make more, do things that you love. By focusing on strategic solutions, holistically balanced campaigns, and the belief that authentic marketing will always win over formulas, the agency provides a one-stop shop for client care and jobs where talent is fostered and growth is encouraged. Lifting people up into their own success is what gets 
uh, her out in the, of the bed in the morning, being of service and surrounding yourself with clients and friends who share your core values and true measurement of accomplishment. So thank you so much, Michelle, for joining us here today. I'm excited. Take the stage away. Hello, I'm so excited to be here. Yes, my name is Michelle Bell. I am the CEO of Virtual Workwife. We do marketing and workflow automation. And the, basically what that means is we help people create freedom from the day-to-day -day of running a business. And I bet when you hear marketing automation and automation together, you immediately think about all the emails clogging up your inbox, right? I mean, yeah, we kind of do that too, but we do so much more than that. I want to ask you a question. Yes, say hi to my cat. He decided to make an appearance. When you were in love with your with the idea of starting your business, when you were just getting started and you were walking away from that nine to five or truthfully, probably nine to midnight job that you had, did you have any idea how many roles you would actually have to play in your business? Probably not. Most people don't, right? No one told you you would have to be the customer service rep and the finance manager and the bill collector and the salesperson, did they? I mean, I just wanna be the face of my company. I just wanna sit here and look pretty and be on stage. I don't wanna be the hiring manager. That job is terrible, nobody wants to do it. But that's what it takes to run a business. You have to be everything in the moment for every component of your business. And probably my least favorite in there and probably most people's least favorite is actually being the salesperson. So what if I told you there's a better way to do it? What if we could automate away all the yucky parts and just be happy and do the things that we actually love? I mean, for those of us who are introverts, that sounds pretty great, right? I don't want to have to wear seven hats. I just want to do the things that make me happy. So what are we going to do? We are going to use workflow automation to make all of those things simple and go away. For today, what I want to use uh, is as an example is discovery call because we all should be doing discovery calls especially if you're selling a high ticket product or service you need to be doing it getting somebody on the phone is the easiest way to get them into your program if i were to tell you that it takes 16 possibly more individual steps to do a discovery call would that surprise you the fact that it takes five to 10 hours of your time. And when we think about a discovery call, you think about the actual time on the call, but there's really so many more steps to it and so many more hours of your time involved in getting to that one hour call. So let's identify some of those. First, we have to meet the person, right? We actually have to identify that person as a lead and try and close that deal, right? That can take time you have to charm them. You have to please them. You have to show interest in them, right? And then to get them on the phone, we have to do that thing where it's like, hey, Susie, are you available tomorrow at two? Maybe we call them, maybe we put in an email and then they're like, no, I'm not available then. How about Wednesday at four? And then we do that for, I don't know, like 15 years before we finally land on a time where everybody can meet. And what if you get distracted? What if you get frustrated with the process of doing that and you forget about talking to them for a couple of days to make those arrangements. Is it something you want to do two days, three days, a week later? I know I don't. It's kind of embarrassing when you're like, oh, yeah, remember when we were talking like two weeks ago about maybe meeting and maybe you getting in my program? That is not a fun conversation to have. Then there's the actual call itself. Well, now we got to spend 45 minutes on the phone listening to the tale of woe, learning about what their problem is so that we can then educate them on how our program or service can help them during that time. So you can see how it's already starting to build, right? There's layers and layers and layers going into this one hour call. After you pitch them, that's when it gets real interesting, right? Because you think it's just done, right? Either they buy or they don't buy, but there's more to it than that, right? They might buy on the phone. That's the ideal, right? The best. They might not. And what if they don't? That's when we get on the struggle bus, right? Now, how are we going to follow up with that? They could not show up at all. And then we need to ask them to come again, right? So we, it's, we, we need to send those emails or make those phone calls that say, hey, sorry, I missed you. Let's reschedule. Now we've started that whole big process over again. We need an easier way to do it. That, that is not fun. Um, what if they aren't interested? 
well, that's not fun either. What if you're not interested? <laughs> because that's a thing. Like, it's okay for you to not be interested in working with somebody. Just because they came and want to talk to you does not make them your ideal candidate. So we want an easy and peaceful way to say, no, thank you, right? That's probably one of the most uncomfor uncomfortable conversations that you can have with somebody post discovery call is what if, what if you don't want to? I, I wanna just peacefully send an email to that person and never have to actually face them for that. So that's where workflow automation comes in. All these different steps that you're probably doing manually right now all these things that take all the time that lead to five to 10 hours to get through that one call can be automated. And we can have the customer do a lot of it or the potential customer do a lot of it. So they feel supported and they feel loved on at the same time they're doing the work for you. So what's that going to look like? How is that going to change your setup? What if instead of letting somebody just, you know, send you an email like, Hey, I want to meet with you on Tuesday. I want to talk about your thing. What if first, we send them some qualifying questions. Through an automation, we send them a form to fill out. And in that form, we ask them things that would help us to discover if they're an ideal candidate or not and discover what their problem is before we get on the phone so that when we do get on the phone, we can spend 20 minutes with them instead of 45 minutes. How much would that change your day-to-day -day operation? If you could save those hours and hours of time per lead, how much more time would you have to do the things that you actually want to be doing? Like spending time with your kids or traveling or working with actual clients who are paying you because discovery calls take money off of your plate, right? That's a free call you're doing. So by asking some qualifying questions first, we're giving them something to do. It's an activity that they need, they, they are involved in and they feel heard because you're asking very specific questions and they're doing all this work for you on the front end so that you can condense it down to just those 20 minutes when you're on the phone. Now, once you get on the phone, they might not buy right away. It's okay, that, that's, that's a reality of doing calls, right? They're not always gonna buy on the call. And then when they say no, it doesn't mean no, it means not right now. It means I need to go talk to my husband. I need to go pick up my kids. I can't make a decision right now because I, you know, I just have freeze, panic, whatever, but we do want to follow up with them. And this is one of those sticking points that most people feel. It's uncomfortable to ask people for money. It's uncomfortable to follow up after the fact. They didn't buy on the phone. So they're like, well, I got to call them and I got to ask them for more money or ask them for money. Uh, and I don't want the call to feel like I'm just asking them for money. So I'm going to do things first to make it feel like I really like them. Like I'm going to go follow them on Facebook and I'm going to go comment on some of their posts and I'm going to like their pictures of their cat so that they feel like I'm genuinely interested in them. Well, that's time that you're putting, investing into that person where we could do these things through an automation, right? Through an email series that says, hey, it was really great talking with you. Remember we talked about X and this is one thing I will always caution you on. When you send a follow-up like this, you want to make sure you're only telling them about one thing. You might have 20 products, but when you got on that discovery call, after listening to their tale of woe or after reading their comments that they made in your question, in your questionnaire, you should know the one thing that you want to sell them because we don't want to send people too many ideas, right? We don't want to kitchen sink this thing. If you throw everything at them, they're not going to buy anything. So post call, we want to only send them an email about the one thing you want them to do and be real formula about that. Follow up. Hey, it was nice talking to you. Remember we talked about this. Here's the thing that we talked about you signing up for. It would, you know, let me know if you have any questions. Do that two or three times and then if they still haven't bought, then you get on the call again. Then you get on the phone and you make the call. But we're not doing a call follow up every time. So that takes some of the pressure off of us. If you don't like making calls, like I don't love making calls, then we want to do things that take the pressure off. Put those emails in first. Hope that everybody's an adult and they can read an email, click a link and buy the thing and send you money because we all want the money. And we all want to do it in a casual, easy, peaceful way, both for us and for our customers. So that's what the automation can do for you. Um, if you want to see a map 
of the automation. If you want to see how we set up the conditional workflows in the automation, we have a uh, workshop for that. It's uh, virtualworkwife.com backslash discover, discover automation. We can make everything so much simpler uh, and it all starts from the map. Awesome. Thank you, Michelle. I love it. All automation, all the steps in between, how to simplify your business, how to make it work and function for you. Thank you so much. And up next, and again, staying on the topic of how to brand market and automate your business to make it the most successful. I have Ashley Pakulski. She is born and raised in Canada, still resides there with her two most precious loves, her daughter and her four-legged friend. She is a single mom, a mindset coach, a best-selling author and speaker. Ashley helps women entrepreneurs break through their limiting beliefs so that they can master their mindset, productivity, and create an a more abundance full life. Sorry, abundance full life. Ashley has a diploma in community and justice. She has hosted and spoken at several events, and as always, has a passion to transform people's lives. Ashley truly believes. When you do the inner and mindset work, you get to see what it is going to bring your way and helps you to start become being the driver in the seat of your life and truly stepping into your higher version self. So welcome, Ashley. Thank you so much for joining me here today. Hi, thank you, Adriana. Hello. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here. And Hannah, thank you so much. Um, my name is Ashley, and I'm sure you can relate as a business owner um, how much time can be taken up, uh, you know, feeling the overwhelm, uh, feeling like you're on this hamster wheel ride, doing all these tasks, uh, whether they're repetitive, tedious tasks. And, you know, I love this saying that goes, uh, work smarter, not harder. And that is so key. And it's, I always like to talk about this because it is possible. Because a lot of times uh, you hear, in order to grow and scale my business, I got to work harder. But there's actually ways to work smarter. And that's exactly what I'm going to share with you today is actually automating your business to boost your productivity. And I want to add a side note there that you can also uh, increase your income, reach that next level faster. So I have a quick quote that I just want to share with you that I absolutely love. And it is productivity isn't about being a workhorse, keeping busy or burning the midnight oil. It is more about priorities, planning and fiercely protecting your time. And that is by Gary Keller. And my goal for you today is to basically take a walk away with these action steps that you can implement and actually just simplify your business. Who doesn't like simplicity? We do. So if you have been feeling overwhelmed in your business, you're not as productive and you just feel like you're burning yourself out. This is probably why. One, you have no systems in place. I know when I started my business, I was doing everything on my own. I was focusing on my social media, on the posting, because you have to be consistent with that, putting yourself out there. And I just felt that I was just draining so much time and energy doing that. Um, whether it's also to number two, focusing on all the tasks, feeling that you have to do everything. I know I was that way too, that I want it my way or the highway. I, I want to be the expert in it. So doing all those things on your own. And also number three is not having time for yourself. And a lot of times we can be guilty of that, doing the work, uh, keeping ourselves busy with the tasks we need to do, saying we need to finish this, we need to complete this, we need to work on that. But you're not taking that time for yourself and you're actually blocking yourself because you're more in that resistance rather being in flow, having fun with it. And actually, there's another point I wanted to add. You feel that you're being pulled in all these different directions. So with that being said, this is how automation can actually help you and your business. And even if you have team members. So one, it saves you time for yourself, for your team members. So that way you can focus on other valuable tasks, uh, projects that you could be working on, income generating activities. Uh, number two is you're gonna make less errors. So a lot of times too with that, it could be even following up with people, simple things like that. It could be the emails that you're putting out or say, you know, not having the ideas of what you're gonna post. So you're not being consistent on social media. It could be anything included in these errors. Number three is you're collecting data. 
And your data, I like to call this, this is the gold in your bank. Um, and that way it can help you make better decisions. And number four, I would like to add in, again, it increases your sales. So I would love to share with you right now three steps that you can take that are actually going to help you simplify your business so that way you can start automating and probably figuring out where you need to automate. So number one is going all over all your tasks. Go through everything, every single one, and see where you're wasting your time, where you're wasting your energy, where you feel that you can just put to the side, let it be automated. Um, so then that way you're not focusing too much of that and you could be focusing on other things in your business. And this is even too, if you're a starter in your business and you're just not ready to delegate or outsource by hiring a VA, OBM, you can just look at your um, lists of like tasks that you're doing that are taking up too much of your time and just finding what you can automate because it's just going to simplify your life. So whether this is your calendar, whether it's your email marketing campaign, whether it's your social media, whether it's even just tracking leads, clients, or even organizing, planning out your tasks, your projects, whatever it is, put it all out, figure it out. And I would suggest the next step is um, figuring out what to use to help you with that. And we're in this wonderful era of time. We have uh, the internet and lots of technology available. And there's a lot of apps that are out there that can help you and support you with this and software. And there's free ones. There's also paid ones. You can upgrade whatever it's your choice. And the best thing to do with this, as this, there's so much out there available, is to really research. And when you figure out from your list of what you want to um, automate, you can really look and see what will fit your needs and your business. And there's a lot of them, actually. There's um, Evernote, and these are for all different types of things. Uh, Evernote, Hootsuite, uh, Active Campaign, HubSpot, MailChimp, Zapier, Notion. So those are really great uh, tools that you can look into to actually help you with that whole automation process. Uh, number three with this is being able to track and analyze um, everything that you're doing. So like I said, this is your goal. This is your bank. So you want to actually check your analytics, quite frankly, a lot. And this way it's going to help you to improve future work. Also, like not to miss things, et cetera. And I do want to share an extra bonus. This is a little different, but it's still the same thing with automation. It's making money in your sleep. So having a system in place, an automation where you can basically have your business running itself, right? So again, simplicity. So this is where you can get creative. So what can you do? What kind of freebie can you offer that it's tracking, getting leads for you, but also putting yourself out there where people get to know you, but also you're making money by um, offering, whether it's a small micro program, whether it's a course, whatever it is. And again, that is all, all on automation. And remember, one thing I want to leave you with this, it does not have to be hard. Just pick one simple thing. Start with one and start automating the most thing that you want to get out of your own way. So then that way you free up your time. Um, and then from there, you can revise every time, like, what can I automate next? Make it like a habit. What can I do next? And you will see that your productivity is going to increase. You're going to be able to have more time that's freed up for yourself to do the things you want to do, whether it's in your business for yourself. And you're just going to feel like just freed, completely freed, not overwhelmed and being uh, put with all these tasks, like what do you have to do these repetitive, repetitive tasks? So I want to leave you with this quote. And I really um, is I found it very powerful, but it's uh, in a busy, overwhelming world. Let's do simplicity. And that is by Wendy Tomlinson. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Ashley. It was awesome to learn more about how you do your ins and outs of work every single day and just getting to learn more about you. So thank you so much, Ashley. I'm going to be leaving this off with two more speakers before we get to raffles. So uh, Lauren Weiss, she is our next speaker. She is a business productivity specialist who focuses on helping highly motivated women get ahead in both business and in life. 
Um, Lauren's, sorry, by leveraging their hormonal and cyclical rhythms, Lauren's refreshing and revolutionary approach to the way women work using her cycle align methodology. She has made it um, her personal passion to speak on this project. So um, she is a much sought after speaker, online educator and consultant and two thought leaders of today. Lauren is a co-author in the six book series, Becoming an Unstoppable Woman, published through She Raises Studios, elevating her to a five-time international best-selling author. She is also a master certified health and transformational coach and podcast host. Lauren has been featured in and has written for both Becoming an Unstoppable Woman and Ladies Who Leverage Magazines and enjoys guesting on a variety of podcasts. Lauren currently resides in Wichita, Kansas with her husband and daughter and is currently working on a solo book, which will be released in 2024. So help me welcome Lauren. Thank you, Lauren, for joining us here today. Hi, I'm so excited to be here at the Up Your Energy conference. This is so incredible. And we've had such incredible women already speaking. And I want to dive into this specific topic, which is how to make social media work for both you and me. So I'm going to be talking about five specific points. It's an acronym, ARO, so A-R-R-O-W. But before we dive into that, I am curious. Um, do you remember when we were younger and maybe we were like on the playground or uh, maybe we had younger siblings or older siblings and they kind of like bossed you around and told you, hey, this is what you need to be doing. No, you should be doing that. Has anyone felt like they were like bullied? I don't know about you, but that's how I feel like social media is for me. Like, stop bullying me. You're not the boss of me. So hopefully within the next uh nine to 10 minutes that we have together. I can give you some tips, some tricks, and we can tell social media, hey, you're not the boss of me. All right, let's dive into it. So let's start with that A first, and that's awareness. We're going to talk about two specific types of awareness. One is self-awareness, and one is awareness around our audience. So I'm going to ask you to really kind of stop and take note who are you being when you start creating content? Now, what's really cool is that we as women have hormones, right? We have our menstrual cycle. And there is specific times of the month that we could be leveraging that will actually up our energy, up our creativity, where we can be creating content. And that's during our follicular uh, phase of our menstrual cycle. So that's right after our menstrual cycle, we go into our follicular phase and that surge of estrogen gives us that extra energy into creating content. Now, the second thing I want you to do is I want you to be radically honest with yourself and ask yourself, you know, how do I best tell stories? What is my best way of communicating? Is it behind the camera? Is it maybe written content? Is it in front of the microphone? How do you best tell stories? Because that's really what we're doing with social media, right? We're just sharing our story, our message with the world. You know, when we stand in our truth, we stand in our joy, and that shows in our content creation. Now let's move over to the awareness around our audience. Where and who are your clients and audience when they're consuming your content, right? Because who we're being on LinkedIn is going to be drastically different than who we're being over on TikTok, right? Literally, the chemicals in our brain are different. Our psyche is different when we're over on LinkedIn. We have an objective. We're on there for a purpose. Whereas when we're over on TikTok, our brain chemicals are different as well. We're it's more passive, right? We're there to be entertained. So where and who are your clients when they're consuming your content? So be contextual to the platform, but not to the expense of your authenticity, because let's be real, platforms evolve. And as long as you are standing in your truth, your audience is going to find you. Another really cool thing is I want you to get your audience involved in your content creation. Ask them what they want. They're going to tell you. And what's kind of cool is sometimes the questions that they ask, it's going to move you out of your comfort zone and get you into that creative content creation that you might otherwise not kind of push yourself forward. So let's go into the two R's and that is repurpose and rework. 
So just like what Ashley was talking about earlier is it's the goal is to work smarter, not harder, right? So one way, an example is say we have one long form video content. What can we do with that? So say we spend one hour, we video ourselves. What can we do with this content? Well, quite a bit. Let's say we take that one long form video content. We can upload it to YouTube. We could rip the audio and upload it as a podcast. We could take that same one long form video content and take it to over a transcription service. I like to use rev.com and it will transcribe it and you can upload it as a blog. I'm still not done. Again, you can take that one long form video content and upload it to, it's called repurpose.io and it'll actually make many forms of different type of content that you can upload to YouTube Shorts, you can do it to Pinterest, to LinkedIn, to Facebook, it goes on and on and on, all from one piece of content. Again, working smarter, not harder. But you're gonna say, hey, wait a second, Lauren, you just told me to get really aware and I don't like to be in front of the camera, it's written content, that's, that's my genius, I got you. So you take that one long form piece of content and take it to synthesis.io. So that's S-Y-N-T-H-E-S-Y-S.io. Upload your beautiful content and it's going to give you, deliver this audio visual AI that will bring your words to life. It's literally virtual magic, trust me. Now let's talk about reworking your content. All right, you've already published content you had already in the world, right? It may be a month, three months, six months, a year. That's fine. We don't constantly have to be in the mode of creating new, 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 new content, right? I mean, that's exhausting. How are we going to increase our energy? When we already have created something, go back into your toolbox. See if there's a piece of content that you can bring back and make relevant today. Maybe we can add a different audio file. Maybe you can change the graphics, maybe um, change the colors, make new copy, add new text. How can we refresh it so that we can upload it and make it relevant to today right now? Again, working harder, working smarter, not harder. All right, let's go to the O and that's omnipresence. Omnipresence means kind of being all like all places all the time, right? So you're saying, wait a second. Hold on, Lauren, how can I be everywhere all the time and still have my energy? Trust me on this, follow me. So maybe you have like a really specific brand that you like, I don't know, maybe clothing, maybe for me, it's food, I love to eat. You kind of open up, you open up Twitter, you open up Facebook, you open up Instagram. I mean, this brand is everywhere all the time. Wherever you go, you're seeing that specific brand right in front of you, right? Well, that's kind of what we have to do. We have to be in front of our audience. Here's a fun fact. 10,000 pieces of content are vying for our attention every single day. Now, our brains are pretty cool because they kind of block most of that content, but about 40 to about 400 pieces of content kind of seep through. And that's how we have to reach our audience, right? We have to be at the forefront. We have to get in front of our audience so we stay there and they like, they know, and they trust us. And the reality is this, that if you're not communicating, you don't exist. They don't know you're there. Now I'm gonna give you kind of an unpopular opinion. And that is the quantity of content versus the quality of content. Now the quantity of content is a fact, right? The fact that I put out one, three, five, 50, 500 pieces of content, that's a fact, you can't dispute that. And the more I'm in front of my consumer, the more that they get to know me, right? Whereas the quality of content is an opinion, right? What you might consider quality content could be completely different from what I consider quality content. What I'm trying to say is stop overthinking the success of one piece of content. Just put publish, right? Have the humility and self-confidence to fail, to learn, to collect the data, and to do better. If you don't take anything else from my talk today, 
I hope you take this. And that is that the judgment of others has zero impact on who you are as a human, on your self-worth, on your life. You have a message and it's important and your audience is waiting to hear from you. So go ahead and push publish. All right, let's go to that W and that stands for win. Look, if you upload content with consistency, that's the hint, consistency, and positive intent, you are winning. You are already ahead of the game. And just like real life arrows, your social media and message that's gonna pierce the hearts of your audience and give you both positive energy. Allow your social media to do the heavy lifting and work for you. But showing up authentically is important in making social media work for you. So I hope you stick around because that's exactly what the next speaker is going to be discussing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lauren. Always a pleasure to learn more and hear from you. Thank you for doing such an amazing job. We do have an awesome next guest speaker. Her name is Nicole Curtis. You may know her from She Wears the Studios. She is an author, a speaker, and a co-founder. Nicole Curtis is a much sought after expert in the women, um, sorry, in women leadership with over 15 years of combined experience in both personal growth and self-leadership development. Nicole is um, helping to create and co-found the Women Leadership Division in She Rises Studios. Her mission is to empower women to rise up, lead in life and in business. Nicole writes and speaks to women entrepreneurs around the world to help educate them on women, women leadership and personal development. Um, help me welcome Nicole Curtis. Hi, Nicole. Hey, everybody. How are you? I hope you're feeling energized, pumped up, and ready to go in 2023. What an incredible, incredible summit, hasn't it? Go ahead and put in the chat, energize if you are feeling pumped up. I am so excited to be here to share with all of you. But before I do, I want to thank all the speakers thus far. They've been so amazing and just incredible. And I'm so honored and excited to be here with all of you today um, and to share with you. So I was asked to speak um, on the topic, how to make social media work for you. And in all truth, um, for me, this has actually been quite a journey that I've been on as an entrepreneur. Um, a little over five years ago is when I really began utilizing social media. And when I started my social media journey, I took all of the professional information that I learned from all of the social media gurus and dove right in and began executing it. Ladies, it's really important that social media can not only help you expand your brand and business visibility, but it is also an incredible tool that you can use when building effective business relationships and increase your business ROI. But after some time had passed from me starting, I began to feel this heavy pressure of insecurity and fear just run over me. And what used to be fun and bring me joy was now making me feel anxious, overwhelmed, worthless, and exhausted. Oftentimes when I am leading and mentoring women in business, I hear many women say that they feel stuck, they feel overwhelmed or frustrated, and they're ready even before they start when it comes to social media and its marketing. As you just recently heard from Lauren Weiss, as she shared with you some incredible actionable protocols that will help you make social media work for you, which is very important and has been incredible. My message that I want to share with you today is when it comes to making social media work for you and your business, you need to do it your way. You too might be feeling the same pressure that I once did, that what you're doing isn't enough or that you aren't doing it right, that no one is watching or listening to you, that the time you're putting in isn't enough, that the answer must be that you need to do more of it that your ROI in your business depends on how much you are marketing and showing up on social media. If so, I say do it your way. Which right now you might be thinking, well, how? How do I do it my way and will that really work? I'm not an extra, I'm not a social media guru. I'm not a social media expert and I'm here to tell you that you actually are. The purpose that you have inside of you, the mission that you feel called to do in your business, the thing that you need is the thing that you need to tap into. And you need to allow that 
to guide you in everything that you do in business, especially when it comes to marketing and promoting on socials. When you don't believe you have anything valuable to say, I want you to tap into it. When you don't think people are listening or show, I want you to show up and shine anyway. Let your voice and your message be heard. No message is the wrong message. It's your message. So you matter. What you offer has meaning and the place you show up has value. When you start doubting yourself, tap into your purpose and your mission. When the pressure begins to start, take a step back and evaluate. Evaluate where you are showing up and how you are doing it. And if it feels off, adjust it. You don't need to become a slave to social media. You don't need to let it control you. And don't you dare let it make you feel guilty or less worthy if you decide to cut back or change it up. Just because the guru experts are telling you that you must be on these all these social media platforms and that you must be doing all of these things in order for your social media marketing to be successful, it's a load of crap. Oh, and let me tell you that the amount of followers don't matter. You don't need thousands or a million followers to be successful in business. It isn't the numbers that will make the difference. It is you. You can have all the information, strategies, and formulas. And when you aren't showing up and marketing from a place of alignment and fulfillment, it becomes not only a chore, it won't be very effective in your business. Because I'm going to share with you a little secret. People know when this is happening. They can see it and they can feel it. So do it your way. So I want to share with you two ways that I that have helped me do it my way. Number one is decide what you want to say in market. Show up exactly who you are because that is enough. It is very important when using social media as a marketing tool that you show up as your most truest self. Be real, honest, authentic. Show the ups and downs in life and business, the obstacles as well as the successes. There's no shame in showing your success. The things you post and say, let it come from your heart and your soul. This, um, the other thing is, is create a content map around you, categories of who you are. An example I like to um, teach clients is put your name in the center of a piece of paper. And then I want you to branch off all the things about you that you want to share. So an example for me, I'm a crazy chicken lady. If you don't know that about me, I'm crazy about chickens. And I like to take my audience on the journey with me in my craziness. I also like to share that I'm addicted to coffee. I'm an outdoor adventurer. And so off of that, I like to talk about camping and nature and hunting and fishing and all the things that I like to do outdoors. And I tie it into my business. I tie it into who I am. Another branch that I have off of me is family. I've been married for almost 20 years. There's a lot of lessons I've learned. There's ups and downs that we've gone through. And I like to share some of that and highlight some of that because it's just a way where I can be real and authentic. And I can take people and clients um, on a journey with me and wherever I am in my life. I'm also raising two teens, a boy and a girl. <laughs> Help me. <laughs> I love them to death, but there are days where it's just, it's overwhelming and exhausting, but then there's moments when I look at them, I'm like, man, I am so, so thankful that I get to be your mom. But I like to talk about that. I like to talk about being a mom. I like to share my journey with my children. I like to share off of that, that I am a mental health advocate for moms with struggling teens. I currently have a daughter that has struggled with anxiety and depression for the last five years. And I share my journey as a mom and being a help her, helper and support to her in that. I also have a branch of business, women leadership. Um, I talk about mindset, self-leadership, personal growth, all the things. And so I give this as an example to you of if you don't have this in your business already, take a piece of paper out, put your name in the middle, start branching off some major topics, and then subtitle within those topics of different content and different journeys that you can take your audience in, as well as bring your business into it. The second one is you decide what social media platforms, what social platforms you want to utilize and market on. Focus on the platforms that you want, not what everyone says you should. Get good at one before you get good at many, is what I always like to say. For some of you, one is enough, and for others, being on a couple or a few works too. Whichever is fine. There is no wrong answer here. 
But when these two things are done, then you can focus on how you want to execute it. And if you want guidance and support in putting this all together, she, Rides, she Rises Studios offers a social media marketing service for women entrepreneurs like you to assist you in your social media needs. To learn more about this, you can visit our website at sherisesstudios.com slash services. And if you want a SRS leadership team member to get in touch with you regarding this, feel free to fill out the form below. Remember, ladies, how do, do you make social media work for you? Start by doing it your way. Thank you so much, ladies. It was such a pleasure speaking with you today. Get ready because there are so many more incredible speakers lined up to help you up your energy. Thank you, Nicole. Miss Crazy New York Times bestselling chicken lady. I'm so happy that you're here with us today. And it is now time for um, it's raffle time. I mean, if you have to go to the bathroom, you've been waiting <laughs> to go to the bathroom. I say go real, real quick. I'm going to stall for you for a second, but there are some prizes coming up. I have four minutes to the next speaker and the next sector of the Up Your Energy Summit. I just want to thank you so much for joining us here today. If you're watching the replay, um, just all together for helping us to grow the community that we've built so far. And we're just so privileged that you're joining us here today. So I do have a very special grand prize at the end of the event. So if you're waiting for this particular prize, you do have to wait to the end. Um, I put it there purposefully, of course. But I'm super excited because it is one of the, I want to say a special gift for myself. As you, some of you may know, my background is in web and graphic design. I'm giving an all-inclusive website giveaway. So stay tuned to the end to see if you are the winner. All right. So I bought you a few moments. I know it's not a whole bunch of time, but I do have to catch us up on schedule and keep us there. So I have some prizes to be giving away to you today. The first one is from no one other than Heather Stokes Benton. So Heather is going to be giving away a complimentary financial needs assessment for financial fitness, a free guest spot on her financial GPS mama podcast and a personally signed copy of her becoming an unstoppable woman entrepreneur. Okay, here we go. It is the time. Okay, so winner, you have 48 hours to claim your prize. Please make sure that you email us at info at studios.com. The winner of this prize is Samantha Kaler. So thank you so much, Samantha. You have got your prize from Heather Stokes Benton. Please be sure to email us within 48 hours. Okay, I'm going to go on to the next one. I hope you're back and in, in your seats. Um, next prize is from Melanie Greenhouse. So Melanie has designed a self-paced online program called Show Up and Ignite, your change journey to help you discover what is possible with the right support, strategies, tools, and accountability. Within the program, you will be guided to understand how to use your mindset as a tool, how to gain clarity around what is possible and what you really want the hidden obstacles that are holding you back, the first step to getting unstuck in your life. Okay, the winner for this prize is Rita Marari. Okay, Rita, you have 48 hours from today to claim your prize, info at shirazestudios.com. Make sure that you guys are writing prize winner. We will go ahead and confirm that you are the prize winner of this from the summit today. All right, up next, I'm gonna hurry. I know we're running closer to that time. It is from Samantha Lander. It's a 14-day detox jumpstart. You have committed and you're ready to change your life. She wants to give you these simple to-dos um, and what not to do. Remember, you can do anything for yourself in 14 days if you put your mind to it. So if you're looking for the 14-day detox jumpstart, the winner for this is Kara Peters. So Kara. 48 hours, email us, info at studios.com to claim your prize. And the next one we have is from Annabelle Beckwith. It is uh, position yourself with PR, five top tips to gain and leverage your free publicity for you and your business. If you are the winner of this prize, you're going to get with Annabelle. You're going to be able to learn and position yourself within PR. All right, drum roll, everybody. Prize winner for this is Brandy Kepley. Brandy, you have 48 hours. Info at studios.com. Email us. Okay, one more. I'm rushing through to make sure we get back on time. I apologize if I'm going too fast. 
All right, so last one is from Andra Annette. There's a bunch of goodies within this one. Andra's giving away her freebies quick start guide to macro nutrients, excuse me, seven habits to kickstart your weight loss, um, freebies on prio, probiotics and prebiotics, as well as a salad recipe collection. Okay, prize winner for this is Lillian Bentley. Okay, Lillian, if you are there and you're listening to us, you are the prize winner from Andra Annette. Uh, please email info at studios.com within 48 hours. Okay, Whew, we made it through. So this is the Up Your Energy Summit. Um, I know we're getting closer to the end, but there's still so much to talk about and go over. I'm excited to be talking about collaboration over competition. Um, we have been patiently waiting for our next speaker. Her name is Julianne Williams. Let me give you a quick background into Julianne. Born with a heart defect that required life-saving surgery at the young age of five, Julianne has always been resilient and tenacious. She married her high school sweetheart, Alan. Both Julianne and her husband worked on their careers for the first part of their marriage, as well as traveling and completing postgraduate work. Her husband took his life when he was only 36 years of age, and was she was left with her children, seven and three, while rising in the skilled nursing sector, Julian loved caring for the elderly. She rose to the president of a skilled nursing provider in the U.S. with 320 locations in 21 states, employing over 30,000. She recently published a book, Head Above Water, hosts a podcast and YouTube channel, and provides consulting to healthcare companies. She is co-author of Unleash Her and Mom Magic Mompreneur, which are international best-selling books. Julianne has chaired and serves over several boards, is, an active, um, is active in church and cultural activities. So please help me welcome Julianne Williams. And don't forget to unmute. <laughs> Thank you so much, Adriana, for the beautiful introduction. Um, again, my name is Julianne Williams, and I, as you heard, I'm a widow, I'm a mom, I'm a healthcare executive, I'm an author and a speaker, and I help organizations maximize their operational capabilities and individuals develop skills of resilience in the face of grief and other difficulties in life. So my talk, bookworm, that's what you would have called me as a child. I loved to read. It started likely because every night we had story time with our dad as a part of our bedtime routine. It grew in school because of library days and the much anticipated scholastic book orders we could make with our class. The day those books arrived and we were passed out to me was always the best. As I grew up, it changed to romance novels, suspense novels, whatever those stories are and the wonderful self-help books that I have so much uh, loved over the last probably 20 years. But the one thing I knew is that there were authors behind those words, people who had something to say, said it well, many of them became icons, and people to whom I looked at in awe. When I met someone and heard he or she had written a book, these are some of the thoughts that crossed my mind. I've always wondered how they did it. I thought they were famous. I felt that they were an expert in their, you know, or very, very intelligent. Um, but what have I found out now that I'm an author? You are everything those authors are as well. You are an expert in something. You're intelligent, creative, and you have a story that will help others and provide growth. So you may wonder why I decided to begin writing books. My career was far from focused on writing or telling my personal story. While working in the skilled nursing sector of healthcare, it required a lot of love, creativity, and perseverance. But honestly, I spent, spent more time allocating resources, supporting my team who provided care, and implementing regulations. I didn't spend a lot of time writing more than business communications and policies. After losing my husband to suicide at the age of 36, I began supporting other women who had experienced the loss of a spouse. Most of these I was able to walk alongside commented I needed to write a book. 
And for years, I didn't think I could do it. And no one would want to hear my story. What I didn't know was that there are so many reasons to write a book. Most importantly for me, it could transmute my pain into help for others. My hope was for no one on my path to do so with the lack of information and wisdom I had when my life crumbled. So just like Einstein had this equation in the theory of relativity, E equals MC squared, that mass and energy are equivalent and they're transmutable, I figured I could transmute my story into something good. Mass energy equivalence states that all objects having mass or massive objects have corresponding intrinsic energy, even when they are stationary. So in my mind, me, the mass, had energy, which was my story. I could transmute me into a story that would hopefully help others and inspire them. And one other nugget that stuck with me is that mass and energy are equal. I was just as good as all of those other authors that turned their idea into a circumstance or a story. But what did this have to do with building my business? And what are the benefits of taking the risk? Because it's a big one to be an author. Three areas for you to consider today are about why writing a book can help grow your business. The first is personal growth. The second is impacting the community at large. And the third are for your career and financial purposes. So real quick on personal growth. Writing a book for personal growth can be very rewarding. How does it benefit you as a businesswoman? Well, as I look back in my career, my best performance came as I found my personal power. And I didn't fully understand this until I wrote my first book, Head Above Water. Now, this book tells the story of how I rebuilt my life after the suicide of my husband when I was 36 years old. I didn't realize as I wrote the book that, number one, I would grieve again, you know, over all the events of that season of my life. I also didn't realize that as I reprocessed the emotions, I would understand more of how I react at the time and how it affects me now. I also learned that I would be freed from emotional barriers that were holding me down. So the benefit was that I became better. When I was able to settle more into me, I was able to be more settled for those around me. And that includes being a better me in my professional life. So what about impacting the community at large? I liken this to the mission-driven piece of why you are writing a book. As I mentioned, there are a few areas of my life that I, that I, that I felt needed to be shared to encourage others and to bring light to the struggles that I faced to uplift those who are also having a similar experience. Just like we just heard from Nicole about sharing with her daughter and all of the uh, depression anxiety. So since I have started sharing about my grief and my single mom experience, so many have come to me just to share their grief and their single parenting struggles. This has opened up conversation that has not been widely heard before. Through my book, I've provided an environment that fosters confidence for others to unveil deep secrets that have been holding them back for years. And importantly, they feel supported to finally begin the way to, to become free from shame, depression, and abuse. You see, when you have the courage to put your story into words, it becomes real for others. They are seen and validated. They know their experience was real and you have made an impact. And one by one, community members near and far encounter and learn from words in your book. And it's exciting. You have started a special conversation, highlighted an issue that needs a bright light over it and empowered others. This is how change begins with us, with our family, friends, church, schools, workplace, our city and beyond, but it has to start. And by writing your book, you launch the change in the world in which you live. And the last part of a uh, benefit that you can see is in your career and financial life. And this is likely what we think about most often when we're considering why we would write a book. So let's go back to what we think of people who write books. 
We see them as important and powerful. They're famous, smart, creative. So when you publish a book, you are seen as an expert and it increases your perceived authority on the topic of your book. Sometimes it may even expand beyond. Specific areas that a book may help catapult your business are in the areas of expanding leads, brand awareness, more closed deals, improved margins, traffic to your website or other social media, expansion of your online course, bringing in coaching clients, and most importantly, learning something new. And this is what I call transmuting your story. So just so we're all on the same page, what is to transmute? Well, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary just describes and defines transmutation as to change or alter in form, appearance, or nature, and especially to a higher form. So writing your story in the form of a book takes your knowledge, expertise, experience, and passion to serve many. Every person has something to share. I've suggested three areas in which I believe becoming a published author benefits you and those in the world. You see, when we grow our and we when we grow and when our business grows, we're able to use our influence to bring about the change we desire. And last, I fully believe when we do what we love, money always follows. So if you've been thinking about authoring, take the leap. You won't regret it. Awesome. Thank you, Julianne. It was an I love the overview of publishing, obviously, writing books, and I love what it does for us when we do collaborative books as well, anthologies, and what it brings, you know, brings other individuals into our life and into our stories, and we get to build a positive community with one another. So I am going to pass it over next to Yana Yaneva. She is a psychologist, one of the youngest members of the British Psychological Society, an Amazon bestselling author, and the founder of the first psychology subscription box for women. With over a decade of experience in the field of psychology, she specializes in helping people overcome obstacles, achieve the dreams that they have, and find meaning, purpose, and balance in work and in life. Thank you, and um, help me join Yana, and don't forget to unmute. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. And hello, everyone. I was literally watching Julian and I'm like, oh, I'm not. Yes, good point. Definitely. Um, that was fantastic introduction. Thank you so much. And thanks for everyone joining the Up Your Energy Summit. So much knowledge and information is just unbelievable. And uh, as Adriana said, I'm a big fan of psychology and, and I'm a big believer that we have to use science and it's the best tool to basically empower and keeps us moving. Um, so I'm going to talk about collaboration over competition or together or separate. Overall, if we look at those two words, they're just words. They don't mean anything. You, you can call them potato. It doesn't mean anything. The fact is that human beings are actually giving meaning to those words by what they say, how are they saying it and what emotional charge do they bring with those words? And most of the time we actually influence the people next to us without even realizing it. We, we can completely change their entire state of being by a simple thing we say. For example, if I come and tell you, you're so competitive, what's going to happen? You're going to automatically move into a defensive mode because I'm attacking your personality. I'm obviously saying something that you don't like. My tone of voice is very attacking, basically. So the conversation is going to go into a frustration, anger, probably. You're going to keep wondering what you did. I'm going to keep blaming and pointing my finger at you. So by simply saying this, I can, I can bring the whole conversation into a whole new level and make you upset. But if I come and tell you, you're so competitive with yourself, what's going to be your reaction? You're going to automatically think this is a compliment because I'm basically telling you, you've been growing, you've been self-developing yourself, you have been evolving. You today is better than you yesterday, which is a big deal. It's a big thing. So it's in psychology, we, we call that influence or even manipulation. It is. 
<clears throat> so we have to be very careful where we actually give power and emotional charge to what we are saying and to whom, because you never know the impact you're going to actually hit with a simple sentence. Now, psychology is a science that is built upon very ancient philosophical teachings starting three, five thousand years ago from, from Egypt, from ancient Greece. You've all have heard about Aristotle, Plato, Seneca, the great philosophers of ancient Greece, um, Roman Empire and Mark Aurelius, one of the greatest emperors through, you know, last century psychologists like Carl Jung, Sigmund Freud, Friedrich Nietzsche, and even modern times, there is one thing that psychology does, um, and we inherited that from the ancient philosophical teachings, observation and analysis. So if we go back in time to actually understand why are we so offended from the word collaboration, and yet we're so attached to that word, um, sorry, competition, we compete all the time, every time, with everyone and everything. So I want you all to go back in time and think about your earliest years as a kid, when you were young and free. How many times have you heard the phrase, why can't you be more like this? Why can't you be more like that? How many times have you been compared with your siblings, your cousins, your relatives, the kid next door, um, the kid in the next neighborhood, and so on. So from very early age, actually, we are developing that competitive feeling. We need to be like someone else in order to meet someone else's expectations. And we start building on top of that. It's it's from very early stage, and it's a, it's a habit, it's a pattern that psychology has been observing and analyzing and it's been passed on from generation to generation. If you move a little bit ahead in time, right? You're at school. What happens at school? What have we been taught at school? And I'm talking about behavior, not about knowledge and skills. You're not supposed to work in a team. You're not supposed to help others while an exam is performing. You're not supposed to ask for help from others when you're on an exam or you're studying or you're in front of the blackboard and you're just being asked a question. You're supposed to deal with everything on your own. And then when the teacher stands in front of everybody announcing the result, it's in front of everybody. Meaning that if you have an A+, you're going to be in the front row and you're going to be praised as a smart kid and the cool kid at school. If you have F-, minus well, you are from the losers at the backside. So again, we move into a mode of competition. Everyone wants to be in the front row. Everyone wants to be appraised. And it's a, unfortunately, it's a horrible way of teaching competition. It's going to be a better thing if you actually focus that competition, that entire energy, creativity, imagination, time, money, health as well, into competing with yourself. You can't compete with everyone. And, and it's a horrible thing that we've been taught to actually compete externally. What are you doing today that's better than yesterday? How are you pursuing your dreams or how are you becoming a better person than yesterday? This is where you have to compete. And this attachment actually that we have created as, as a very young kids now can be utilized in a completely different direction. Collaboration. We're so afraid of collaboration. People don't trust anybody. Don't, don't, don't trust. Something can go wrong. You can get lied. You, you can get cheated. It's, it's absolutely possible. That's not true. <laughs> you have to trust. In collaboration, we have developed that fear because of our early age and because it's cool. You've been told, don't do it because you don't know what's going to happen or even worse, you're going to get punished <laughs> for asking to collaborate with someone. But then you enter into the business world because you are now an adult and you need to find a job. And all you hear about is a team player, collaboration, delegation, um, developing people, developing um, teams, building strategies with one another. And it's a complete clash with what you've known your entire life that you have to relearn now how to actually trust 
and delegate and work in a team to meet deadlines. It doesn't matter if you are an employee or employer, if you are a private business owner or you are in a partnership. There is always in the back mind what we've learned as young kids. Don't ask, don't expect someone to help you because you're going to be punished. You can get kicked out of the classroom because you try to help each other. And it's really a shame that school is teaching us that. It can give us an extortionate amount of knowledge. And knowledge is so crucially important. But the power is not in the knowledge. It's how we use knowledge. So I'm going to finish with a quick tip. The most important skill you have to develop, self-control. If you can self-control yourself, and tomorrow I provoke you with you're so competitive, don't react as an animal. Okay, that's the first instinct. Don't be protective. Respond intelligently. Ask me why. Why do I think you are so um, competitive? Move the conversation in a different direction. Most of all, don't build rapport when someone is angry or frustrated with you. Keep the normal tone of voice. Keep the intelligent conversation. And naturally, you're going to bring actually the other person to be in rapport with you. So at the end, you may actually learn something and you may discover a pattern in your behavior that you see you may want to change or do something about it. Maybe it's not healthy as you think. So self-control is managing our entire life, your relationships, your health, your wealth, your communication, your mind, your emotions, everything. Learn to master your self-control. And there is a really nice technique called anchoring. So every time you, you, you're about to get manipulated or frustrated or annoyed or influenced, pinch yourself. Just pinch yourself somewhere. Sooner or later, your body is going to get used to it. So even before you realize that you're getting frustrated and angry, you're going to start pinching yourself. And that's your signal that you need to stop, take a deep breath, count until five, and then respond intelligently. So I hope that makes sense. And I hope I gave you some good tips from psychology because it's really a remarkable science. Thank you. Thank you, Yana. Yes, you did. You did an amazing job. I love psychology. I, I loved listening to your topic and how you broke everything down. Um, just an overall beautiful speech. Thank you so much. And up next is Angela Bell. We are still on the topic of collaboration over competition. She has some insights. Um, and I think she's going to talk a little bit about book publishing as well. We'll see. Let's see what Angela has in store for us. So she is the founder of the Mom Magic Anthology Series and the Mom Magic Movement. She is also the founder and CEO at the Inspired and Profitable Mompreneur Business Podcast, Magazine, and TV Show. Angela is on a mission to empower moms around the world to stand in their power, embrace their dreams, and create their own business. Angela is a multi-passionate entrepreneur, business coach for moms and moms of twins. She has built multiple six and seven figure businesses, published several books, and helped hundreds of women launch and grow their own inspired and profitable online businesses. Angela is committed to helping other moms live their very best lives in their own terms. Thank you so much for joining us, Angela. Take it Hi, away. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Adriana. And welcome, everybody. It's so great to be here. Um, I really hope you guys are loving the Up Your Energy Summit. I mean, there are so many great takeaways today. And it's such a privilege to be here with this remarkable group of women. Um, so yeah, today I am going to touch on collaboration and writing a book. So do you dream about writing a book? Have you ever thought of it? Does the idea sound exciting to you? Uh, but you have all these doubts, these worries, you know, you wonder, oh, is it just a distracting thought? And you have too much else to do? Or do you feel like in your line of work, people don't write books? Or that no one would be interested in hearing what you have to say? If any of these things resonated with you, I am so glad you're here. Because today I want to tell you about how becoming an author can help you grow your business in any industry. So I've written a few books in my career so far. Um, my very first book was about my experience with small business bankruptcy. Yes, you heard that right. Small business bankruptcy. 
So one of my first businesses to earn over $2 million annually went bankrupt a year after my father passed away. Now, why would I tell you this? Uh, first is because I truly believe that we need to own the hard life lessons that shape who we are and move away from feeling shame and guilt around those lessons. But I also share that with you because if you are worried that your topic might be boring, I wrote about small business bankruptcy. It's a cringeworthy topic. So while it wasn't exactly a page turner, the writing process was very therapeutic. And the book helped a lot of people during the pandemic. Our stories matter. They have value. Telling them not only helps us, but it helps others. It adds to the collective knowledge base. I believe that everyone has a story to tell regardless of their industry and becoming a published author can benefit every entrepreneur or in my case mompreneur i'm sure as many of you know writing can be a powerful tool to build your brand and drive customer engagement so what are some of the benefits about being coming up an author well in short expertise brand recognition and marketing and client acquisition so for starters, becoming an author can help you establish yourself as an expert in your field. Having your name on a book that's been published tells people that you take your work seriously. It tells people you know what you're talking about and that you believe it so strongly that you will confidently put it in writing. It's like a badge of honor. It shows that you're committed to your craft and it gives you an edge, a competitive edge in the marketplace. When you put your opinions down on paper, it makes you a thought leader. People can reference your position on important issues and they can learn from your experience and adopt your methods. It's an act of service that gives you credibility. Another benefit is that it increases your visibility and brand recognition. So writing a book allows you to share your ideas with a wider audience, wider than ever before, whether through traditional publishing or self-publishing. Your book will be creating opportunities for you to speak on panels, to be interviewed by the media, and to get featured in industry events, or to speak at summits, right? So a book can give you this competitive advantage in your industry, and it increases your name recognition and your top of mind awareness, which is key in a busy and congested marketplace. Plus, you can use your book as a lead magnet to attract customers who are interested in what you have to say. So becoming a published author also exposes you to a network, a network of new people, and it can help you build exciting relationships. So one option that you've probably heard about a lot here is the opportunity to collaborate with other authors in an anthology. This is a truly magical experience because you get to form relationships with your fellow co-authors. You create a community. You create a special bond while you go through the writing process and the publishing and the promotion process. You get to gain lifetime friendships and you also meet potential partners that you can collaborate on on other projects, right? I mean, you're meeting people that share an idea or share an experience with you. And in turn, you can gain access to their network and increase your exposure and audience. So as Julianne mentioned, becoming an author helps you grow as a person and in your business. It takes you outside of your comfort zone. It challenges you to do new things, to try new things, to learn new things. Through the process of writing a book or a chapter, in the case of an anthology, you learn about yourself, you overcome new challenges and you gain still skills and strengths. You come out the other side, a new person, stronger in so many ways. The writing process also does a really, really neat thing. It helps you organize your thoughts on paper, right? How many of us have all of these thoughts kind of swimming around in our head and we struggle to get them down on paper when it comes to creating courses or creating programs. Right? Throughout my writing career, I've been pleasantly surprised by the number of great workshop ideas, course ideas, or product ideas that have come out of simply getting my thoughts down on paper. I remember things, I create new connections, and I refine my thoughts and ideas. And finally, 
writing a book allows you to create something of lasting value for yourself. Even if it's just for fun or practice, a book is still an accomplishment that will stand the test of time. It's a chance for you to express yourself creatively, refine your message, and hone your skills as a storyteller. Here's the catch. All of us often undervalue our knowledge and talents, right? We think that if something comes easily to us, it must come easy to everyone else. I say this from experience. It took me a long time to realize that not everyone knew how to start and grow a business. Not everyone knew how to create a unique offer from their pre-existing skill sets. Not everyone knew how to overcome challenges and failures. And not everyone knew how to reach their ideal clients, let alone what an ideal client was. I had to realize that not everyone knew that because now I help women, specifically moms, do that every day. And I write books about it. You too have valuable things to share. Information so valuable that if you put it in a book, people will not only buy it, they will appreciate it. So how can you do that? Well, start by listing three things that people ask you for help with all the time, right? Things they come up and I was like, hey, can you help me with this? Or I can't figure this out. Then ask your friends and family what you're really good at. Take a look at those lists and decide what you're passionate about. Decide what you could write 2,500 words about. That's a chapter. That's a chapter that can go in an anthology. And here's the thing. Myself, She Rises Studios, so many of my fellow speakers here have anthologies that are looking for spaces, that have space looking for authors. Sorry about that. Find one that aligns with you because you can do this, right? Your message, your story could change someone's life, someone you've never met. It could, benefit, it could be just what one person really needed to hear. Everyone's story has a purpose and all of you can benefit from becoming a published author. So I hope that this speech has inspired you to take up a pen and paper and write your own book or chapter. Good luck on your next project. Thanks so much. Thank you, Angela. I was nodding my head the entire time. I love all the key points, um, all the reasons why, and I, I guess the true question is why not, right? Um, so the last speaker within this section, collaboration over competition, before we head into our next topic, is the one, the only, Bella Bliss. She is an intuitive, transformational, and empowerment coach who specializes in guiding divorced women through challenging transitions and leading them into enriched, balanced, healthy, and more purposeful lives. Suffering in silence through anxiety and fear, she's, she's learned to overcome a domestic violence, a 20-year marriage to a narcissist. She is passionate about helping women manifest their authentic, joyful lives by guiding them through their own awakenings, shifting limiting belief perspectives, over to openly trusting you know, one's own tuition, inner wisdom, and practicing methods of deep self-love. The empowering mantra she teaches and lives by is be seen, be heard, be limitless. Welcome, Bella Bliss. Hello, and thank you. I am super excited. Like, I am just overjoyed to be here. So I really appreciate you all being here and holding sacred space for all of us as we are sharing in our journey with you. I just came back from an epic trip. It was all about rest and relaxation. I can't even tell you honestly when I've ever done that for myself or maybe never. And through that process, we were with, uh, well, I was with five, um, four others. And I could just tell you how transformative that was. So as far as um, making moments into memories, I had thought about what the topic is today and what it came down to are the three H's, which is human connection, high fives and good vibes, and happy drugs. And that's all that I do when I connect with people. And this is definitely 
collaboration over competition. This is so my jam <laughs> because people usually ask me, well, what do you do, Bella? And I said, well, you know what I do is the human connection. I do it from my, my whole genuine heart and soul. And so when people come to me and they tell me, oh, I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm a coach, I'm a, you know, I, I always ask them, I just kind of pause and just ask them on a human level, how are we able to connect? And that, you know, sometimes people don't want to, and sometimes they don't, they don't know what to say. <laughs> we are so multidimensional that we have so much to offer and give. And so that is one of my things is that I want to emphasize how important it is to have that human touch. And whether or not we collaborate in some way, shape or form, there's always that human connection that we do make. And, you know, if not now, then maybe later, right? They can be client, become clients of ours. They could send somebody our way. And that's happened to a lot of us, hasn't it? So the human connection is super important. Second is the high five. I call it the high five and the good vibes. I am all about the high fives, high fives <laughs> and the good vibes, simply because we, when we're together, when we collaborate, especially like exactly what we're doing right now, it's this energy. It's also a healing. It's also this invigoration. It's just, you know, it's something that we are unable to have when we're doing it on our own. And sometimes I believe when it comes to the competition, people isolate themselves. People pull away from connecting and truly connecting with others, whether they're looking you know into judgment being judged or they're judging themselves they're isolating themselves we need to be connected ladies and so that high five and good vibes happens naturally i mean don't you go to like get your nails done or something and you start talking to the lady next to you and and all of a sudden you're just like so it, it, in the joy of the moment that it feels so good so that goes on to the next topic, which is the happy drugs. I love talking about the happy drugs because the happy drugs is the serotonin, the endorphins, the dopamine, and the oxytocin. I'm a big hugger. <laughs> and I do believe that we need that touch. And throughout this whole process of the retreat that I was on, we had a great balance of being able to be together, to love on each other, to share with one another. And a lot were very open that they were mistrusting possibly of things in the past, but we can't be our past. When we're there in the moment, we're saying yes to ourselves. We're saying yes to others. We are holding sacred space for each other. And that is so important. We need that in our lives. And when we do that, we can take part in those happy drugs, oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin, and the endorphins. And when we're in competition, we can't do that. And you know about cortisol. Cortisol is that stress. There's nothing good about competition. It's all about the collaboration. And that's exactly what we're doing today. So through this all, I feel like it's living your life with vacation eyes. And the reason why I say that is because when you go on vacation, you do everything in your power to get ready because the plane's going to leave without you if you're not ready. But if you have that open mind and you have that open heart, you set that date, everything starts focusing on the one thing and what that one thing for us when we're collaborating is holding that sacred space for someone else connecting on a soul level and being able to release those happy drugs and when you're high on life there's nothing that stops you 
So I encourage you, if you're scared, if you're worried, if you want to reach out to me, you're definitely, you certainly are welcome to because I am completely open. It comes all from love and I've met the best people, even in all of my just even brief moments with people or people that I'm just really drawn to, I'll just reach out to them and just tell them how amazing they are. And I know that I feel after a, a beautiful talk with somebody, a heart to heart, meaningful talk, that I just feel like a better person. So all the way around collaboration is something that I would say definitely take part of. But in that process, as I, as what Adriana had said, is what I promote, which is to be seen, be heard, and be limitless. So when you are making that genuine connection, you're actually being seen and you're seeing yourself. When you are in the high fives and the good vibes, you are being heard because you are sharing your heart. And when you are in the happy drugs, there is no stopping you. So continue to soar, continue to shine your light. If you need help with this, if you might be too into your head or not knowing how to go about it, that's okay. Just go ahead and reach out to me. I am 100% collaboration over competition. And uh, well, you know, I am Bella Bliss. I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening and we're super happy that you're here. All right, ciao. Thank you, Bella. Awesome. Our amazing Bella Bliss. She is the epitome of collaboration over camp, uh, competition and just a beautiful soul altogether. So we are happily on our way with an, about an hour and a half left to um, an hour and a half left in the summit. And we are on to our next topic, which is not only fun, interesting, but much needed. So let's get to it. Women in finance. So we have up next none other than Martina Kwan. Martina was born in Hong Kong to a German mother and a Chinese father. Martina Kwan was destined to live a life that was different. She spent her childhood in Asia, the Middle East, and Europe, but credits living, uh, but uh, credits living in war-torn Beirut, Lebanon during the Lebanese War was an experience that defined much of her fearlessness today. Martina is a three-time champion race car driver, a two-time international best-selling author, and Emmy and Telly award-winning business entrepreneur. Aside from being the CEO of DK Racing School, she is also the CEO of Daring to be Different, in which she is um, sharing her champion mindset, confidence, and business coaching to high-level female executives. Help me welcome Martina Kwan. Hi, Adriana. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me on your Up Your Energy Summit. And what a great topic. All the speakers were amazing. Uh, so I'm going to get started. And I love the topic of procrastination. So my topic is eight steps to stop procrastination in its tracks because I'm a race car driver. So I love to do things, get to the point. So let's be honest. I mean, who who here watches binge, uh, binge watches Netflix? You know, type me in the chat. I'm guilty as charged. And I would say this is one of the greatest forms of, I would say this is one of the greatest forms of modern procrastination. And I mean, what exactly is procrastination? So it's really delaying things or putting off till tomorrow or some other time what really could be done today. And um, I want you to think about like what type of procrastinator you are. And there are, you know, passive procrastinators. And are you somebody who delays your task because you struggle to make decisions um, and act on them? Or are you an active procrastinator, one who delays task purposefully because you work better under pressure. That was me starting in college. I mean, I would wait till the night before a test to study and still get the A. So I, I wasn't really punished for waiting. So that sort of has been a lifelong thing. Other things like you're a perfectionist, right? You want things to be so perfect that you don't get it done because um, it's not perfect enough. Or 
you worry about the challenge or you're an overdoer, you take on, you know, people ask you to do things and you're like, sure, sure, sure. And then you have so many things that you can't get them done. So one of the things at the beginning of the year, it's still January, that I would love to encourage everyone to do is to do a vision board for 2023. It's the perfect time at the beginning of the year to kind of set your intentions because if you don't know what your goals are, your dreams, your hopes, your wishes for this coming year, how are you going to know what to prioritize, right? So typically you'll put the things that matter to you most on your vision board. And that really helps you, you know, keep it handy, look at it, you know, on an almost daily basis to really stay on track of your why. So um, I have eight steps and they're really important. It's really important to be organized. And one of the um, my favorite sayings in racing as well as in life is the Bruce Lee quote, empty your mind, be water, my friend. And so what's really important is to quiet your mind, because if you have clutter in your mind, you're not going to get things done. So I'm sitting here at my desk and what I love to do, step number one, write this down is clean and organize your workspace because messy workspace <laughs> means messy mind and messy mind means you don't get stuff done so it's really important to just empty your mind and having a clean surface especially at the beginning of the week is really going to help you get rid of the clutter you're not going to be as anxious so clean your desk number one number two it's really important to realize that you know what you don't have to build rome in one day a lot of times why we procrastinate is like, oh, it's such a big task that I, I don't even want to tackle it. So here it is. Step two, realize that once you get started, you're going to gain momentum. So focus on one step. Imagine a staircase. Just focus on one step. All you have to do is walk up one step. Don't focus on climbing the whole thing because that'll stress you out. Just say, you know what, what is one little thing that I can get done towards that bigger goal? And then it just seems much more manageable. So a lot of stuff what I, that I talk about, I'm a champion mindset coach, is really um, everything starts in your mind. So if you make it manageable, your mind says, great, I can do this. So step two, focus on the step in front of you, not the whole step staircase. And once you get started, the momentum, it's like a snowball turning into an avalanche, but it has to start. The starting and then you're in motion. That's the important thing. Step three is really important to prioritize. So um, I would encourage you to use the Eisenhower matrix. I'm just gonna hold it up. And really what it is, it, it, it has four quadrants. Number one are your urgent and important things. Like for example, you get a call, your child's sick, you've got to go, you have to pick them up from school. You have work deadlines, you have college deadlines, um, things that are crisis that need to be taken care of right away. Number two is still important, but it's not exactly urgent tomorrow, but in the future. For example, strategic planning, networking, exercise, oh, one that I love to put off. <laughs> but think about exercise as something that's really going to prevent you from getting sick in the future. So uh, long term benefits, short term benefits of exercise are really great. Right. So then you also have the third quadrant, which is it's not important. And but it is urgent. So you need to eat. So let's say meal prep, or social media posts, if you're a business owner, it is important to post um, to attract your business as well. Um, interruptions, different things. And so here you wanna think about what can I delegate so that I don't have to do everything myself. The meal prep is the perfect example. Order stuff from HelloFresh, somebody else cooks, you eat, that's it. Quadrant four is not important and not urgent like web surfing, watching Netflix, social media, and over refinement. And the typical Eisenhower matrix says, get rid of it. But what I like to say is, you know what, hold on. I think it's really important to keep the things that you love to do, you know, the procrastinating items, but sort of plan them in a different way. So what I like to say is step four, write this down, temptation bundling. So I have an ice cream here, but basically it is only do the thing you love 
while doing the thing you procrastinate on, right? So only listen to your favorite podcast, for example, while you're exercising, right? Something you love to do with something that you procrastinate on. Um, yeah, only watch your favorite Netflix show while you're doing, you know, household chores, that kind of thing. And an easy way to implement step four is write two columns. What I enjoy, column one, what I have to get done, and then you can sort of bundle them together. Step five is habit stacking, and it's similar to temptation bundling, but essentially, um, I want you to write two columns as well for habit stacking. So it's after or before I do something that I normally do now, my current habit, I'm going to do the new habit, right? So after or before current habit, new habit, I'm going to do. After I pour my cup of coffee, I'm going to meditate for one minute, right? Practicing self-care, mindfulness. Um, after I take off my work shoes, I'll immediately change into my workout clothes so I don't lose my motivation to work out. And uh, after I get into bed, I'm going to give my partner a kiss which is really important, relationship maintenance, right? And being mindful and present in relationships. So the other thing is really important is to use a calendar. So I really suggest that you get a monthly as well as a weekly calendar so you can put all the things that you need to get done in here because it's important to be pl planned, organized, and know exactly what you need to do. And the way I like to implement it is step seven, which is the Ivy Lee method, not Lee, but Lee, L-E-E. -E. And really what it says is think about the night before, the six most important things that you have to do tomorrow that you're going to put in your calendar so you know exactly what you need to do. Because part of procrastinating is you wake up, you don't know what the plan is, you don't know what your plan of action, the game plan is for the day, forget it, I'm going to watch Netflix. You have a plan of action, you get up and you implement those at least six things. And the eighth step is probably one of the most important things is you have to tell someone. So you have accountability when you speak up and say, hey, you know what, I'm going to you know, run a mile this week. And then you're going to disappoint yourself as well as the other person that you told. That's why it's so important. Probably the most important thing to stop procrastinating is telling people your plans. And so they're like, hey, did you run the mile? It's like, oh, yes, I did. Because you're motivated to do it because you've told someone. So I hope that you've enjoyed this presentation. I, I love talking about mindset. You know, I'm a champion mindset coach and I love working, especially with women. I just came off my extreme confidence mastermind retreat that I led this week uh, for women in Malibu. And I'm so passionate about helping women really, you know, in all areas of their life, but especially alpha women, because a lot of alpha women are so powerful, so successful, so certain at work, but have trouble in their personal relationships. So if that's you, please reach out to me, Martina Kwan, K-W-A-N.com or at Martina Kwan on Instagram. And thank you so much, She Rises Studios, Hannah, Adriana, and all of the wonderful speakers. It's been wonderful being here with you on your Up Your Energy Summit Conference. Thank you. Thank you, Martina. Always a pleasure. Um, I love the energy. I love the tips. I, I was taking notes because I love the transition from this to that. And I think they're very actionable, useful tips because we forget about all the little nuances in life and what makes us happy, what makes us stay motivated. Um, so thank you so much, Martina, for sharing those tips. We have up next. I'm, I'm going to wait to save her name for the end. Let's see if anyone can guess who this is by the bio. Wife, mother, homeschooler, and business owner. She is a creator, a motivator, and a developer. She does not accept the answer no. She only sees it as a challenge. Her road to success has changed many times. Life has derailed her journey and has built a new path each time. Now, it is her mission to help others go from surviving to thriving, how to set, how to step up, step out, and realize that you have control over your financial destiny. Anyone know who that might be? It is Heather Stokes Benton. Thank you so much, Heather, for joining us here today. Pleasure so much. Um, some the...
founder of GPS here in T. I also have a podcast and I recently re- uh, just, I don't know if it's just on my side. If anyone can please let me know if we're having technical difficulties with Heather or maybe it was just my side, if you can comment down below. Um, if, it, if it is on your side, Heather, if you want to hit refresh, it is coming back a little bit delayed. It could just be my side. So um, give her a quick minute here uh, to go ahead and reset. I'm, again, super excited. Heather is I mean, we already all know Heather from She Raises Studios, but Financial GPS Mama, that podcast, um, she has some amazing work coming up and I'm just super excited. So I'm going to see if we can get her back in. Let's do a sound check. How are you? Better? So much better. Thank you, Heather. I'm going to let you take it away. Okay. Well, again, thank you for having me. Um, It is always a pleasure to be part of a She Rise Studio event. I'm very blessed that I got to be a part of the Becoming Unstoppable Woman series and write in five of the six books and just really grateful to be part of this today as well. So like Adriana said, I love to help women and families become financially successful. And I do that through many different ways. And it's definitely a topic I could talk about all day long. But we're going to just take Take 10 minutes to talk about some important themes. We're going to look at the three G's of navigating your financial world in 2023 as a woman. And you're probably wondering, what are those three G's? Well, it's gender gaps, goal setting, and generational wealth. So let's start by understanding the gender gap. And I know this is kind of a hot topic. And first, we need to pat ourselves on the back as women We uh, have learned how to make money. We've learned to be equal breadwinner, sometimes the superior breadwinner. We definitely have learned how to make money. And I hope you are here today to learn how to be more successful in your business and your life. And so we're going to assume that you're already in the position where you are successful and you are doing right. But how can you take that next step in your financial world to take control? Because even though we've learned how to make money, we still have a gender gap that seems to be happening. And the craziest thing is that the millennials of the world actually have the highest rate where they are allowing their partners, their employers uh, to make decisions for them and don't understand that they should have a voice in their finances. So what I want you to take away from today's conversation, the first thing is you have to take an active role in your finances. What does that really mean? Well, first, I want you to know you are allowed to ask questions, okay? (laughs) You're allowed to ask your partner's questions. You're allowed to ask your employer's questions. You for sure are allowed to ask your financial advisor questions. And what does that mean? Well, I want you to think about it as making a pie. And I tell people to think of the word pie, which means participate, uh, innovate, and elevate. So the first job is you have to participate. And to participate, that means you have to educate yourself on what your financial reality is and where you need to go and where you want to go. You have to ask questions and don't assume that the employer or your partner's employer has your best interests at heart. And then I, innovate, okay? You need to create extra streams of income. A lot of people may say, oh, you need seven streams of income to be successful. That's not exactly true. That is a rule of thumb. And yes, it is great to have seven streams of income, but you have to start somewhere. So even just making the goal for 2023 to make sure you have three stable streams of income, and that could be whether you're employed or your partner's employed, having a business that's generating some money, and then also investing, right? And if your portfolio is diversified enough, you might be making more than one streams of income through those investments. So making a path where you can know that you have multiple streams of income coming in so that you can support yourself. If you think of a table, a table either has three to four legs, right? So if the table is standing on those three to four legs, you take one leg away, it's going to weave a wobble, but it may not fall over. But if the table only had one leg for those tables, you see that's got the center post, right? And then the top, if you take that leg away, it is just going to fall. So that's why having just one stream of income puts you at a greater risk of failure. So you need those other streams there to help make you a more rounded portfolio. E, right? Pi is P-I-E. E is elevate. So if you really want to elevate and grow, you want to see some expansion. You want to know that it's unattainable and measurable. And the good news is money is attainable and money is 
measurable because it's math, right? So we can measure where we're at, where we want to go, where some pitfalls might be. So I want you to think about how you are going to make your pie this year for 2023. How are you going to participate, educate yourself more? How are you going to ask those questions? And how are you going to innovate, make sure you have extra streams of income? And how are you going to measure that elevation that you're wanting to see? Okay. Now, we've talked about addressing that gender gap, making sure we have a voice and that we're taking part in our financial growth, right? Now let's talk about goal setting. Martina just said an amazing job as always about goal setting. So I want you to take and think about some of those tips and tricks she was saying, because one of the most valuable things she taught you is that you can't do it all at once. You need to set small attainable goals. And as you start to attain those goals, you're going to feel that momentum. Like she said, one step at a time. Okay. So goal setting really begins again with that educating yourself on your needs and your wants. And then understanding where your goals need to be. So the first step I recommend is by starting out and getting a financial needs assessment. You saw or you probably heard that I gave that away as one of my prizes. That is a very essential tool. You really need to know where your gaps or holes might be in your current plan. So the first thing is educating and admitting that there might be gaps and holes. We don't all know everything. We do need to seek out more education and answers, right? Even myself, I'm constantly adjusting to make sure that I'm meeting all of those different goals that I have. So you can prioritize uh, what to attack first. That's the good news of the financial needs assessment. We can see if there are holes or gaps in your plan, where they are. That allows us to prioritize what needs to happen first. You know, some people might need to tackle debt first and get that under control. We have a debt sucking program for that. Some people might need to address having their financial uh, security. So sometimes we might have confidence our debt, but we don't have the uh, savings plans in place. We don't have our emergency funds in place. We don't have our insurances in place to properly protect us along the way. Catastrophe happens. Life slaps us in the face. I've been down that road before. And if you're not properly prepared, guess what? You're going back down that debt wheel and you're starting all over again. So once we have control over your debt, the next thing is to take control and make sure you have that safety net in place. So when things happen, we're not falling right back down that money debt pit, right? Now, some people might have accomplished both those things. They might be in a place where they need to really start looking at what their retirement plan looks like, right? And to really understand the idea of retirement, a lot of people want to retire at earlier ages. They want to understand financial independence and financial wealth, which I do encourage. You have to know your FIN. That's F-I-N, financial independence number. So, so far I told you to bake a pie, right? P-I-E, participate, innovate, and elevate. I told you to go get a, a F&A, which was your financial needs assessment. Now I'm telling you, you need to know what your FIN is. Your FIN, financial independence number, is 25 times your annual spending. Okay, spending falls into what are we putting out, right? Not really what we're making, what we're putting out. Because you're going to need to support yourself, they say, on an average for 25 years. If you want to retire earlier, guess what? That means you need to have more of those years of play. So don't stress. It seems overwhelming to say that. Like Martina told us, take one step at a time. And the good news is I have a calculator for that. So don't stress too much. We'll figure it out. So that's all about your goal setting, really understanding, participating, be active, and really know where you're at. Because it's hard to take the next step if you don't really know where you're standing, right? Okay, let's look at the last G generational wealth. Now, this is a term we've heard now for a couple of years. It seems to be the happy trigger term. People, everyone wants to have generational wealth. Well, the good news is you can change your destiny. You can change the destiny of your children. And as women, by nature, we want what is better for our children and our families. We want to start them out on a better path. We want to know that they are supported. And you can do that through several different tools. So, Telling you exactly which one to use without knowing your history would be completely futile. But you have the juvenile Roth. You have education plans like the 529. Uh, The 529 is great if you have several kids because you can pass it to the different kids if someone was to get a scholarship. You have the UGMAs and the UTMAs, which are savings plans that can do group funding. Um, There's plenty of ways to actually even 
pre-fund your children's retirement, if that's not a crazy idea, you would not believe what $25 to $50 a month will do over 60 years. Um, your children can be millionaires just for the money you're spending at McDonald's. That's a fact. Um, so, and then the other side of generational wealth is not just setting our children up for a different and infecting our legacy and our dynasty that way, but understanding how to pass our legacy on. So a lot of us are working really hard at busy businesses. We're working really hard at being entrepreneurs. And if we're not properly educating our families or our children on how to take over those businesses or pass on those businesses or even maintenance those businesses so they can get that residual income that we're building up so much, then all our work will be for nothing. So one of the most important things you need to understand about generational wealth and legacy is that as you're building it, you need to be protecting it as well. That means you need to have adequate life insurance to protect you while you're building out your destiny and your legacy and building out that generational wealth so it can support your plans whether you're here or not. You will also need to have an estate plan. A lot of people say estate plan. That sounds like it's only for the rich. No, an estate plan means that you have a plan and you get to have a say in what happens to your funds that you've been building or to your life insurance that you're passing on to your families. So if you have a bank account, if you have a home, if you have a car, and guess what? If you have debt, you need to have an estate plan. Otherwise, you're going to be leaving your families with either a handful of debt or a handful of court bills because probate is long, expensive, and drawn out. So if you don't want to leave your family with empty hands, arguments, or court costs, you need to have that estate plan in place so that you can have a say as to who gets what, how much they get, and how you are passing along that legacy that you built so hard and spent so much time building. So I hope you took some notes. It's a lot of information I just fired at you, and I like to talk really fast. You may have to push the replay. But my team is here and we are always happy to offer a complimentary f &A. That's that financial needs assessment. So if you want to start addressing where your needs are and really make a active and uh, secure plan for 2023, you can reach out to me and you can do that by emailing me at financialgpsmama at gmail.com. So it's financialgpsmama at gmail.com. And don't forget to mention this energy summit is where you heard me. And I will be sure to apply that free complimentary f and I hope you learned something and have a great day. Enjoy the rest of your summit. Awesome. Thank you, Heather. I love all the facts. Go in and read all the comments. They have uh, some awesome um comments for you waiting for you we have one more speaker in the women in finance section before we get to our next and last topic i'm super excited to bring and share to you laura lee kenny she is a passionate money mindset mentor who is highly motivated to empower female entrepreneurs to step into their power and take control of their life and finances if they've ever struggled their whole life with money or debt. Her goal is to guide women on how to succeed and realize that time that now is the time to transform their life, not in another five years. She is a three-time international best-selling author with co-Thrive and Prosper and Empowered Women in Business, as well as Becoming an Unstoppable Woman in Finance. Welcome, Laura Lee. Hello. Wow, thank you for that great introduction. And I, I'd like to start off by thanking Hannah and Adriana for putting this summit together. The great mother-daughter duo, dynamic duo with She Rises. Now, what uh, Adriana just talked about, I feel it's so important that I'm going to talk about it again. Uh, I am a passionate money mindset mentor. It was highly motivated to, to empower female entrepreneurs to step into their power and take control of their finances and their life. Even if they struggle their whole life in, in debt, many successful women str struggle to, um, sorry, Many successful women have a hard time finding out the, how to put away money 
for for a mid sh short term mid and long term investments we all we all have to do certain things to get going uh, for me i want to guide women to, to learn that it's now that they need to succeed for their transformation not in 5 years time we've waited way too long so now for me a lot a lot of things have changed for me because, because of a car accident years ago and all of everything that i had built up what i had done it was all gone all frazzled because i had a long term um recovery period i was self employed and had no um income replacement insurance because i was a self employed person and all my 20 years of all the work that i had done was just it was gone it just as if it melted away like snow where did all the money go i kept saying to myself why didn't i put some money away i had no money for emergency or retirement let alone for the children for going to on to university or college there must be other ways to make money besides working many hours we all there's only so many hours everybody can work and we do realize that anyway i wanted to learn how to have multiple sources of income something had to change so at 38 pivoting <laughs> starting over with no education formal educational background on a major hurdle for me but as on a mission this time to focus on financial education bet and make better money decisions for sure this time i i would make sure that i i did all of those things that i didn't do before this time to learn how to win the money game and to get the millionaire mindset that I so did not have. It had eluded me and to help others win and have a better life themselves. Do you guys have it? It took me a long time to find um, the millionaire mindset. And many of you guys know that for me, I worked as a certified financial planner for 25 years. And in doing that, I learned a lot of things. I help people retire, get ready for retirement. But I was shocked to learn that my net worth was tied to my self-worth. Let that sink in for a second. Most people are taught when you take your paycheck, you minus your bills, you see whatever is left over and you invest. That old way is keeping most of the world broke. So are you are you open to another way? I hope so. How many follow a spending plan like this? Each step is a percentage of your income. First, pay yourself. You probably all know that. Next one is donate to charity. It could be church, could be an organization, could be family. Your next one is to plan for fun money. I never ever did that. It could be a small amount, doesn't matter. The next one is debt repayment. If there is any outstanding debt, and we know that most of the time there are. You put money away for big purchases or down payment for things that you know you want to do in the future. Now think about that for a few minutes. Taking care of yourself first is our number one rule. Isn't it when you're able to help someone else, you feel better, you feel good. We feel more wealthy because we're, we're able to help one another. But life is too short. Take care of yourself too, but don't get overindulged. 
in <laughs> so many people say, oh, I want everything. I'll just pay for it later. And they're not really paying attention to their investments at all. Now, I would like to tell you my five rules, keys to unlocking the doors to abundance. The first one for me is learning how to love yourself. This comes from a girl that didn't know how to accept a compliment, let alone take care of myself. So that just like the story says, put your mask on yourself first. So you're able to look after other people. Learn how to, to get your mind in alignment in order to receive abundance in all areas of your life. The next one is watch your words. I did not realize that I said certain words <laughs> the universe doesn't have a sense of humor when it goes no not never should should have could have would have now that's all it hears it it you need you need to learn how to write your goals much better now we also have learning the laws of the universe you won't go to jail if you break these rules but just like a monopoly you won't pass go and you won't collect two hundred dollars did you know that there's man-made laws and spiritual laws? Do you want to learn how to attract more abundance into your life? Okay. I hope you do. And also, did you know that your success is absolutely guaranteed? I, I have these a uh, few little things around my office to help me remind me if I'm not if things aren't working out for me. We, we need to do that because sometimes life get, gets going on. Then Bob Proctor talked about this all the time. You have to know two things, where you are and where you want to go. You don't know how to, you do not have to know how to get there, which is so interesting because we're always trying to figure things out. You just have to be open to opportunities and be ready to take advantage of those opportunities. These are some of the pearls of wisdom that I have learned over the years. Now, I also want to tell you about a couple of other things. One of them, I was so surprised to hear this. Now, you can't see me right now, but I want you to stand with your feet shoulder width apart. Put your hands on your hip. And it's considered a power pose if you want to. And you start breathing in slowly. And, and you do this for two minutes. And it's really interesting. There's stats that your testosterone goes up 20%. This is more confidence in there. The stress level, your stress hormone, your cortisol, will decrease by 25%. And that helps for the tummy area. We all know about that. And the risk tolerance will increase by 33% because, again, you're more confident. So I think I'm going to do this several times a day. I, I often know that they'll tell people to do that if they're going to go on stage or something. But it helps no matter what you're about to do. Now, now I'd like to tell a poem. I don't know who wrote it. But it's a, it's a poem that someone else might know who it is. It goes like this. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. Your playing small does not serve anyone. There is nothing enlightening about shrinking so that others won't feel insecure about you. We're all meant to shine. It's not just for some of us. It's for everyone. And as we let our light, own light shine, we un unconsciously give other people permission to do the same thing. And as we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. And just one other little thing. I'm all about um, writing goals and stuff. And I'm just showing the back side. Of course, one of them says, your success is absolutely guaranteed. And the other, 
um, talks about my a main goal, your big goal. We do A, B, and C goals. And your big goal, your C goal goes on this. And it starts off with, I'm so happy and grateful now that. And then you write it in the present tense as if it's already happened. So thank you for listening. Have a great day and a better tomorrow. Thank you so much, Laura Lee. And I love the poem at the end to really sum everything up. And we are on our way. We are at the last topic for our Up Your Energy Summit. Final stretch, everyone. I'm super excited. And we're going to be introducing Denise Oster. She is a magnetic force of spirited energy. Her bold, sassy, yet charismatic approach to life and exuberant personality is how she impacts others. Did I mention this next topic is all about women in leadership roles and trends and where women are needed. Denise has helped hundreds of clients expand their brilliance into unlimited success. I think she's an amazing speaker for this topic. Please welcome Denise Oster. Hello, and thank you. And this has been a great summit. Some fabulous speakers and upping your energy in the leadership field is my jam. And I'm excited to share it with all of you tonight. So I am a peak performance coach. I help women ignite their productivity and their momentum by using their brilliance to turn it into fun, freedom, and financial wealth. And that, my friends, is how I've gotten myself into leadership positions and how I show other people how to position themselves to get into leadership. But what is stopping us is our own selves and our own ways, right? So my topic for you is do it anyway and use the acronym for fear. Fear, facing everything and rising, or are you facing everything and running? Most of us women want to be in leadership roles, but we're running. So for all of you women out there that have a heart of gold, that want to pour their life and their passion into succeeding in life and in business, it's a heart-centered approach. It's a heart-centered approach for you to be able to face everything and rise instead of running. There are so many different things that face us right dead smack in the face and we are starstruck. We get stuck in our own way and there is no way that we can get out of it because we ourselves are holding us back. So the trends that we're going to in leadership and where we need to be is to be more heart-centered with ourselves and find out who we really are. Like really, when did it become a trend to settle for less? Really, when did it? What we need to be looking at is facing all these fears and rising and knowing that our standards are constantly being raised. We have clear cut boundaries and we aren't settling for anything except for more. And so I use the acronym of fear, face everything and rise to give you four distinct examples and ways of trends that we are moving towards in leadership and to get you exactly where you want. There's no greater joy in my life than to see every single woman succeed in life and in business. And that all starts with all the topics that we've been talking about in this wonderful summit, especially collaboration. Uh, it's the key to our currency and our life and to our future. And there are different ways that fear can cripple us and, and stop us because People are afraid of collaborating for jealousy because they're not good enough, that they don't feel that, you know, they have to prove their wealth or their worth to be able to do something significant to be in a leadership position. But I'm here to tell you, those are enchanted beliefs that are getting in your way and stopping you from being the magnificent woman that you are meant to be and designed to help others grow and succeed in life. It's my passion that I, my energy is just on fire when I get to help women and I see them just move mountains in their job, in their life, in their career. And it all starts with the heart, getting heart centered. I help people do the heart work, not the hard work. And the first thing you need to do in the acronym of fear is face your fears. What are you afraid of? Get real, real with yourself. 
get real centered. If you have to sit with yourself and be quiet for a while to hear that inner voice and say, what is it that I'm really afraid of? What is it that's really getting in my way? Nine times out of 10, you're going to find it's your own self. It's your own fear of maybe not feeling good enough, having to prove yourself, your worth. I know. I know this just didn't happen overnight that I became in a leadership position. It was not like all of a sudden, you know, it's my default. It was by design. It was by pure intention. And the only way I could do that was to get real with my own self, to get out of my own way. The only way that I could get unstuck is to get really heart centered and vulnerable about what it is that I wanted, where I was going and find out who the hell I really was, who the heck I really was. What I thought I was is not exactly who I became because I did the work. I did the internal work to find out what was holding me back. And it was me. And that leads us to our second one for E is everything. Everything begins and starts with us. Everything. If there's something that isn't working in your life, We need to evaluate what it is that we're doing and we need to look at the results that we're getting or the outcome that's happening. And if it's not working, we have to go within. We have to do the hard work and get real with ourselves because it began with us and it ends with us and it starts with us. Everything, everything in your life. So it might be family, it might be business, it might be uh, personal relationships. It doesn't matter what it is. Everything begins and starts with us. And that takes us to the word A for and in the word fear. We look at life that we have this going on and we have that going on and we have to spread our time on this and then we have to do that. That's not the way it is. Leaders rise. Our trend that we're moving towards is and. We get to do this, that, and. So I am a real estate and investor and an entrepreneur as a speaker and a coach. I don't separate and differentiate between them because I get to be and. I'm not this and I'm not that. I am and. I am everything. And we need to find our and. What is it? Have you thought about that? Are you being pulled in very different directions? Have to take the kids here because you have to be a mom. And then all of a sudden you have to turn on your, you know, your CEO hat and then you have to do it in business. You get to be a CEO and a mom. Okay. It's and everything is and, and there's a way for that. If you go within and find out really who you are and what your passion is, it's amazing how that can turn your life around and And there's the word and, and you can do so much more. Then that leads us to rise. You can choose to run or you can choose to rise. I choose to rise. Leaderships rise to the occasion. We need to start looking at what it is that isn't working, who we are, what is our passion? What is it that we really want to do? Is it really a law out there that we get to wake up and go to a job that we absolutely hate or maybe is pulling us away from what we really love to do in our life just to make a buck? A buck is energy. Yes, it has to pay your bills, but you get to choose what it is that brings the light and the love in your life. And that's how we are able to rise. Because when you are being true and honest to yourself and stop lying to yourself about really what you want and who you need to become for other people, we rise to the occasion. We answer our inner truths to bring the passion back into our life and the money will come. We have to rise to occasions when we have to face adversity. And when terrible things happen to us, we've all been down it. I myself have had many, many challenges in my life through divorce, single mom, wondering how I'm going to put, you know, a loaf of bread on the table and work two jobs and get the kids to their sports and their activities. Being divorced is really hard when you're dealing with a narcissist or you're dealing with behaviors and not the person. So there's different things that might be challenging us, but we get to rise the occasion and choose what we want to do to it. See, leaders don't see things as problems. We aren't problem solvers. We are solution creators. 
And that's the trend that we need to move towards, seeing things as opportunities, not problems, because we aren't problem solvers. We have a creative, innate gift within us that is our birthright to rise to that occasion. And for example, recently, I just had a computer crash. Someone hacked my computer, took all my information, completely gone, had to get a new hard drive, shut everything down, new, new emails, new passwords, new, address, new bank accounts, everything, right? This could devastate a lot of people. This could shut me down. I didn't skip a beat in my, miss, my business. I might have missed some meetings, but guess what? The person that wanted to bury me forgot that I was a seed. And that, my friend, is the trend that we women need to move towards and go towards if we want to rise up to the occasion and be leaders in our jobs in our life, in our personal life, so we can live a life of abundance, of freedom and happiness. And it all begins with us. So I always say, do the hard work, not the hard work. And if you want more information about this or to get in touch with me and get into my vibe and my energy, you can go to my website at www.deniseoster.com. I'd love to have a conversation that matters. Thanks so much and enjoy the summit. Awesome. Thank you, Denise. You are a powerhouse as always. Such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Okay. We're still hanging in strong women in leadership uh, roles, trends, and where women are needed. Our next speaker is Kyla Biederman. She was born and raised in Fredericksburg, Texas, leaving in 2012 to join the U.S. Uh, Navy. She served eight years as a cryptologic technician, including one deployment on the USS Nimitz. After becoming a single mother in 2020, she realized the attitudes and the culture surrounding single motherhood needed to change, starting with her own. This began a long journey of self-development and education in pursuit of finding answers and healing. Please help me introduce Kyla. Thank you so much for joining me, Kyla. Hello, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to be um, a part of the SRS collection and working with all these wonderful women. Um, I mean, can you guys imagine being able to work with all these women every single day and being in group chats with them and um, being all you guys' Facebook friends? It's amazing. Um, so yeah, I did eight years in the Navy. Um, and when I discharged, I was diagnosed with 70% PTSD. Um, and so it's been a long journey for me. And then while I was going through that, I became a single mom. And I was just wanted to become the best person that I could for my son. And I was tired of having conflict with people. I was tired of people not understanding me when I was speaking. Um, and so like a lot of these women have been saying, guess what it is? It's us. So um, like everyone else has been saying as well, we have to work on ourselves and we have to do hard work. So um I'm going to also talk about a little bit about self-care. I think we've covered self-care, but we're all going to keep talking about it because that's one of the keys to getting to where we want to be. And we've all done so much self-care to get to where we are. Um, and we do a lot of other things too. So I want to talk about those other things that we do. Um, so I, um, I started doing full-time college about a year ago. Um, I lost a really close friend that I was in the military with, and I decided that I want to be part of the change and I wanted to help people um, that were going through similar type situations that me and some of my other friends have been going through. Um, and I had a really hard time being a single mom as well because I had all these terrible thoughts in my head. I did not want to be a single mom. It was very embarrassing to me. And I just had some thoughts in my head. And I assumed that that's what everyone else was thinking about me. And so I had to, again, come to the conclusion that those are my thoughts. Those are not other people's thoughts. And after I had my son, I had so much support. So anyways, um, I want to talk about boundaries. A lot of us have been talking about boundaries as well. And I'm going to uh, talk about specific boundaries that um, I think that we should all be, I guess, looking into. Um, so something I find really interesting is that personal boundaries are considered your own personal dignity. So when you define yourself, you're defining your dignity. 
Um, <clears throat> these are a couple of notes that I have uh, from a research paper that I did in psychology in school. Um, so a couple different types of boundaries are physical, emotional, spiritual, financial, time, and non-negotiable. Um, physical boundaries are how you let people interact around you. Um, emotional boundaries that goes into emotional intelligence. Um, and those are things that I really think that people should be learning about. Uh, a lot of these things, when people don't have their boundaries intact, it's because of ch um, learning from childhood. So we learn from um, we learn from watching other people. We're socially um I can't even think of the word right now. So we, we, we're social learners and we watch other people. We watch our parents. We watch other adults that are in our lives. So when we don't have proper boundaries set, it's because we did not, um, we probably were not shown proper boundaries. And then we don't know that we don't have proper boundaries. So a lot of people are growing up into life and they're having a lot of conflict in their life and they're having, um, they're not feeling good. They have mental health issues and it's because they're not aligned somewhere in their boundaries. Um, so spiritual boundaries, you need to decide what your morals are, what you believe and, and things like that. Financial, we've had a lot of uh, women talk about financial boundaries today, but that even goes into when you're dating. Um, when you're dating or starting to get more serious with somebody or when you're married to somebody, how are you going to be sharing your money? These are things that you need to be deciding in advance. That way, when you do come into a situation where somebody's trying to use you, you're not going to get used because you have your boundaries in place. And there's a reason that you have these boundaries in, pay, in place. Um, and then time boundaries. A lot of us have been talking about taking time for ourselves and self-care. That's where time boundaries come in as well. So we need to make sure that we're blocking off time for ourselves. We need to make sure that we're blocking off time for our business. We need to make sure that we're blocking off time for our family and getting everything that we need taken care of, taken care of. Um, so scheduling was a big thing for me too, before I had a kid, because, um, my big thing was taking naps and then that's just something you don't get to do anymore. And you get to add a lot more things into your schedule besides it's just a nap. So, uh, so that was hard for me. Okay. Um, so we talked about how, uh, you pretty much learn your boundaries from your surroundings as a child. Um, but I want to talk about some outcomes, uh, specifically of not having correct boundaries in place. And this could be one or it could be all of them most likely if you have one boundary out of place there it's going to bleed through into your other boundaries and it's going to start creating more chaos in all the other parts of your life so a couple of um a couple of signs of poor personal boundaries are repeated toxic relationships making constant sacrifices for others and none for yourself out of touch with your own personal needs so not doing self-care um, feeling like people constantly take advantage of you. So I have a lot of people all the time. They're like, oh, this, this, and this happened. And I'm like, okay, well, you let that happen. You let that person do this. You let that person come over. If you didn't want them at your house, you shouldn't have let them come over. So, um, and then the last one being a passive aggressive to gain back a feeling of power. So when we don't have proper boundaries in place, um, coming from a childhood, we create these, personality um, traits, I guess you could say toxic personality traits, such as having passive aggressiveness so that you um, so that you can um, make up for your lack of boundaries in one of your areas. So none of this is things that we want to be happening to us. And we definitely want to make sure that we're teaching our children correct boundaries, because in the end, we want to have a positive society. And we just talked about collaborating. A lot of women have a lot of issues collaborating and being, um, I guess, nice to each other or however you want to say it. Um, but that's because there's these complexes and it's because somewhere there's not a, a proper boundary going on. And so you're creating a complex from that. So when you're doing self-development and when you're doing this hard work and when you're putting time and learning into yourself, that's what you're doing. You are making yourself better. You're making yourself able to collaborate with other people. You're seeing these complexes that you have built up from not having proper boundaries. And, um, and like I said, you're not passing that on to your children if you're working on it. Um, 
And the, I think the last thing is, um, the last thing I want to talk about is that a lot of people don't feel like they don't maybe know who they are um, or they're confused or they don't feel like they have a good idea of who they are. So when you're looking into these boundaries and when you're really defining yourself, that is how you find out who you are, what your boundaries are, what your core values are. And when you bring that into your business, um, I want to say that mission statements are so important. And a lot of people, you're going to have a mission statement because people require it. But um but it, it needs to mean something and it needs to actually have morals and meaning behind it. And you need to actually um, facilitate those in your own life, in your business, not just talk about them. And it can't be just a mission statement. So um, I hope everybody the best luck in their life and their business. And I just I just want to encourage you to show up for yourself and make sure that you have your bases covered, because if you can't lead in your own life, you can't lead in your family's life and you're not going to go out in the world and lead in um, your business or anybody else's. So thank you all. Awesome. Thank you, Kyla. It was a beautiful uh, speech all together. Thank you for the powerfulness. Speaking of that, we have a powerful, and I do mean powerful, speaker coming up next. Her name is Jamie Lynn. She is an international best-selling author, a life coach, and a breakthrough expert. She inspires women to elevate change and revolutionize the societal conditioning of women and invites taboo topics that creates a positive impact for, few, for future generations. Through her own life experience, Jamie has survived past trauma in childhood, the military, and as mother. She is an expert in personal freedom from deeply rooted emotional attachments and self-inflicted boundaries. She helps guide women towards the root of their inner healing and helps them find the clarity for their unique own path. Welcome, Jamie. Thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much for having me. I don't know about all of you, but for me, my cup is overflowing. My saucer is literally leaking and pouring over. It is such an honor to be here with so many incredible, incredible women. So, um, hi, I am Jamie Lynn, and I have a question for you. Have you ever watched the comedy office space? It was a movie in the 90s. It was three company workers who hated their job and they decided to rebel against their company. As I was preparing for the speak or for my topic of the up and coming trends of business in 2023, I instantly remembered this 1999 comedy because of so many examples that the character Peter Gibbons struggled with. And honestly, I cannot blame him. He was in a cubicle farm. He had eight bosses that had no regard for his personal boundaries. And he, every morning that he woke up, he believed that it was the worst day of his life. So the bottom line is people want to feel appreciated and valued. So in an ever-changing world of new perspectives, you cannot have a successful business with an old mindset. And the underlining theme of the new trends in business has everything to do with mental health, or what I like to call it, mental wealth. That starts with building people from the inside out. And as I see it, it shows up especially in three different areas. And that is respect, environment, and expectations. Respect, it's the acceptance and equality of a person's culture, race, gender, and sexuality. But that's not it. It's also about receiving fair compensation for work responsibilities and workload. You all know what I'm talking about. And it's actions like listening to understand versus listening to respond. And very importantly, it's following through with your word. One example that sets the complete standard in my book is that of Toyota. Toyota is a company that we are all familiar with. And what I love about them is that they were so creative when downturns and recession happened that they did not, they did not fire any of their employees at all. They were able to keep them on the payroll. And in fact, when they were not able to build cars, which like, really? 
it's Toyota, right? When they weren't building cars, they actually paid their team members to volunteer to help with nonprofits, which I'm just like, incredible. So I ask you, understanding that respect is such a big theme throughout this year and just in our lives in general, I encourage you to ask yourself, am I getting the respect that I deserve? And do I help others feel valued? So the second one is environment. A flexible work environment and hours has really been embraced since COVID. This is particularly convenient for parents. So many of us are parents on here and moms, or even possibly we're taking care of a loved one that is in hospice or an elderly, an elderly family member. And instead of calling off work in a flexible work environment that you can work remote, you don't have to call off work because your kid is sick. You can just work from home. And it's benefiting the employee and the business. Also, having accommodations in a workplace, like, get this, lactation rooms for nursing moms. Wow. What? That is so incredible to even, for companies to even have that. That was something new that I ended up just learning about. And then also meditation rooms or Zen zones to recharge your energy and even childcare within the facilities. That is what's trending right now. Also, creating a space where creativity can flow, like bringing in plants and different wall colors that bring in the, the energy and motivation that really, really motivates that creativity and gets that sparks going. And to have things in your space that can just really make you feel happy can make all the difference. My favorite example of the great environment all around is on the Peacock series, Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist. I personally love the Zen architecture and decor that is used to create this collaborative and calm workspace. There are so many innovative ways that nature is used and brought indoors. It creates this perfect space to stimulate creativity. Environment can really contribute to your quality and the quality of the life work balance that we all need. As an employee or a business owner, are you bringing things into your work environment that makes you feel good? And if you're not, how is it that you can take steps to incorporate that? The third is expectations. Like given clarity on what is expected, seeing the clear vision and training are so important for accountability and transparency for both the employer and the employee. It fosters better and clear communication between the employer and the employee. And who does not like getting rewarded for expectations that are above and beyond? We all love that. We can all benefit giving us kudos because how many of us literally step out and we do go above and beyond with everything else that we have going on in our life. As a great example of a company with clear expectations is a community-based networking company called Prove It. The last year and a half, I have had the honor of attending several events and masterminds. Their solid theme and mindset is to come as you are. They encourage the goal to improve yourself by just 1% every day and to leave better than when you came, whether you stay with the company or not. And my favorite is to hang your black robe up at the door, meaning no judgment. The expectation of prove it is self-acceptance self-improvement and personal development, which creates better performance and proving it every single day. It's all about stepping into the best version of yourself. So in conclusion, 
most of us have been on both sides of leadership and as an employee. And Toyota Improve It on a mental wealth, they focus on mental wealth and personal development compared to the strikingly different comedy office space that only ended up creating disgruntled employees. If you haven't seen the comedy office space or it's been a hot minute, I highly recommend you to watch it because it's not only hilarious, but it's also a great example of the old school mindset that is completely out of here. And what is in though, is that I like to call my personal fave, which is the Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist. I love it. I love the energy. I visually, it's so inviting. I could just picture myself working in that type of environment every single day. So when you can accept and respect yourself and others, together, you create an environment that encourages appreciation and value for everyone. This leads to the expectations in a world that build up people and not tear them down. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much for listening and being a part of this incredible summit. Thank you all. Awesome. Thank you, Jamie. We are on to our next. Um, we have Dr. Shelby Decker. She is known for turning ideas into profits by bringing together possibilities. She loves helping others going to a new level of greatness with increased community impact. Her doctorate in business administration is in strategy and innovation. She has two executive MBAs in leadership along with a Bachelor of Science in Advertising. Dr. Shelby has contributed to four bestsellers and recent new releases. So I am gonna bring on Dr. Shelley, Shelby Decker. Hi Shelby, don't forget to unmute. Thank you for that little advice there. Sorry. <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone. I hope you, that you have paper and a pen or a writing instrument. My um, presentation is a little bit different than the others, and you'll understand why in, in a few minutes. I have a lot of numbers I want to give you, so I do have notes on the side because I want to make sure that they are correct. And I hope that as I'm telling you these numbers that you come up with some ideas for yourself and how you can make a difference. So um, it, it's that you can record the numbers if you want, or you could just jot down an idea that the where you can make a bigger impact. Um, as a doctor, I go for the facts or the data. Sorry, it's in my genes. I look at the data and I see what's trending. I look at the highs, I look at the lows, where's the gaps of opportunities and then where's the indications of where we can build on. So first I'm going to review some of the facts and then I'm going to move on to the disparities because that's really where we could grow. And then oh, I'm going to also discuss some areas where you can show up or give your voice to. According to the World Data Center of the United Nations, women consist over 49% of the population globally. China has the most women, which I was a little surprised about. Women represent 50% of entrepreneurship in the Latin America and the Caribbean. And in 2021, women made up less than 37% of the Canadian businesses. Per the U.S. Census, we consist of 50% of the national population. Woohoo! And but the U.S. only ranks 38th globally in women's and, glo and girls' empowerment per the 2022 SDS Global Index. You, women you owned businesses generate $1.8 trillion to the economy. That's trillion, not a B as in billion and not as an M, but trillion. So we have a lot of power in our economy. For the last year, it was estimated that for each day, about 1,800 new women businesses were launched in the U.S. 
women make up 85% of the consumer purchases and drive about 70 to 80% of the spending among consumers. And that's according, according to Forbes. The data that shows that women are very powerful as a whole, as a group. But we need to grab the power and start making a difference in the, defi in the deficiencies that still remain. Globally, there's 388 million women and girls that live in extreme poverty compared to the 372 million males. In a short six years, the gender poverty gap is expected to increase with women as still being the majority of the world's extreme poor. An opportunity for us to build. Women still face some of the jobs descript, I'm sorry, job restrictions in 86 countries. And 95 countries do not guarantee equal pay to equal work. Wow. That is an area where we can make grand improvement. Women between the ages of 18 to 24 are the most commonly abused by an intimate partner. 19% of these domestic violences are involves a weapon. Only 34% of the reported cases receive medical treatments. There's a high rate of depression and suicidal behavior among these domestic violence victims. As of September 2022, women represent over 58% of the U.S. force. How many women are there that make a difference at work and in our economy? But only 35% have senior leadership positions. That glass ceiling still exists. According to a study, companies with women executives are 30% more likely to outperform other companies within their industry. Less than 9% of the Fortune 500 CEOs are women. And of that 9%, less than 1% is of women of color. As of 2019, women represent 50% of the medical students in the U.S., but only 36% of those medical students are in doctorate schools. So where do we need to go and do to grow? Well, first of all, we have to defy social expectations. We have to gain funding for women, businesses, and organizations. We have to overcome that struggle that still exists, exists to be taken seriously. We have to own our own accomplishments, which many of us just go and push under the rug. We have to build a supporting network, which we are doing right here, right now, and in the She Rises studios. We need a balanced business and the family life. It takes a lot to juggle. And most of all, we have to cope with the fear of failure. Many of us have that fear and we have to use it as an energy to go forward and push our power. We, each of us, need to define our own power, our own authentic power. And it's the underlying element to our success. Our success as a mother, as a business owner, as a community leader. Oprah, in a speech that you can find on YouTube, and I'm going to use my notes here because I want to make sure I have this right, stated that a book had changed her life, and she described this lesson as the personality, your personality, comes to serve with an energy of your soul. When you're able to align this personality with becoming into the world, with what you do in the world, your personality is here to serve the world. Our power comes with roles, resources, and expertise. 
every single day we manage to shift that scale of power to every single situation that we're dealing with. Some of us don't even step into our power and we remain in the wilderness. We need to pull ourselves up. We need to find that motivation. We need to find that strength. We need to find that courage and we need to find that determination within us. With this new year of 2023, we're looking for our power in our lives to chart a new direction, let go of the past, have a supportive team, make decisions and commitments, but most of all, be brave to do all against odds. But what can I do? How do I embrace me? And how do I, can I make an impact? Well, first of all, you could develop yourself by making a master plan, a vision board, or however you want to do it, according to your standards. Make it up to you. Not anyone else's. No one else. The, I saw this or that. What is truly yours? And determine your own self of readiness. With, that, with all your goals, you have to make sure that you're ready to step into them and take on that responsibility. Recognize your gaps. Yeah, it may be uncomfortable, but that's okay. We all have gaps and we have areas to learn. Another main area is learn about finances. This is the number one area that women seem to lack. Be knowledgeable about your business finances, cash flows, profit and loss statements, household expenses, and start becoming the CFO in all areas. Start making hard decisions for those and have those hard conversations, not only with others, but also yourself. Look inside of your mirror and say, okay, what are you going to do today to push your dreams forward? What am I ignoring and pushing on the rug and I'm avoiding? because that is a major obstacle that you're not addressing. What is your identity? What do you stand for? Who are your allies? Who are your acknowledgements? What is your advocacy? Embrace any opportunities that may come along. Fall into your lap, or you may have to go out and grab them, or you may have to push for them. Reframe and shift your thinking. New year, new you, grow. Next thing is share with your community. You have to truly share yourself in order to grow and to help others in order to go further. This could be online. It could be women's groups. It could be associations. It could be also girls and children. You need to stand on the shoulders of those women who came before us, but also foster the other women and girls of the future. We need to listen respect, trust, influence to persuade. Persuade what is good, what is right, and what we deserve. We need to tap into our own hidden leadership strengths, whatever they may be. You know what you're good at. Go ahead and share that. Lastly, you have to be an example. You have to be example to your children. You have to be example to other women. You have to be example to other community leaders. You never know who is watching, following you, or you don't know who you are inspiring. Don't hide. You need to find a cause. Any cause that you believe in true heartly that aligns with your business, go after Tell people you're supporting. Many people know who I am. They know I support the veterans and what I do. They also know what community events that you can find me at. Don't be afraid. Get out there. Promote it. Use your influence. Lastly, well, it's part of the being an example. I said last, accountability. You got to be accountable to yourself but you also have to hold others accountable. Make sure they're doing it. If not, call them out. Hey, we voted on this. We said we were going to do this. We're going to do this. Why haven't I? Or how, how can we make sure this gets done within the realm? 
I want to thank everyone for being with me. Hope to see you at one of our SRS events. And I think Michelle is coming up after me and she's going to share how to utilize the trends in 2023 to scale your business. So be sure to continue to listen and learn. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Shelby. And you are correct. We do have Michelle Mesa that's next, also known as Coach Michelle D. She is a single mom, an entrepreneur, an international best-selling author, transformational coach, content curator, and CEO of Luxie Coaching and Consulting. For over 28 years, Michelle has been a noteworthy leader in the business industry and is known for her work and serving others by helping people overcome self-sabotaging behaviors, limited beliefs, and teaching entrepreneurs how to brand themselves and their businesses. She's an expert in the marketing arena and transforms ideas into six-figure brands. Help me welcome Michelle. Hi, Michelle. Take it away. Hey, thank you so much. I appreciate the introduction. And first, I just want to say thank you for everyone attending these women are so amazing. I'm just, I've learned so much myself and things that I can apply um, in my life. And I also want to thank uh, the She Rises Studios team for allowing me to be here and for all the hard work your team does from day to day. So thank you. So are you guys enjoying this summit? I love the wisdom shared and the positive energy. It's just, it, it's a really good start for the week, right? So speaking of positivity, today I'm talking about improving the customer experience, and I'll talk about a couple trends you need for 2023 and the need for women in the workplace. It is an honor to be here today to discuss the current trends, business trends, and the important role that women play in shaping the future of commerce. And I love this topic. I get excited about it. I've always been, uh, I have a heart for commerce and business, especially women in business. Um, and those of you who know me well, you know, I'm always talking about it. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm everyone's cheerleader. So the business world is consistently evolving, and it's important to stay ahead of the curve. And as Dr. Decker mentioned earlier, we have a glass ceiling to shatter, right? Several glass ceilings. So what can we expect? Well, first, there's a growing trend towards sustainability and socially responsible practices in the business world. And that's shifted a lot um, from what it used to be. I know it was introduced a, a few years ago um, by the larger corporations. Uh, people talk about, you know, having a, a carbon footprint and uh, taking care and saving the environment. But now as the millennials have entered the workforce, it's a hot topic and companies are increasingly focused on reducing their carbon footprint and ensuring that their supply chains are ethical and transparent. This shift towards sustainability is driven by consumers who are becoming more conscious of the impact that their purchase decisions have on the environment. Another trend to watch out for is the rise of e-commerce and digital technologies. So we all know that e-commerce is here to stay. I've been studying it since the dot-com boom a few years ago. And I've just consistently uh, researched and, and followed everything out there. And it's so incredible that even in the late 90s, when the first uh, computer, the, the, DC, the, the PC came out, Everyone thought it would go away as as cell phones as well. But, you know, technology is just part of our lives now. And it's just it's incredible to see the transformation. Um, not only it has, you know, the ease of our lives, but also how it's transforming business today. So the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated the adoption of hybrid and rem remote working models and online shopping. Companies that embrace this trend will have significant, a significant advantage over those who don't. Now, the use of AI, machine learning, and data analytics is also, also becoming increasingly prevalent, allowing businesses to make more informed decisions and enhance the customer experience. Now, 
we all have heard the buzzword lately about AI and all those technologies that are, are up and coming, um, but they're here to stay. So AI has the ability to help you scale your teams and your business operations more efficiently and has the ability to create intelligent enterprises where systems and processes support each other to foster the ultimate customer experience, which directly impacts your bottom line and customers. Now, I do want to mention that customer success was mostly discussed in the SaaS industry, the DAS and SaaS industry. But now it's becoming a thing, especially since um, the use of data analytics is right at our fingertips. And so now uh, companies are deep diving into um, the use of these analytics and what to do with them. And what we have learned is we know our customers inside and out, which that's a good thing because it allows us to provide better support and a better experience overall, because after all, your brand um, is not about a logo or design. It's about the experience. It's about your positioning and uh, repeat business. And now where do women come in? We bring a unique perspective and set of skills to the business world, which you all know that. And our contributions are crucial to the success of any company. Research has shown our contributions are crucial to the success of any company. Of, I'm sorry, success of uh, research has shown that companies with gender diversity tend to outperform those without making it essential to ensure that women are represented at all levels of the organization. And so, you know, there are many case studies out there, and I encourage you guys um, to look at the information available. And, you know, not only are you guys uh, building women-owned companies, but a lot of you might also be in the workplace. And so that's something to think of, think about is how important you are and how you can transform an entire organization at all levels. So I just think that research that I just mentioned is incredible. Um, that's what really caught my eye as I've been studying all the trends. I studied them year to year, um, but that really stood out to me. So in 2023, women will need will be needed in leadership roles, as well as in tech and data driven positions. And so that is out of all of the positions that are needed in the workforce. I mean, that is really up and coming is women in tech. And I know that they've. Um, a lot of elementary schools and colleges are promoting different programs. And there's a lot of larger organizations who are giving scholarships specifically to women and girls in the tech field. So that's that's exciting. Companies that prioritize diversity and inclusion will have a competitive edge and attractive and, and tr attracting and retaining top talent. Additionally, women entrepreneurs and small business owners will play a crucial role in driving economic growth and creating new jobs. So this makes sense as we are highly detailed, detail oriented and we're natural nurturers. When it comes to customer success, we have the opportunity to rise up and lead with our strengths. And that's something that we can embrace. And you know, we have a, there's just been a common thread today in our summit, I love it. Uh, all of our topics are well connected and woven together. And, and so it's really exciting to see um, the information presented, no matter what the topic is, uh, the consistent thread is utilizing our strengths. And so that's exciting as women in, in the field today. Now that we've discussed the hot topics in business, what do we do with it? Well, I want to share three tips with you to help get you started. So number one, conduct an audit of your business operations and look for opportunities to incorporate AI technology into your business. So for me as a content curator, I've tested and incorporated various AI technologies into my marketing and research. And so not only does it help me perfect and deliver a solid message to my target audience, it also allows me to help my clients quickly scale their brands and deliver engaging social media content on their platforms in their behalf. And so that's one thing that's the, that's the quickest, um, 
way you can incorporate AI into your business and at, at a minimal or no cost. And so really it's just the cost of your time. Um, do a little sweat equity and really dig deep and figure out how you can scale your business while incorporating AI. Number two, you can incorporate these tools without heavy coding involved. So for me, I like tech, but I'm not a tech person. I don't, uh, I'm, I'm just didn't come from that background. <laughs> um, I, I've, I'm self-taught, but not formally trained. So a lot of the operations um, are moving to as a service model, which is what I mentioned earlier that originally was adopted from DAS and SaaS companies, which means growth opportunities involving other technologies. I use these tools on the back end and have them connected to my CRM and email campaign tools. And so that's how I incorporate um, these types of apps without a lot of heavy coding. Um, it's easily integrated into my website or whatever platform I'm using. Um, that way it just saves me a lot of time. I'm a natural maximizer of time. And, you know, us as women, we're busy as moms and running businesses or in the workforce or running our households, you name it. So we don't have a lot of time to dedicate. So we want something um, that's easy to understand and incorporate. Number three, lean up your daily activities by using AI apps, which allow you to grow your business at a faster pace. And so that's one misconception that I would say a lot of people don't really know about AI. And, you know, you have to remember that this is a computer system. And so a lot of people don't understand how to use it. And the simple explanation for that is it really performs based on what you tell it to. So if you are specific about your content, so let's say, you know, uh, X, Y, Z topic about these three trends or whatever it is, you type those specific words or keywords. It's kind of like a Google search engine. Uh, and then it just it formulates and helps you with your content. And so that way you can dive deeper and really formulate your message from beginning to end. It's kind of like um, those of you who went to college, you had to come up with an outline in your research paper. It, it's similar to that. Um, that's what you need to go back and do um, as you proofread all of that. In conclusion, the business trends of 2023 present exciting opportunities for women to make a positive impact and drive change in the business world. Let's work together to ensure that we are all given equal opportunities and the support we need to succeed. I've enjoyed sharing this information with you today. If you need help with your content or marketing strategy development to correctly position yourself and scale your business, please reach out to me at my website, luxyconsulting.com and that's l-u-k-s-i consulting.com i'm also on all the social media platforms um, next up is a powerhouse who will give you tips on showing up and leading yourself so thank you so much for having me Woohoo! thank you michelle it was a pleasure um i love all you went you dove deep let's just say that so I'm super excited. Um, we have our last and final speaker for this evening. I just want to thank everyone so much for hanging in there. I know this was a long summit packed with so much information. So it, I am going to let uh, our last speaker, Melanie Greenhouch, please correct me if I'm mispronouncing your last name. Uh, Melanie is a mother, community worker, entrepreneur, international speaker, and best-selling author neuro coach and founder of Collective Wisdom Coaching and Consulting. Melanie has spent 25 years serving others by helping them achieve their definition of success through personal and meaningful growth. So welcome, Melanie, and take the stage. Thank you so much. Um, absolutely. It's always it's a hard gig to go last. So thank you very much for the introduction. If you're hanging in there and you're watching the replay, let's do this. So um, I want to talk about uh, sort of wrapping up the business trends idea. There's one that is really set to explode in 2023, and it is something that each and every business has a vested interest in across the globe. And I want to start with a story first, because there's actually a personal connection for me. In 2009, my mom and sister died within six months of one another and I was really suffering. So during the day, I could manage. As long as there was sunlight, I was okay, all right? So, you know, the routine of the day, the kids, the chores, the meals, all of that, 
um, because uh, during that time I had my two birth children, but I'd also taken on my sister's two children. So, you know, it was a busy life. But what was really interesting was that I struggled when the sun went down. The house would get quiet when everybody went to bed and it would just be me with my thoughts and in particular my grief. So many a night I roamed around the house feeling really isolated and alone and I needed something. I needed people. So I went and looked where I knew that there were people <laughs> on the internet. So I was looking for hope essentially. I needed people that understood what I was going through. Maybe they could suggest strategies and, and support me. Um, so, you know, that's where I went looking. Now, what I did discover that there was always someone awake somewhere in the world, okay? And remember, this was over a decade ago. So, you know, when we talk about when the, the online communities that I was connected with there or the digital communities were really rudimentary, and uh, but it was it was interesting because what I did find there was that the source of comfort, support, advice, and there was actually a lot of healing that could happen within those communities. And I really wanted to share that story because every single one of us has an innate need for connection and belonging. It's just part of the human experience. And our need to connect is actually as fundamental as our need for water and food, right? But it doesn't necessarily show up in the same way. So what does this have to do with business trends in 2023, right? Well, we are still in recovery from the pandemic and the impact of that was immense. We need to be really honest about that and engage with that. What we know is that people use digital community uh, communities and, and reached in to use the web um, to ease their suffering and their confusion. It helps them understand what was happening. It was a source of information um, and it was a, a way for people to connect, particularly when we think about the global experience and people being separated, you know, within like outside of their country of origin. There was just so much that we relied on in terms of that digital connection. What we know about that is that some of these connections that people made and developing the skill set has actually meant that they have a more permanent place in their life. They've, they've actually embedded it in because humans do adapt. It's, it's one of the things that, that, you know, we naturally, we learn, we grow and we develop. All right. So what we can see at the moment in you know, within the technology is the development of a range of different platforms and tools and ways that people can connect. Essentially what it's creating is something which I love because, I, you know, I struggle a bit with the sales, you know. What I love about this type of connection is that it is absolutely about community first, product later model. Yeah. So, this is actually, well, it's one of the reasons why women are really leaning into this as a way of developing their customers, their brand and themselves as they, you know, they're, they're fulfilling their business dreams. So what we're really seeing is there's a lot of reshaping of loyalty programs. So typically their loyalty programs have been very much in person. They've been, whether they're the, you know, a card or some sort of, you know, uh, reward system in a face-to-face -face interaction. And now we're really seeing the emergence of that as a digital tokenized kind of uh, version that's, that's just in our phones, uh, in our laptops. It's everywhere with us, okay? The other side of that coin, though, which is really interesting because, we're, yes, the consumer experience is really important, but there's the, uh, the flip side, I suppose, is that as the business owners, we get to explore new product areas. So in the past, when we're talking about market research, we might be relying on another brand's data that we can have a look at. Whereas though this is actually creating communities where we get to do consultation with them, we get to talk with them daily, all right? And it allows us to develop these really rich 
relationships with them. One of the things that uh, the research demonstrates is that in uh, 2020, 21, 22, we saw a, a range, like huge numbers of people join communities that related to their hobbies or uh, their interest areas. And what they're really predicting is that that will increase substantially in 2023. So it's really important to keep it in mind. If it's not something that you're currently utilising, is it the tool that you can bring in? Customers have actually proven time and time again that they're willing to pay premium prices for innovative and compelling offerings, experiences and connection with you, yeah? You're the expert. You're the, the, the SME that they want to connect with. You are solving their problem. So they love the idea of accessing exclusive clubs and memberships, yeah? Just think about that. Have you got an exclusive club that somebody might want to be a part of? No, not yet. Maybe it's ready for development in 2023. Ultimately, it's an opportunity for us to explore new places and foster those really deep connections with people, all right? It doesn't replace in-person connections. So if you're freaking out because you're like, I'm a, I'm a face-to-face -face person, that's okay. It can actually be an additional tool that helps you develop another stream of income, diversifying, uh, you know, and just making those connections with leads into your business. So what makes for a great online community? Well, the, what, the, what the research tells us is that people love a powerful sign-up incentive. Wow, that's a pretty easy thing to be able to achieve, right? It's things like access to a network. Now, if you're, if you're somebody that's working in a career-related field, people want access to the network that's going to open up opportunities for them. Think about that. Do you have a network that people want to get into? Access to support. When I told that story before, support was really high on my list of wants and needs, okay? Okay really powerful sign-up incentive, letting people know that they will receive the support they need in your community makes them more likely to join. And access to exclusive community content. This is where you get to blog, you get to do your webinars, you get to absolutely encourage discussions and, and get people connected with your content. Now, be aware, I want to raise, it's not all, you know, sunshine and, and roses and lollipops, right? With everything we do, there's the benefits and there can also be the deficits. One of the challenges of this, and it's definitely what the research shows is the challenge for business owners, is making sure that the level of engagement and the discussion is of a high quality and that it's happening. It's not enough to set up an environment and then just expect it to magically bloom. It's not going to do that. As managers of these spaces, it's really important to be active. You've got to be in there stimulating and creating the conversation. And, you know, going back to the blogging, the events, the webinars, um, just anything that can help people get stimulated and start that conversation is absolutely where it's at, all right? One thing I wanted to say about today, we have had so much information, yeah, there is, you could easily be thrown into overwhelm. And I just would love to go back to, you know, when the earliest start, we were talking about breathing. Yeah. What I encourage you to do, yeah, I'm talking about community. Somebody else is talking about branding, PR, la, 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 la. You know what? Take a moment, watch this over again, write a personal prescription that will work for you. You get to take and leave any of the information, hopefully not all of the information, but whatever you need, you can bring on board. 2023, there's 11 months left. Create a plan and just make your way through it. So don't get stuck in the overwhelm, okay? That's not what we want. We're here to support you. Now, to wrap this up, when I look back now, I didn't realize just how powerful that online community that I connected with in 2016 was for me. 
What I found, though, was a group of people who understood me. They understood what I was going through. And beyond making the nights bearable, they led me towards the services that provided me with the support I needed. And why did it work? It worked because I felt connected and like I belonged. So that is the power that you have. Connection and belonging this year is absolutely where it's at. So go forth and have a go. All right. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thank you, Melanie. I think I want to thank you so much for joining me. And okay, I have one more surprise for you. I know I said we had our last speaker, which was Melanie. I tricked you. Okay, so we have CJ Boyd. She will be our last speaker for this evening. CJ Boyd is a women's empowerment mentor, international best-selling author, speaker, and founder of Queen by Design. She uses tools such as EFT tapping, breathwork, mindset coaching, and visualization to help women uncover their limiting beliefs and self-sabotage patterns in order to release them and anchor in new belief and new confidence. Please help me welcome CJ. Thank you for joining me, CJ. Hello. I, as I'm sitting here and I'm, you know, I'm going down this rabbit hole, like, oh my God, I'm following all these amazing speakers and it kind of just goes right into my speech. So my, my topic today is about imposter syndrome. And I'm sitting here and I'm going, who are you? Why are you here amongst these people? You know, who of us has not felt the sting of not feeling good enough? worthy or capable, even after we've accomplished some pretty epic stuff in our life. And I, I'm not going to lie, when I found out that I was going to be the last speaker, I was like going down this rabbit hole, like, oh my gosh, I'm not as good at speaking as so-and-so. I'm not really as good a speaker as I think I am. They're putting me at the last. So in case I totally blow it, people won't leave the summit. And then I was like, okay, regroup, take, you know, get a grip, connect with your heart, and remember who the heck you are. And, you know, as founder of Queen by Design, I am forming who I am in my way, doing the things that I want to do. And I needed to remember that. And so, you know, it downloaded to me that a lot of people go through imposter syndrome. And so what I want to shine light on today, and I'm going to be quick and concise because I want to honor everybody's time. I know we're a little bit over the time frame, but I want to shine light on today the importance of us as women, as way makers, to help eliminate the normalcy that most people feel as far as being an imposter, you know, in the areas of self-permission, leadership, and mentorship. You know, as women, for so long, we've waited for others to give us the green light, to give us permission, to tell us, yes, it's okay, that we've forgotten how to make decisions for ourselves when it comes to the big decisions in our own lives. And, you know, the first step in learning to make decisions for ourselves is to really sit and be in gratitude for where we've been. You know, all the past relationships, all the past circumstances, all the past situations that we've been in, we need to be in gratitude for them. Because we need to really understand that those places where we've been are places that we've given our power away, that it's allowed us to be where we are. But, you know, too often people sit in regret for past decisions when we really need to honor them and understand that those decisions that we made has helped form us to the person that we are today. Those past decisions I need to be grateful for because they brought me to this point where I want to be something different than what I've always known. I want to break the pattern in the mold from what my family has taught me or what has happened in my past. I want to be something different. So being in gratitude for them bringing me to this space, that's really important for us as women to, you know, really honor gratitude. And for me, the tools that I use to uncover limiting beliefs and gratitude is journaling. I love journaling. And, you know, what I do is I sit and I get really connected with my heart and, you know, take a deep breath and really center myself and then be intentional about what it is that I want to have this journaling session bring up. And that's how I get rid of the limiting beliefs. So then when I'm sitting here in the limiting beliefs, I ask myself, you know, are these beliefs really my beliefs? Is this something that I really feel or is this something that I've taken on and absorbed from somebody in my past? You know, my parents, my grandparents, teachers, you know, the people who are an authority figures in our lives that really anchor in what we think about ourselves. And journaling allows us to release those beliefs that are not ours and, you know, ask ourselves, 
are those really true for me right now in my life? And then the other tool in journaling that I use to step into giving myself permission to be who I want to be and step out of my comfort zone is to really just honor the I am statements. You know, it's you raise your vibe and you build your confidence in your self belief when you tell yourself, I am courageous. I am a leader. I am powerful. I am unstoppable. I can do absolutely anything I want. And when we do that and we give ourselves permission, we continue to raise the vibe. And when we do that, we feel gratitude a little bit deeper. And I think it's really important for people to understand, you know, how powerful gratitude is. A lot of times we overlook how gratitude serves us because it makes us, you know, realize who we are, where we've been, what we're, what we're doing right now and where we want to go. So being in gratitude and being in gratitude for where we've been really allows us to step into leading our own lives. And, you know, that's the next the next thing I want to cover is leadership, self-leadership. You know, the decision to stand up for yourself to make a different decision. And, you know, it takes courage and it takes strength to step out of our comfort zones. Like right now, I'm out of my comfort zone like crazy, but it takes courage. But did I say, no, I don't want to do it? No, I'm stepping in. I'm giving myself permission, which gives me power, which gives me strength and to do it. So I'm taking back my power. And so stepping into, you know, giving yourself permission to be a leader you get to take back your power that you've given away in all those areas of your life. And you don't understand how incredible that feels when you give yourself permission to stand up as a leader. And, you know, when we start taking back our power from our past decisions and we start making decisions in our current life, this becomes a natural evolution. And we start feeling, you know, the ability to make decision after decision. And when we continue to do that, we feel excited, we feel exhilaration. And with coming with owning our power and our decisions, it like lights a fire. Like right now, I'm getting the fire lit because I made the decision to be here, to speak on this panel, to do this today. And it lights that fire in my soul to continue to move on and go further and not hold myself back. So with each decision that we make in being a leader, we lead our own lives. And I think that's a trend that women need to understand is that we need to lead our own lives. We've so long allowed other people to dictate who we are, what we do, what label is attached to us and what we're able to accomplish. When we step into making our own decisions and start leading our own lives, we become powerful. And, you know, we want that feeling more and more. So we start making more and more decisions and we step into more leadership within our own lives. And then as we begin to lead ourselves, the natural evolution is to be able to help other people, to empower women to embrace this for themselves as well. And I think mentorship is the area, you know, mentorship, the biggest, most deepest expression of self-belief that a woman can have. When we step into leading our own lives and we, you know, take on the duty to for the power to be able to go in and help other women to, you know, avoid the pitfalls, to get over the stumbling blocks and to just step into their own lives. We're empowering them to make decisions for themselves. We're empowering them to lead their own lives. And then we're empowering them to be a part of a collective like we are here. We are a community. We are a collective that is helping to, you know, inspire and educate women and elevate women. We are all one collaborating together to do a common theme and it's make women be seen in this world. So I just want to say that, you know, women mentorships is not only a way for us to empower others, but it links us with the community that helps alleviate the imposter syndrome because we're surrounding ourselves with people that not only celebrate us, but they elevate us and they inspire us. And they also remind us just how powerful and how capable we are in our own lives. So recapping the three things, um, you know, be in gratitude, get rid of your limiting beliefs, give yourself permission to step into leading your own life, and then stepping into leadership and doing the things that you want will show other women what's possible, and then mentoring other women, giving them the power to give themselves the permission to step up and do the thing, because being in a place where you can mentor other women and not only allows you to help them be, be the best that they can be, but it also empowers you to continue to grow and expand. So 
in closing, I know I'm speaking really fast and I'm really nervous. So I apologize for that. But in closing, I just want to say that it's a daily decision that we all must make to own our truth to be willing to implement the tools and strategies and tools that we've learned here today to support our growth, as well as we need to celebrate ourselves every single day. We need to celebrate every day, not only ourselves, but all those other women that are watching, that are listening and wishing that they could be doing what you're doing right now. And this is how we strengthen the bond between women to build momentum and to create massive movements of women leaders. And that's what this is all about, a community that is to build women leaders. Thank you. Thank you, CJ. You did amazingly well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for staying with me till the end. It's been such an amazing summit to get to sit back and listen to 32 women speakers um, of course, with having kicked it off with Joy Bauer and ending with the amazing CJ Boyd, it was an amazing summit. If you stuck around to the end, you have something awesome in store for you if you are the lucky winner of this last raffle prize. Before I get to the end, I want to say thank you to all of the team members of She Raises Studios. You know who you are. You made this happen. I want to say thank you to all of the SRS Collective speakers that joined us here today as well as Joy Bauer for truly gracing us with her presence. And of course, the fearless woman who created all of this. To my beautiful mother, Hannah Olivas, thank you so much. All right, here we go. I hope today really helped you to want to turn your dream of business into being a reality. Now, to help our next raffle winner do something like that, I hope um, you claim your prize within 48 hours. So. Our last giveaway is an amazing website. It is fully equipped with all the goodies. You get the domain name, you get the hosting for a year, professional email, SSL certificate, unlimited revisions until final approval, up to 10 custom pages, a beautiful theme of your choice, advanced on-page SEO optimization. Um, this can include anything from being an e-commerce to a membership website, to a course site, blog, et cetera. It comes with a free logo and bonus, free six months website management. Okay, please have a drum roll for the lady, the lucky lady who wins this and our final prize winner that is over $3,500 in worth, Jennifer Herrera. Jennifer, if you are watching, you have 48 hours to email us and our team at info at sherisesstudios.com to claim your prize. Just type in prize winner in the subject line and we will Go ahead and get that over to you. I want to thank you all again so much. It's been such a pleasure. It's been so much fun. Cheers to you all. Um, I'm just so excited. I hope today upped your energy. Not only did it up it, but it's going to help you create long-term, long-lasting energy in life and in business. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Adriana Luna. Carlos, CEO, founder of She Rises Studios, along with the amazing Hannah Olivas. Thank you.